Prelude Night fell quickly in the forest of Tether, and the caravan guards cast wary glances into the tall, dense foliage that walled either side of the trade route. The sounds of the forest seemed to grow louder, more ominous, as the darkness closed in around them. Overhead, the ancient trees met in a canopy too thick for the waning moon to penetrate, but the merchants pressed on, lighting torches and lanterns when their horses began to stumble. The dim circle of firelight did little to push back the darkness or to assuage the merchants' unease. Their own torch-cast shadows seemed to taunt them, flickering capriciously and appearing as if they might at any moment break away and slip off into the trees. There was an eeriness to this forest that made such things seem possible. All of the travelers had heard stories of the watchers of Tether, and there wasn't a man or woman in the caravan who did not feel the unseen eyes. Chadson Herrick, a grizzled sellsword who'd made the road his home for more years than Elminster had pipes, raised a hand to rub away the tingle at the back of his neck. My hackles are up. I feel like a cornered wolf, he muttered to the man who rode beside him. His companion responded with a terse nod. Chadson noted that his friend, a too thin, nervous youth who at the best of times seemed as taut as a drawn bowstring, was clutching a holy symbol of Timora, goddess of luck, in one white-knuckled hand. Chadson, for once, was not inclined to tease the lad for his superstitions. Just a few more miles, the young man said in a soft, sing-song tone that suggested he'd been silently repeating those very words over and over, as if the phrase were a charm that could ward off danger. Their whispered conversation earned them dark looks from several of the other guards, even though there was no real need to keep silent. The watchers already knew of the caravan and had probably followed it all the way from Mossstone, the last human settlement on the trade route that cut through the forest. If anything, the travelers' tense silence seemed only to deepen the impending cloud that hung over the caravan. A sudden, wild impulse came upon Chadson. He was tempted to leap from his horse and dance upon the path, all the while hooting and cursing and thumbing his nose at their unseen escort. He imagined the reaction such an act would elicit from the unnerved merchants, and the mental image brought a wry grin to his face. He was still smiling when the arrow took him through the heart. Chadson's body tilted slowly to one side and fell to the path. For a moment, the men nearest him merely stared, their faces registering horrified recognition of the slender, ebony-hued staff protruding from the dead man's chest. It was the dark-hued arrow of a wild elf, a bolt aptly known as Black Lightning to the humans. The silence exploded into frenzied action. Following the shouted instructions of the guards, the merchants scrambled down from their wagons and, heedless of their precious cargo, overturned several of the wagons to form a makeshift shield wall. There was no time to cut the traces, and some of the draft horses went over with the wagons, falling heavily into piles of writhing, kicking horse flesh. The animals' shrieks of terror and pain mingled with the screams of dying men as the black arrows descended upon them like stooping falcons. From behind the scant cover of the wagons, archers returned fire, but they were shooting blind into the heavy foliage and had little hope of actually finding a mark. Some of the more intrepid and less experienced of the caravan guards drew swords and crashed into the forest to take the offensive. These were sent reeling back onto the path, unarmed, their eyes wide with shock and their hands clutching at mortal wounds. The fighting was over in minutes. Many of the men on horseback had fled at the first sign of battle, and a few of the merchant wagons had escaped as well careening wildly along the path in the wake of the panicked horses. From the north came the sound of fading hoofbeats and a muffled crash as one wagon tilted over. When all was silent, several shadowy figures broke free of the forest and crept onto the path. They fell upon the ruined wagons, cursing and bickering as they pawed through the spoils. One of them, taller and broader than most and clad in a dark, flowing cape, 
strode from the forest with a slight, limp figure slung over one shoulder. This he tossed onto the path to lie among the bodies of several of the slain merchants. A torch, he commanded in a deep voice. Get some light on this mess. One of the forest fighters hastened to obey, fumbling with flint and steel until a spark took hold. The sudden flare of torchlight fell upon the faces of the dead, one of which was an angular, elven face, painted in elaborate patterns of greens and browns. A gaping wound slashed across the dead elf's throat and chest, tracing a deep, diagonal line that started behind one ear and angled down across his ribs. It had long since bled dry. The dark-cloaked leader frowned and glanced at the fallen men that surrounded the elf. His eyes settled on a young man whose hand had been pinned to his side by an arrow, apparently while he was in the act of reaching for his sword. Tangled among the ruined fingers was a leather thong, from which hung the symbol of Timora. Oddly enough, the arrow had struck the metal disc, skidding along its length and leaving a deep score before sinking into softer flesh. A silent sermon, the killer observed with a bit of dark humor, on the capricious nature of Lady Luck. That one, he said with a wolfish smile as he pointed to the youth whose luck had run out. Take his sword and reopen the elf's wound. Make it look as if he killed the elf in hand-to-hand -hand combat. If necessary, splash a bit of the lad's blood around to make the kill look reasonably fresh. There's a caravan due to pass through tomorrow. But as his assistant reached for the sword, the wounded fighter's eyes flickered open and his good hand closed around the grip of a wicked hunting knife. Startled, the attacker fell back a step and reached for the bow on his shoulder. Smoothly, swiftly, he sent an arrow hurtling into the young man's chest. This time no lucky medallion deflected the arrow. The youth fell back, instantly dead. The leader, however, did not look at all pleased by this quick response. He tore the arrow free and brandished it under the archer's nose. And what in the nine bloody hills do you call this? The man shrugged, his face apprehensive as he noted the branded shaft and elaborate blue and white fletching that marked it as an arrow of his own making. Must have run out of elf arrows, he muttered. Damn you for a stinking ghast, the leader swore in a low, ominous voice. If you weren't the best archer this side of Gentle Keep, I'd push this arrow into your left ear and pull it out your right. Search them, he ordered in louder tones, whirling toward the looters and holding the bloody arrow aloft so that all could see the error. Make sure there are no more mistakes like this one. All of these men died at the hands of wild elves. See to it. Chapter 1 To the casual observer, Blackstaff Tower appeared to be little more than an enormous, tapering cylinder of black granite, a tower some fifty feet tall and surrounded by a curtain wall nearly half that height. Stark and simple, the keep lacked the displays of magic, either fearsome or fanciful, that were so beloved by the wealthy and powerful citizens of Waterdeep. No watchful gargoyles peered down from the tower's flat roof. No animated statues stood guard. No cryptic runes marred the smooth black surface of wall or tower. Yet everyone who knew of the Archmage Kelvin Blackstaff Aronson, and in Waterdeep indeed, in all the Northlands, there were few who did not, regarded the simple keep with a mixture of pride and awe. Here, Rumor suggested lay the true power behind the City of Splendors. Here was a gateway to magical wonders beyond the imagination of most mortals. It is a rare thing when bardic tales fail to exaggerate the measure of might, and when the speculations of tavern gossips lag timidly behind the truth. Blackstaff Tower was one such exception. In a chamber in the uppermost level, Kelvin's consort, the archmage Laryl Aronson Silverhand, stood before a mirror, a tall oval of silvered glass surrounded by an elaborately carved and gilded frame. Fully six feet tall and slender as a birch tree, 
Laryl possessed a strange, fey beauty that hinted of fairy blood. Silvery hair cascaded to her hips, and large green eyes, the deep silver-green hue peculiar to woodland ponds, searched the mirror's frame with an intensity that seemed oddly out of place on a face so exquisite. She ran her fingers along the carved and gilded wood, seeking the ever-shifting magic that few could perceive, and fewer still could master. When satisfied that she had found the elusive trigger, Laryl spoke a strange phrase, and then stepped into the mirror. She emerged in a deep, forested glade. A few butterflies fed upon the flowers that dotted the meadow grasses, and the ancient oaks that surrounded the glade were robed in the lush green of early summer. It was such a scene as might be found in the forests of many lands, except for an aura of eldritch energy as pervasive as sunlight. Laryl breathed in deeply, as if she could take in the magic and the soul-deep joy that scented the air of Evermeet, the island home of the elves. In the center of the clearing stood an elven lady, as tall as Laryl herself, and clad in a silken gown of dove gray, the elven color of mourning. The elf's vividly blue eyes had seen the birth and death of several centuries, yet her face was youthful, and the flaming luster of her red-gold hair was undimmed by time. A silver circlet rested on the elf woman's brow, but it was her regal bearing and the aura of power surrounding her that proclaimed her Lady of Evermeet, Queen of all Elves. Greetings, Laryl Elf friend, said Queen Amlaryl in a voice like music, like wind. Laryl sank into a deep curtsy. The elven queen bid her rise. Having dispensed with the formalities, the two women indulged in a burst of laughter and then exchanged a sisterly embrace. Holding hands like schoolgirls, they seated themselves on a fallen log and set to gossiping as if they were carefree maidens rather than two of the most powerful beings on all of Toril. But all too soon the conversation turned to matters that demanded their attention. "'What news brings you to Evermeet this time, and with such urgency?' the queen asked. "'It's the Harpers again,' Laryl said in a dry tone. M. Laurel's sign came from a deep and ancient pain. "'Yes, it often is. What is it this time? It appears that some elves from the forest of Tether are attacking farms and caravans. Why? How many reasons would you like me to name? Laryl replied. As you know, in a time not long past, all the elves who made their homes in the land of Tethir, including those who dwell in the forest of Tether, suffered greatly at the hands of the human rulers. To all appearances, the destruction of Tethir's royal family brought an end to this persecution. It is possible, however, that the elves are retaliating for past wrongs. Since the land of Tethir remains lawless and chaotic, it is also likely that human settlements, trade routes, and trappers are encroaching upon elven lands. Perhaps the humans are pressing the elves, and the elves are fighting back. As is only natural, what interest do the Harpers have in this? They want to promote some sort of settlement, a compromise that will end the turmoil and address, at least in part, the concerns of both sides. Ah, yes. M. Laurel paused for a grim smile. We made such an arrangement in the forests of Cormanthor many years ago. How well was that agreement kept, my friend, and for how long? Today how many elves live among those trees? The question was not meant for answering. Laryl acknowledged the Queen's assessment of the matter with a slight nod. I have argued that very point with several of the Master Harpers, but the decline of the elven people is not an issue the Harpers have traditionally addressed. So much for their vaunted concern with maintaining the balance, the Queen murmured. What is balance to those whose lives are not as long as yours and mine? Laryl pointed out. The Harper's concern is genuine, but the span of their vision is decidedly shorter. 
They are more worried about the disruption of trade and the possibility of increasing the civil unrest in Tethir. Can't you make them understand what these compromises mean to the elven people? Given a few centuries, yes, Lera replied grimly. Kelvin understands, after a fashion, but his concern focuses upon the affairs of Waterdeep, and he truly believes that a compromise is the best solution, not only for his city's trade interests, but for the elves themselves. He sees it as their best chance of survival. The humans of Tethir are not so tolerant of other races as they were even ten or twenty years ago. It would not take much provocation to turn them against the elves. There are far too many ambitious men in Tethir, looking for a rallying cause to aid their rise to power. I can easily envision the destruction of the elves becoming such a cause. You know what happened under the royal family. Given the general lawlessness of the land, it could be far worse this time. Then there is only retreat, murmured the elven queen. She sat silent for several moments, as if letting the decision take root. Then she nodded decisively. Yes, the Saitel Kassir must retreat, she decreed, using the elvish word for the forest folk. I will send an ambassador at once to offer them a haven in Evermeet's ancient woods. And if they will not come? The queen had thought of that as well. Then they, like so many of the people, will fade from the land she said with quiet resignation. This is the twilight of the Tel Kassir, my friend. You know that as well as I. We cannot hold back the darkness forever. But may that night be long in coming, Laryl said fervently. As for the Harpers, believe me when I say that sometimes the best way of controlling their enthusiasm is to work along with them. The mage added in a wry tone, that suggested personal experience with this tactic. Of one thing you can be certain. The Harpers will act with or without your blessing. What do you suggest? Send a Harper agent to the Elves Forest stronghold to bear your invitation. A Harper who will work toward a balance that will favor the Elven community. In this way, if the Forest Elves refuse to retreat to Evermeet, they will at least have an advocate. That is more than they might get otherwise. M. Laurel studied her friend. The hesitancy in Laurel's silver-green eyes suggested that there was more to this matter, things of which the mage could not easily speak. Seldom was Laurel reticent about anything. Foreboding tightened M. Laurel's throat, but she waited with elven patience for the woman to find her own way and time. Let us say that I would agree to such a plan the queen suggested calmly. Have you an elven agent among the harpers? A forest elf, one known to the community in question? No, Laryl admitted. Then I do not see how your plan could succeed. Most Saitel Kassir are insular, suspicious of all elves from outside their tribe. The people of Tether have not sworn allegiance to me, and so they might not receive an ambassador from the island. Pressed as they are, they would likely kill any non-elf who ventured too near their hidden strongholds. No, it seems to me your harper would have little hope of survival and even less chance for success. Laryl did not answer at once, nor did the queen press her. Their silence was filled by the sounds of the elven forest, the rustle of leaves, the soft hum of insects the blithe call of carefree songbirds. This glade was a place of unparalleled beauty, surrounded and sustained by Evermeet's ancient magic. The island was the last haven of the elves, and its peace and security had seldom been breached. Knowing this, the mage considered her next words carefully. What she was about to suggest trod cruelly upon the elves' painful memories and touched the queen's deepest sorrow. There is a half-elven harper, Laryl said slowly, currently stationed in a city near the forest of Tether. 
She has passed successfully as an elf on other assignments. She is very convincing, very resourceful. I feel confident that she could find a way into the forest community. The queen's face was suddenly wary. Her eyes darted toward the shimmering oval gate that had brought Leryl from the mainland to Evermeet. It was a magical bridge between the worlds of the elves and humans, and it had been born with a spark of life that had become a half-elven child, a child that M. Laurel would forever regret. That gate had cost M. Laurel the life of her beloved husband. Grief is seldom reasonable. In M. Laurel's mind, the child and the deadly portal were as one. Yes, Laurel said softly, confirming the queen's unspoken conclusion. She took M. Laurel's tightly clasped hands between both of her own. You know of whom I speak, half-elven by birth but willing to do anything to serve the good of the people. She has proven this again and again. Perhaps that is her way of laying claim to a heritage that has otherwise been denied her. The queen tugged her hands free, her expression implacable. The half-elf bears Amnestria's sword, she said coldly. A moon blade is a greater inheritance than most noble elves can claim, and more honor than she deserves. It seems to me that steel is cold comfort, Laryl observed. And as for honor, half-elven or not, she wields Amnestria's sword, a weapon so powerful that many an elven warrior could not touch it and live. Think on it, my friend. What better argument in the girl's favor? M. Laurel turned away abruptly to stare with undisguised hatred at the magical gate that had cost her so much. Duty and grief warred on her delicate face for long, agonized moments. Finally, she lifted her head to a regal angle and once again faced her friend. You truly believe that this, that she, is the best person for the task? That through her efforts the lives of the forest people might be spared? Laryl nodded her silvery eyes full of sympathy for the lonely elf woman and admiration for the proud queen. Then so it shall be. Queen M. Laurel rose, speaking the words in the manner of a royal pronouncement. Evermeet's ambassador to the forest of Tether will be the harper known as Erelyn Moonblade. The elf queen turned away and began to walk toward the palace. So shall it be she repeated to herself in a whisper that seemed too fragile to bear the weight of her bitterness. But I swear before all the gods of the Seldarine, the elves would have been better served if the sword she carries had turned against her. Chapter 2 Tethir was a land of many contrasts and contradictions. Ancient ways and modern notions— Pretensions of royalty and egalitarian fervor commingled uneasily in a land whose natural complexity only magnified her recent woes. Tucked between the moors and mountains of Am and the vast desert kingdoms of the far south, Tethir possessed a mostly northern terrain and a temperate climate. The land was a hodgepodge of fertile farmland, deep forests, and sun-baked hills that were as dry and forbidding as any desert. The customs and interests of the peoples who settled each area were as diverse as the land itself. But Zazaspur, the largest city of this troubled land, looked firmly to the south. A port city with an excellent deep-water harbor, it was set at the mouth of the Seldaskun River and on the path of important overland routes. Zazaspur saw trade and travelers from many lands, yet her current ruler, a southerner by the name of Balak, did his best to limit the influence of outsiders. The grandson of a Kalashite trader, he styled himself as Pasha and cultivated an oriental splendor and a distrust of northerners that recalled the attitudes of his forebears. Since Pasha Balak's rise to power some dozen or so years before, parts of the city had taken on a decidedly southern character. Both the best and the worst aspects of the great city of Kalimport could be found in Zazaspur. 
sleek palaces of white marble, formal gardens filled with exotic plants, wide boulevards, and open-air bazaars redolent with rare spices vied for space with sprawling shanty towns and narrow, crime-ridden streets. Oddly enough, however, most of the illegal activities of Zassisper were conducted from the better parts of town. The School of Stealth, a school of the fighting arts which was a thinly veiled front for the powerful Assassin's Guild, was housed in a sprawling complex at the edge of the city. Intrigue was always in fashion, and the going price for an assassin's services was high. So, however, was the price on an assassin's life. Errolyn Moonblade walked lightly down the narrow back alley street that led to the women's guildhouse, making no more sound than the narrow shadow she cast. She was a broadsword's width short of six feet tall, with raven-dark hair that hung in careless waves about her shoulders, and eyes of an unusual dark blue flecked with bits of gold. Beautiful eyes that might have inspired bardic odes had they not been so wary and forbidding. Pale as moonlight and alert as a stalking cat, Erelyn had about her a tense, watchful air, and the too thin, too taut look of one who seldom paused for either food or sleep. For an assassin, the choices were few and straightforward constant vigilance, or death. The half-elf had been a member of the Assassin's Guild for several months, and she was no longer considered an easy mark. Zazaspur's professional killers were strictly ranked, and the sash of pale gray silk that belted Erelyn's waist proclaimed her to be a fighter of the highest skill. But there were still those who refused to believe that a woman, much less a half-elven woman from the barbarous Northlands, could defend the shadow sash she wore. The system for advancement within the guild was simple. An ambitious assassin merely killed someone of higher rank and took his sash. Erelyn had defended her rank more times than she cared to admit. When forced to do so, she fought with an icy skill and an even colder fury that was becoming legendary among her associates. Not one of them, however, suspected that the half-elf wanted nothing more than to be rid of her dark and largely undeserved reputation. Nor would they ever know. Solitary and cautious by nature, with each grim challenge, Erelyn became more intensely watchful and more fiercely alone. Thanks to several months of hard-won survival, Erelyn's instincts were as keenly honed as a bladesinger's sword. She didn't need to hear footsteps or glimpse a shadow to know she was being followed, nor did she expect such things. Silence was the first lesson taught to fledgling assassins, and the faint light coming from the high, narrow windows of the women's guildhouse up ahead cast all shadows behind her. Yet Erelyn knew she was being hunted. She could not have been more certain of this if the stalker had announced his intent with blaring horns and the yapping of hounds. Even so, several heartbeats passed before she caught sight of him. Although half-elven, Erelyn had in full measure the keen sight of elven kind. Sharp detail, long range, and wide sweep. Behind her, at the outermost edge of her peripheral vision, she saw a tall, broad figure, cloaked and cowled into anonymity, rapidly closing the distance between them. No one had reason to walk this particular path but Erelyn and her sole female colleague, for the tall, narrow tower that housed the women's guildhouse was the humblest and most remote building in the complex. It seemed likely, therefore, that the man behind her had career advancement in mind. But Erelyn walked steadily on, giving no sign that she was aware of the assassin's presence. Just a few paces ahead was a walkway that branched off from the path, leading into the even narrower alley that ran between the high courtyard walls of the opulent men's guildhouse and the council hall. The attack would surely come there. When just one step remained between her and the alley, Erelyn exploded into action. In one fluid movement she whirled, seized the man's cloak with both hands, and threw herself back into a roll. The startled assassin went down with her. Before the man's weight could pin her to the ground, she twisted her body in a half-turn, brought her knees up to her chest, and kicked her feet out high and hard. 
The man somersaulted over her and landed heavily on the dirt. Before his grunt of impact died away, Erelyn rolled up onto her knees beside him. She stiffened two fingers into a weapon, scanned his cloaked and cowled form for a target spot that would render him temporarily immobile, and drove down hard. Her fingers plunged into the side of the man's neck, too deep and far too easily. Erelyn grimaced as her hand disappeared into the dark cloaked figure, winced as her fingertips drove into the hard-packed earth below. Mouthing a silent curse, the half-elf snatched her hand out of the insubstantial body. She jerked back the cowl that obscured the apparition's face. The faint moonlight fell upon strong features, dark hair both silvering and receding, and a black beard distinctively streaked with silver. Kelvin, she muttered with exasperation, settling back on her heels and staring with dismay at the figure who, with a dignity astonishing under the circumstances, coolly rose to his feet and brushed the dust from his cape. At this moment, Kelvin Blackstaff Aronson, the Archmage of Waterdeep, a master harper and her own superior, was hardly Erelyn's favorite person. The harpers had sent the half-elf and her partner, Danilo Than, to Zazaspur on a diplomatic mission, and although Kelvin was not responsible for the grim role she had assumed as her cover, Erelyn found that she had little wish to face him, or, to be more precise, to face the sending that he had conjured and sent over the miles to speak in his stead. Erelyn assumed that Blackstaff's magical double would be as devoted to solemn discussion as the original model, and this she simply could not bear. She would do her duty by the Harpers, but she'd be damned if she'd sit around and chat about it. Nice sending, she said as she rose to face the Archmage's double. More solid than most. There was a touch of regret in her voice. The implication that she might have preferred to attack an even more solid target did not escape the Archmage. A sardonic smile lifted one corner of his dark mustache. Well met to you, Erolin Moonblade, he said with a hint of sarcasm. By Mistra, I swear that with each day that passes you grow more like your father. I've seen that very expression on his face more times than I care to count. Erolin stiffened. Her relationship with her human father was a tentative and fledgling thing, too new for comfort and too personal for casual talk. And if truth be told, although she found much to admire in the man, she did not care to be reminded of her mixed heritage. I doubt you conjured ascending merely to chat about your long-dead quarrels with Bran Skorlson, she observed. We're both here on Harper Business. If it's all the same to you, let's get on with it. The image of Kelvin Aronson nodded and asked for her report. With a few terse words, Erelyn described the progress in her mission to help defuse an attempt by the guilds of Zazaspur to depose the ruling Pasha and establish guild rule. Of her presence in the Assassin's Guild and the ever-growing toll this subterfuge was taking on her, she said nothing. Fortunately, Kelvin did not press her for details. You and Danilo have done well the Archmage said at last. Pasha Balik is aware of the threat, and your friendship with Prince Hasheth has gained the Harpers a valuable contact in the palace. Now that the situation in Zazaspur is under control, at least for the moment, the time has come for us to speak of other matters. You are aware of the recent troubles in the forest of Tether? The Harper nodded, her face cautious. Then you've no doubt heard of the latest caravan attack. The elves have been blamed for this atrocity, as well as for many others. In your opinion, is there any truth to these reports? There might be, she said candidly. The green elves are a fierce, unpredictable folk, and they were ill-treated by the old royal family of Tethir. They've ancient grudges aplenty, and who knows what might have provoked them recently. This we must know the Archmage agreed. Indeed, the Harpers have decided to send you to the forest to seek out such answers and to try to bring about a resolution to the conflict. Erelyn's eyes went cold. I'm being sent into Tether? In what capacity? Meaning? The Archmage inquired, 
His dark brow is pulled down into a V of puzzlement. Am I being sent as an assassin? She asked bluntly. Although the Harpers had never required of her anything remotely like this, it struck her that cutting down the leaders of the troublemaking elven band could certainly be considered one road to resolution. You know better than to ask such a question, Kelvin scolded her. It did not escape Erelyn's notice that the Archmage's words could be construed any number of ways. Not that she should have expected anything different. Kelvin had an annoying habit of giving answers that were empty of information. Still, the wary half-elf would have been glad of an outright denial. So tell me, she requested evenly. Find out what's going on, what the issues and grievances on both sides are. Do what you can to promote some sort of compromise between the forest elves and the humans. Erelyn received this information stoically, but her mind reeled under the weight of her assigned task. Get the elves to compromise? Compromise what? Surrender yet another section or two of the ever-dwindling forest lands to turnip farmers? Cut down a few hundred ancient trees to broaden the tradeway? Agree to do no more than shrug helplessly when the fires of careless merchants or adventurers raged out of control? Set a quota of how many forest creatures could reasonably be taken in foothold traps or run down by hounds, both abominations by elven standards. Look the other way when the occasional Kalashite or Omnite slaving band came to the forest to hunt elven youths and maidens to sell as exotics. Agree in principle to compromise one of the last strongholds of the forest elves, and thus to accelerate the demise of the elven people. Compromise? With one word, Erelyn managed to portray all the force, if not the detail, of her unspoken objections. Kelvin's magical image faced down the wrathful half-elf. What are the alternatives? What chance do the elves have if these conflicts continue and perhaps escalate into warfare? And what would such conflict do to the tenuous balance in Tethyr? No, you must make these elves see reason. Live among them, gain their trust. In Erelyn's opinion, this suggestion was nearly as ludicrous as the first. No one, to her knowledge, had successfully infiltrated a settlement of forest elves. Most Sai Tel Kassir were reclusive, distrustful even of other elves. To be a moon elf was bad enough, but for Erelyn to reveal her half-elven nature would be to court instant death. The forest elves of Tethir had ample reason to hate and distrust humans, and among all of the elven sub-races were many elves who regarded half-elves as unspeakable abominations. Of course, Erelyn had passed as an elf before, but never for the length of time such a thing would take. At least, Kelvin was right about one thing. Before a single word about her mission could be spoken, she would have to earn the elves' respect. Erelyn had learned years ago that the best route to respect for someone like her, a half-elven female who could not lay claim to family, lineage, or name, was to follow the point of her sword. As a fighter, she was very good indeed, but elves were widely renowned for their fighting skills, and thus were not easily impressed. Erelyn had taken on many difficult tasks for the Harpers, but this was the first that sounded truly impossible. The first she actually considered refusing. I will need time to think about this, she told the Archmage's image. As I anticipated, the impossible always takes a little longer. Kelvin responded with a wry smile as he quoted, of all people, his nephew and apprentice, Danilo Than. Erelyn responded with a terse nod and then turned away. She did not want to think of Danilo just now, for her Harper partner would not be pleased to learn that she was being courted for a mission that would exclude him. Not, of course, that her departure, if indeed it occurred at all, would come any time soon. This mission would require the type of planning and attention to detail usually lavished on royal weddings or whole-scale invasions. All thoughts of a night's sleep forgotten, 
The half-elf left the School of Stealth complex and set out for a waterfront tavern. Word had it that a certain Moonshay captain, a former pirate who liked to keep a hand in his original trade, had docked in Zazaspur the day before. He had a special fondness for valuable documents, both genuine and contrived, and he possessed a knowledge of elven ways that far outstripped the understanding of most humans. Rumor had it that one of his recent female passengers, a green elven druid, had become his friend, perhaps even his lover. Liaisons between wild elves and humans were exceedingly rare, but Erelin knew this man well, and saw how such might be possible. Indeed, rumor had it that his ship, Mistwalker, was one of only a handful of human vessels ever permitted to make port on the elven island of Evermeet. In short, he was precisely what Erelin needed. If she was to pose as a visiting moon elf, she would need some way to explain and legitimize her presence in the forest of Tether. If anyone could provide her with the needed forgeries, and perhaps suggest a strategy that would gain her acceptance into the forest community, it would be this sea captain. The night was warm for early summer, and the salty tang of sweat and the sea hung heavy in the tavern. As usual, the breaching whale was crowded with hard-drinking sailors out for a bottomless mug and a bit of fun, and the hard-eyed women who served up both for the price of a few silver coins. It was fairly typical as dockside taverns went, exceptional only for the dozen or so bedchambers over the taproom, which boasted deep feather beds and pristine linens, not to mention a heavily armed guard at each door. Those who knew well the ports of the Sword Coast came to the breaching whale for a clean room and a safe night's sleep, luxuries in any city, and a rarity in Zazaspur. Erelin had no trouble picking Captain Carey Macomail out of the crowd. His mass of curly fair hair, his long and neatly braided whiskers, the bright blue and green weave of his trademark kilt, the extravagant lace-trimmed ruffles at the throat and cuffs of his white shirt, all these things set him apart from most of the breaching whale's rough-clad clientele. He was also by far the largest man in the room. More than three hundred pounds sat easily on a frame that stood just a handspan short of seven feet. Seated on a couple of chairs, one massive arm draped over the back of a third chair, and his booted feet propped up on a fourth, Macomail sipped at a foam-crested mug as he happily exchanged war stories with a pair of Nelanther pirates. As the half-elf made her way across the crowded tavern, she noted which heads huddled together over whispered plots, which fighters kept their hands close to their weapons. She declined an offer of entertainment proffered by one of the tavern's few male barhands, and met the measuring stare of a young toff with a cold gaze that sent him back to contemplating the contents of his mug. This was Zazaspur, and tonight all was business as usual. By way of a greeting, Erelin kicked the chair out from under Macomail's feet. The captain was standing, Dirk held ready in guard position, with a speed that seemed incompatible with his vast size. When his dangerously narrowed gaze settled on Erelin, his face registered first astonishment, then pleasure. Well met again, Lady of the Moonblade, he said happily in a cultured voice made interesting by a lingering touch of northern Moonshay burr. Word travels fast in this port. I hadn't thought to see you for another day or so. His words brought a puzzled frown to Erelin's face. You sent for me? Aye, that I did. He paused and turned to the interested pirates. It has truly been a pleasure, lads. Permit me to settle the evening's bill as a way of thanking you for the shared tales. The two men took the hint. Picking up their half-finished drinks and balancing the large trencher of stewed mutton between them, they wandered off in search of an empty table. Erelin chose a vacated seat that enabled her to keep her back to the wall. As Captain Macamail summoned a barmaid and ordered wine, she turned the chair around and straddled it, her arms folded over the low-runged back. This posture was not only comfortable, but it provided her with a handy and non-lethal weapon to use in the event of a tavern brawl. 
No seasoned adventurer escaped her share of those, and Erolyn had learned to swing a chair as handily as she wielded a sword. So tell me, she said, to get matters rolling along. Captain Macamail winked and reached for the flat leather pouch he wore strapped over one shoulder. I've some fascinating reading for you, he said as he removed a sheaf of papers from the pouch. Have a look at this, if you will. The harper glanced at the parchment that Carrie Macamail thrust into her hands. The captain had provided her with bogus documents several times before, and each one had held up to the closest scrutiny. This sample was especially well done, from the delicate elvish script to a reproduction of the seal of the moonflowers, Evermeet's royal family. It was a masterful forgery. Erolyn let out a low whistle of appreciation. Nice work! And don't I wish I could take credit for it! Macamail touched the creamy, luminous parchment with something approaching awe. That, my dear lady, is the genuine article, and it's addressed to you. The half-elf stared at him. You can't be serious. Read it, he urged. It looks serious enough to me. Retreat to the island home. Find a welcome in the deep forests of Evermeet, Erolyn muttered scanning the pronouncement and automatically translating from Elvish to the widely used trade tongue known as Common. At length, she lifted incredulous eyes to Macamail's face. This is from Am Laurel of Evermeet, an official missive and a commission naming me as her ambassador. Aye, that it is, he agreed. I took it from her hand myself. The Lady Laurel Silverhand was with the Queen. There's a letter from her in that lot as well. Laurel Silverhand was one of the few magic users whom Erolyn trusted and respected. Unlike most arcane scholars, who all too often seemed detached from the world around them and indifferent to the impact their spells might have on others, Laurel possessed a refreshing streak of practicality. A former adventurer, and still a bit of a rogue, Lady Aronson valued results over protocol. She and Erolyn got along just fine, and the half-elf was usually inclined to listen when Laryl spoke. Still feeling stunned, Erolyn sorted through the pages until she found Laryl's letter. It urged her to act on Queen M. Laurel's behalf to combine this mission with a task that would soon be offered to her by the Harpers. The half-elf let the parchment sheets fall to the table, she leaned back and dug one hand into her hair as she considered this unexpected turn of events. In some ways, this was the answer she had been looking for. She didn't believe the forest elves would entertain the idea of compromise, but maybe, just maybe, they would consider retreating to Evermeet. But the question remained, why send her? Why had she been chosen as an emissary of Evermeet, she who had no claim to her elven heritage but the Moonblade strapped to her side? A small, cynical smile tightened the half-elf's lips. Perhaps that was it, Erolyn thought. Perhaps the royal family had finally contrived an honorable way to reclaim Omnestria's sword. They'd wanted it some thirty years ago, when Erolyn's mother the exiled Princess Omnestria had been murdered in distant Everesca, leaving her moonblade to her half-elven daughter. Omnestria's family had come to her funeral, from where Erolyn had no idea, but she remembered with knife-edged clarity the elves' chagrin when they learned of this bequest, their impassioned claims that only a moon-elf of pure blood and noble heart could carry such a sword. Although Omnestria's family had discussed the matter in Erolyn's presence, not one of them had a single word to spare for the grieving child. Not one word of comfort or even of acknowledgement. The royal elves had worn mourning veils that obscured their identities. They had not given Erolyn so much as a glimpse of their faces. Now, all of a sudden, this aloof, faceless queen decided to grant Erolyn the honor of a royal mission? One that was most likely impossible and, Erolyn noted cynically, possibly suicidal? In truth, the half-elf didn't believe the elven queen was deliberately contriving her death. 
but Erelin could not fathom what the reasoning behind this commission might be. And not knowing, combined with her painful memories, made her deeply angry. Erelin reached for the royal commission. Slowly, deliberately, she crumpled up the parchment into a tight wad and dropped it into her half-empty wine goblet. I trust you will be so kind as to relay my answer to the queen, she said in a parody of a courtier's respectful tones. That's your final word? Carrie Macamale asked, dismay written across his bewhiskered countenance. The half-elf leaned back and folded her arms over her chest. Actually, I have a few more thoughts on the matter. Repeat them or not as you choose. She then proceeded to describe what the Elven Queen could do with her offer, at length, in precise detail, and vividly enough to drain the color from the captain's ruddy face. For a long moment, the sea captain merely stared at Erelin. His barrel chest rose and fell in a heavy sigh. Well, it's been said there's no wind so strong but that it can't change direction, he observed. Mist Walker will be in port for a ten day or two, should you decide you want to do business. I wouldn't lay odds on it, Erelin advised him as she rose to her feet. She tossed a pair of coins onto the table to pay her portion of the tab, and then stalked off. Macamale watched the half-elf go. A tipsy female sailor rose to block Erelin's path, her hand on her dagger's hilt and a leer of challenge twisting her lips. The half-elf did not even slow down. She backhanded the woman, who spun on one heel and fell face first onto a small gaming table. Dice and half-emptied mugs went flying, and the sharp crack of splintering wood mingled with the startled oaths of the interrupted gamblers. The woman lay groaning amid the wreckage of the table. Erelin did not bother to look back. The captain's gaze shifted from the downed sailor to the wine-soaked parchment. He regarded the ruined document with regret. Then he sighed again and took a duplicate copy from his bag. Upon Leryl's advice, the Elven Queen had had five copies of Erelin Moonblade's commission made. Leryl had warned both Queen and Captain that persistence would most likely be in order. After witnessing the Harper's first rejection, Carrie Macumale sincerely hoped five copies would be enough. Chapter 3 The baying of the hounds was louder now, and the dogs were so close that the fleeing elves could almost smell the fetid scent of their fur and feel their frenzy. They were like humans, these dogs, hunting not for food and survival, but for the sordid pleasure of the kill. It was not the first time such animals had been brought into the forest. Great mastiffs, they were, so powerful that two or three of them might bring down a full-grown bear, yet fleet enough to run down a deer. They crashed through the underbrush on massive paws, slavering like moon-mad wolves as they closed in on their prey. The elven leader, a young male known as Foxfire for his russet-colored hair, shot a grim look over his shoulder. All too soon, the hounds would have them in sight. The humans would not be far behind. It took little skill to follow the trail of crushed foliage the hunting dogs left behind like a thick and jagged scar on the forest. Foxfire was not certain which of the intruders was the less natural, dog or master. He'd seen what the Mastiffs could do to a captured elf. Galea, a young priestess of his tribe, had been herded by such dogs into the iron jaws of a foothold trap, and then worried to death. The humans had left her torn and savaged body there for the elves to find. Left behind, too, were the tracks that told Foxfire the humans had stood by watching as their dogs killed the helpless priestess. To the trees! Foxfire ordered tersely. Scatter, but do not let them follow you. Meet me at dusk in the ash grove. The elves, seven of them, all armed with bows and quivers full of jet-black arrows, scrambled up the ancient trees as lightly as squirrels. There they would be invisible to the eyes of the humans and beyond the snapping jaws of the humans' four-legged counterparts. 
they disappeared into the thick canopy, making their separate ways from tree to tree. Only Foxfire stayed behind, feeling uncomfortably like a treed raccoon as he waited for the human hunters to come to the call of their hounds. The mastiffs circled the giant cedar, baying and snarling and leaping against the massive trunk. Foxfire was fully aware of the danger of his position, and never would he have asked this of any elf under his command. There were answers, however, that he must have. The elf waited patiently until the humans came into view. There were twenty of them, but Foxfire had eyes for only one. He knew this human by his massive size, by the dark gray cloak that flowed behind him like a storm cloud, and by the iron-toed boots he wore. The elf had found large, unusual boot prints very close to the place of Galea's death, bloodless prints upon blood-soaked earth, prints that indicated the man had stood by and watched the elf woman's horrible fate. And after a battle that had cost the lives of two elven fighters, Foxfire had glimpsed the swirl of that dark cape as the human shouldered the body of one of the elf warriors and bore him away. For what purpose, Foxfire could not begin to guess. He knew only that in this man, the elves of Tether had a formidable and evil enemy. Carefully, he committed the man's face to memory. It was a face easily remembered, a visage that matched the grim deeds of its owner. Black-bearded, with the scimitar of a nose and eyes as cold and gray as the snow clouds that gathered around the peaks of the Star Spire Mountains. The man stalked toward the yapping hounds, his face a mask of fury. He kicked out hard, and his iron-clad boot caught one of the mastiffs in the ribs. The force of the blow lifted the large dog off its feet. It fell heavily on its side and lay there, kicking and yelping piteously. The others cringed away with their tails tucked tightly between their legs. Useless curs! The man swore and kicked out again. This time, the dogs mustered enough wit to dodge. Set the tree afire, Bunlap? One of the men inquired. Let it smoke the long-eared bastards out. The leader whirled on the fighter. If you had the sense the gods gave a dung beetle, he said coldly, you would know that the elves are long gone. They leap from tree to tree like Chilton monkeys. What then? Another man demanded. The man called Bunlap shrugged his massive shoulders. We call the hunt a loss. Too bad. That farm south of Mossstone, the one that grows pipeweed, would have paid well for more wild elf slaves. Best workers they've got, or so the man tells me. Seems to me those scrawny elves wouldn't be worth the trouble it takes to break them, observed another man, a thin, rangy fellow who carried the bow of a forest elf. Foxfire's eyes narrowed as he took note of that bow. He had little doubt how the man had obtained it, for no elf would part willingly with such a treasure. Bunlap responded to the archer's comment with an ugly smile. Not if you've a taste for that sort of thing. It was all Foxfire could do to keep from sending a storm of black arrows into the twisted and murderous humans. He could certainly do it. He was accounted the finest archer in the Elmanes tribe, and surely the world would be a better place without such foul creatures. Yet he could not, for he was a leader among his people and had more important things to consider than his own outrage. The humans were harrying the elves. This was nothing new, but there was a taunting quality to many of the attacks that puzzled Foxfire. It was as if these men were goading the forest folk, prodding them toward... toward what, he could not say. Lease the dogs and let's head out, Bunlap ordered. Foxfire waited until the mastiffs had been secured and the men began to retrace their steps out of the forest. As he'd expected, the tall leader took his place in the rear, as was his custom. Foxfire noted that Bunlap was more alert and observant than most of his comrades. This made the man all the more dangerous. High overhead, the elf followed, creeping along the branches and slowly, silently working his way down toward the humans. 
The heavy-footed tread and the constant boasting chatter of the men made his task an easy one. When the moment was right, Foxfire dropped lightly to the ground behind Bunlap. The man responded to the faint sound with a startled oath, but before he could turn around, Foxfire seized a handful of the human's black hair and reached around to press a bone knife to his throat. Fire-forged weapons were rare in the forest, but this knife was long and boasted a keen, serrated edge. The man seemed to understand that the weapon was equal to the task, for he slowly lifted both hands into the air. You are far from home, Foxfire observed as calmly as if the two were sharing wild mead and discussing the weather. At the sound of his voice, a sound too musical to have come from a human throat, the other fighters whirled. Their eyes went wide with fear and wonder at the sight of the copper-skinned elf who had appeared in their midst. None of them had ever seen a wild elf up close, at least not one that was alive and unharmed, and this creature possessed a deadly beauty that compelled both dread and awe. Hold fast the dogs and leave your weapons where they are the elf advised them. This is a matter between this man and me. A council of leaders, if you will. Do as he says, Bunlap said coolly. You speak the common tongue, he observed, his voice as steady as the elf's. I am Elmaness. My tribe used to trade with your people until the risks became too high. But this is not a time for the telling of old tales— why have you come to the forest? Justice, the man said in a grim tone. Foxfire blinked. On the lips of such a man, the lofty declaration seemed strangely out of place. How so? the elf demanded, giving his knife a little twitch to speed the man's reply. Come now, Bunlap chided him. Do you claim to have no knowledge of the attacks your people have made upon human caravans and settlements? The looting? The helpless people they have slain? This cannot be, the elf protested, although in truth he was not entirely certain it might not be so. The vast forest was home to several small groups, and there was little contact between them. It was entirely possible that some of the more reclusive and mysterious elven clans had decided to take up arms against the humans. The human leader seemed to sense the doubt in Foxfire's voice. I myself have done battle with wild elves, Bunlap asserted. I stood beside the farm folk they tried to massacre. Some of the surviving marauders have been put to work to take the place of the men they felled with their accursed black arrows. Forest people enslaved? the elf demanded incredulously. Even among the lawless humans of Tethir, there were strictures against such things. A life for a life, Bunlap said coldly. Justice comes in many forms. For a moment, Foxfire stood silent as he tried to assimilate the possibilities. But even if the man's claim of elven attacks held some truth, they did not begin to explain all the things this particular human had done nor could Foxfire overlook the fact that these men had come to the forest for the purpose of taking more elves as slaves, perhaps to satisfy this bizarre and illogical code of justice. Was it possible these humans actually believed that the death or enslavement of one elf could redress the grievances caused by another? By the sky and spirits, he swore silently, if the forest people thought that way, they would slay every human who ventured within reach of their arrows. In truth, some elves did think along these terms, and at the moment Foxfire was less inclined to disagree with them than usual. My tribe will not stand by to see the people enslaved. If you come to the forest again, my warriors will be here to meet you, Foxfire said softly. I myself will be watching for you. I know your face, and I have seen your mark. Know me by mine. The bone knife slashed up, tracing a tightly curved arch through Bunlap's thick beard and up onto his cheek. 
With astonishing speed, the elf changed the direction of the cut, curving the knife down and then lifting it for another deft, curving slash. The man let out a roar of pain and rage as he clapped one hand to his bleeding face. Bringing his other arm up, he lashed back hard with his elbow and meant nothing but air. The elf was gone. Release the dogs! Bunlap yelled, and the men hastened to obey, although they suspected it would do no good. The animals dutifully put their noses down and circled and sniffed, but the wild elf had well and truly disappeared. The man with the elven bow pulled a wad of dirty cloth from his pack and offered it to the leader. Bunlap pressed the makeshift bandage to his cheek and glared into the silent forest. Think he took the bait? The archer ventured. A slow, grim smile spread across the leader's face, made ghastly by the smears of drying blood. I would wager on it. They will come, and we'll be ready to greet them. But mark me. That elf is mine. I thought you wanted to stir up their war leaders, not take them out. Bunlap turned his cold gaze upon the archer. My dear Venlar, this is no longer merely a business venture. This has become personal. The archer blanched. He'd heard those words before, many times, and each time as a prelude to serious trouble. The first incident had been several years back, when he and Bunlap were soldiers stationed in the fortress of Darkhold. They'd been assigned to escort an envoy from Gentle Keep through Yellowsnake Pass. One evening he, Bunlap, and one of their charges had entered into a discussion of the Dark Gods, one that quickly degenerated into a quarrel. Bunlap took matters personally and beat his opponent nearly to death. When they learned that the injured man was a high-ranking priest of Siric, the new god of strife, they did not stay around to see how the situation played out. They'd headed south until Bunlap thought them beyond the reach of the Dark Network, settled down in Tethir, and built a mercenary band of considerable strength. But though Bunlap might have left the Gentilar behind, his goals and methods had not changed for the better. In truth, there were times when Venlar dearly wished he could be rid of the man. His own love of profit, however, kept him at the side of the one person he feared and despised above all others. And profit there was. Venlar figured that in a few years he would have enough coin stashed away to allow him to retire in splendor. If the cost of this was a few elven lives, he, for one, would have no regrets. Venlar fell into step beside his employer. As they walked, he dreamed of the wondrous things his share of the profit would buy him, and he stroked the smooth wood of his stolen elven bow with a lover's touch. Leaving Zazaspur behind, Erolin followed the trade route north into the sun-baked flatlands that lay between the city and the Star Spire Mountains. The mountains themselves were deeply forested, watered by numerous lakes and streams as well as an abundance of rain and even snow. And this was well, Erolin thought, with a touch of dark humor, considering the number of magical conflagrations that had broken out in the area in recent months. The harper veered off the path to follow the base of the southernmost mountain. She reined her mare in at a thick stand of conifers and swung down from the saddle. After securing her horse, Erolin pressed through the trees to the steep, sheer rock wall they concealed. A vertical crevice slashed through the moss-dappled rock. Erolin slipped into the cave's mouth and made her way down the labyrinth of passages that led to a deep and soaring cavern. Here, hidden from the eyes of the skeptical and the vengeful, labored the alchemist known as Tinker's Dam of Gond. It was an odd-looking lair, vast and open, yet cluttered enough to give the impression of bustling activity despite the fact that it had but one occupant. Several book-laden shelves were propped against the cave walls, and half-finished mechanical wonders littered a dozen or so long tables. Small cooking fires dotted the cave, and a muted symphony of hissing, crackling sounds rose from pots of bubbling, often luminous, substances. 
Erelyn lifted her eyes to the ceiling vent, taking note of the new layers of viscous black substances staining the rocks around the overhead opening. Explosions were to be expected when dealing with Tinker's Dam. Even the residents of Zazaspur no longer commented on the brief but spectacular displays of fireworks which lit the eastern skies from time to time, except to take the occasional snide jab at newly rich merchants who apparently possessed more money than taste. Erelyn had counted three such explosions since her last visit, and in truth was relieved to see that the alchemist was still hale and whole. No one could mistake Tinkersdam for anything other than what he was. A native of Lantern, where Gond the Wondermaker, the god of inventors and artificers, was worshipped almost exclusively. Tinkersdam had the odd coloring typical for the Lantana, only taken to extreme degrees. His sparse red hair approximated the color and texture of copper wire. His sallow skin captured the exact hue of yellowed ivory and his large, rather bulbous eyes were a strange shade of light green that did not occur elsewhere in nature. Out of lifelong habit, Tinker's Dam wore a short tunic of bright yellow, the traditional color of lantern, and sandals on his bare feet. His plump, extremely bowed legs were hairless, as was his face, no doubt the result of the many explosions that his work occasioned. A skilled inventor and a daring alchemist, Tinker's Dam had a particular fondness for lethal gadgets that could kill or disable people in innovative ways. He had been exiled from Lantern years ago when one of his experiments blew up someone influential. He had since been invited to leave several other cities for similar reasons. Erelyn would be the first to acknowledge that Tinker's Dam, although he was undoubtedly brilliant, straddled the line between eccentricity and insanity. Yet, the odd little man had become one of her most valued allies. Theirs was a symbiotic relationship. Over the years, he'd provided her with any number of gadgets and alchemically derived substances. She devised a practical use for them, in the process often finding new and unanticipated applications that delighted the alchemist. Erelyn's gaze swept the workshop, searching for the items she'd requested. There was never any guarantee that Tinker's Dam would complete a project by the requested date. Time had little meaning to the man, and he was likely to desert a given task to work on some new and wondrously destructive toy that caught his fancy. At the moment, Tinker's Dam was standing before a small stove, his attention wholly absorbed with the concoction he was stirring. Steam rose from the iron skillet, and with it the rich, earthy scent of cooking mushrooms. It was a homey enough scene, except for the agonized screams that came from the pan, and for the large brown mushrooms that lay on the table beside him, twitching frantically and emitting shrieks of horror as they awaited their fate. Underdark Mushrooms The realization sent a shiver up the harper's spine. She'd heard tales of the bizarre fungi that grew in those deep tunnels. How Tinkersdam had managed to obtain some, and what he planned to do with them, were matters she did not care to contemplate. How is the eye mask coming? she asked. The sound of her voice did not seem to startle the alchemist. Indeed, Tinkersdam did not so much as look up. Erelyn was not certain whether he'd been aware of her from the first, or whether her presence simply didn't matter enough to register with him. Third table from my right, Tinker's Dam muttered in a reedy voice as he picked up a small, moldering tome. Sauté shriekers until silent, stir in powdered effrete lungs, add two drops of congealed manticore drool, he read aloud. Erelyn shuddered again and went in search of the indicated item. She poked around in the clutter for several moments before she found it, a half-mask of some pale, supple substance that looked remarkably like the skin of a moon elf, except for the incredibly tiny gearworks packed behind the mask's painted eyes. A mirror hung on one wall of the cave. Despite his undeniable lack of physical beauty, Tinker's Dam was quite particular about his grooming. Erelyn went to the mirror and pressed the half-mask onto her face. 
The thin material clung to her skin, taking on color as it warmed until it matched exactly the pale hue of her face, even to the faint blue highlights on her cheekbones. Even more remarkable were the eyes. Not only were they an exact replica of her own, large, almond-shaped, a distinctive elven shade of deep blue flecked with gold, but they even blinked from time to time in a most realistic fashion. She could see through them, yet when she closed her own eyes and raised her hand to touch the mask, she was pleased to note that the false eyes remained open. Most extraordinary of all was that Tinkersdam had managed to imbue the mask with an expression of dreamy contemplation, perfect for its intended purpose. How is this done? Magic? Tinkersdam responded with a derisive sniff. This was an attitude Erolin could appreciate. She herself had more faith in the alchemist's inventions than in the caprices of magic. Besides, the forest elves would sense a magical illusion more quickly than a mechanical one. Erolin had not yet decided whether or not to attempt the mission into the forest, but of one thing she was certain. If she succeeded, it would be in no small part due to Tinkersdam's devices. Posing as an elf was no problem for Erolin, at least not for short periods of time. In many ways she favored her mother's race, from her distinctively elven eyes to the preternatural speed of her sword play. Her pearly skin and raven-black hair were common to moon elves, and her slender form was that of an elf, although at three inches short of six feet she was far taller than most. The constant stress and struggle of her tenure in Zazaspur's Assassin's Guild had left her as finely drawn as any moon elf alive. While elven faces tended to be quite angular, hers was a smooth oval. But her ears were nearly as pointed as those of a full-blooded elf, and her features were delicate and sharp. There were little things, however, that could give her away. Not the least of these was the fact that she slept. Elves, as a rule, did not. Most of Toril's elves found repose in a deep, meditative state known as reverie. Erolin had never been able to enter reverie, and when passing as an elf she had to go to extreme lengths to get the necessary rest. This mask was such a ploy. Since no elf would approach another elf in reverie except in the direst of emergencies, she could put on the mask and sleep beneath it, undisturbed. A sharp pop interrupted her thoughts. Erolin spun to see a tendril of black smoke wafting toward the top of the cave. Tinkersdam was neither hurt nor perturbed by this development. He regarded the smoking contents of his skillet with satisfaction, then seized a funnel and carefully poured the liquid into a glass vial. That should do the trick, he said happily. At last, raising his eyes to Erolin, he inquired, Do you sing? The harper blinked. I don't make a habit of it. A pity. Tinkerstam stroked his bald chin and mused. Suddenly he snapped his fingers. Reaching confidently into the general debris of the table behind him, he pulled from the pile the lid of a large pot. He poured a single drop of the still steaming fluid onto the metal and then lifted the lid into a shield guard position. Be so kind as to strike he requested. When she hesitated, he pointed out, The potion did no damage to a tin lid. It is unlikely to harm an elven sword. Seeing the logic in this, Erolin drew her moon blade and obligingly smacked the flat of it against the makeshift shield. Immediately, a deep, ringing sound rolled through the cavern, like the tolling of a giant bell might sound to someone who stood in the bell tower directly below it. The harper swore and clapped both hands to her sensitive ears. Tinkersdam, however, merely beamed, even though the vibrations from the shield ran up his arms and set his pair of chins a-quiver. Oh, excellent! A fine result! he shouted happily. Still smiling broadly, Tinkersdam tossed aside the lid, then stoppered the vial with a cork and handed it to Erolin. You might find a use for this in your travels. Don't... Drink it, he cautioned her loudly. At least not on an empty stomach. Rumblings, you know. 
Since the rejoinder that came to Erolin's mind paled before this latest absurdity, she merely took the vial and gingerly tucked it into her pack. The other things? she requested, shouting to be heard above the ringing in her ears. Most of them, the alchemist agreed in kind. He bustled over to the far side of the cavern and took a large, paper-wrapped bundle from a pile of similar packages. This one is yours. I added a few new devices for you to test. Do tell me how they turn out. Erolin noted the insignia of Balik, the family name of Zazaspur's ruling Pasha, adorning several of the packages. Hasheth has been here, I see. Yes, indeed. Fine lad, the alchemist commented. The harper was not so sure she agreed with that assessment. Granted, the young Prince Hasheth had proven to be a valuable contact. Through him, Danilo had gained access to the palace, and she herself had received much useful information about Zazaspur. It was Hasheth who had helped her set up Tinker's Dam in a wondrous workshop hidden in the mountains overlooking the city, and who continued to supply the alchemist with needed ingredients, often at his own expense. Yet Erolin could not forget the particulars of their first meeting, Hasheth had been a student assassin, and she had been his assigned prey. Although the young prince had opened a door for her into the closely held Assassin's Guild and had since moved on to sample several other professional endeavors, the half-elf did not miss the predatory gleam in his black eyes whenever he regarded her. Or perhaps she was simply becoming too accustomed to expecting the worst wherever she looked. Soon I'll be seeing ogres under every bed and a drow in every shadow, she muttered. That happened to me once, Tinkersdam commiserated. Apparently his hearing slipped back into the normal range with amazing speed. Fumes, you know. I was swatting at invisible sturges for days. Erolin sighed and shouldered her package. I was offered another assignment. I might be going away for a while. Oh? We're moving again? It was not an unreasonable question. An explosion in Suzale a few years back had destroyed a hefty portion of a castle belonging to an influential nobleman and forced Tinkersdam into hiding. Rather than hunt him down whenever she needed him, Erolin found it worth her while to locate the alchemist near her current base of operations. She paid most of his expenses through the fees she earned adventuring for the Harpers, and considered every copper well spent. You can stay here until I return. If you need anything, contact Hasheth. Fine, lad, Tinkersdam repeated. Although I do hope he stays close to Zazaspur. I'm not precisely welcome in Saradush, Ithmong, or Miratma, he confided, naming the rest of Tethir's major cities. Erolin sighed again. Tell me, Tinkersdam, is there any city on Toril that you haven't blown up at least a portion of? Gentle keep, the alchemist responded without a moment's hesitation. But of course, that would take a far braver man than I. The comment surprised a chuckle from the harper. Almost sorry to hear it, she said with a wry grin. If any city needs a bit of forceful house cleaning, it's that one. Well, Someone will get around to it sooner or later, Tinkersdam said absently, his large green eyes roving to the glowing substance popping and bubbling in a large cauldron. Now, if you will excuse me. Taking the hint, Erolin left the cavern and began the ride back to the city. She pressed her mare hard, for she wished to be in the school of stealth's council hall before moonrise. With the coming of night, new commissions were posted and assassins came to bid on choice jobs. At no other time did Erolin receive so much useful information on the underside of Zazaspurian politics. She rode through the main gate of the complex at dusk. Tossing her reins to the stable boy who ran to greet her, she hurried to the council hall and scanned the bits of parchment nailed to the door. There was nothing of great interest. Some baker wished to avenge an insult dealt to his pastry. A harem girl was willing to pay in trade for the death of a self-avowed and apparently spurious eunuch. A wealthy collector wanted a piece of stolen property retrieved from the treasure house of a rival. 
Scant pickings tonight, observed a whispery voice at Erolyn's elbow. The harper turned to regard the only other female in the Assassin's Guild, an exotic beauty who went by the name of Ferret. To Erolyn's way of thinking, the assassin resembled her namesake. The woman was whip-thin and sharp-featured, with black eyes that seemed not quite human, and a long, slender nose that lacked only whiskers and a twitch. Remorseless, relentless, she was ferret-like in character as well. To everyone in the guildhouse, the ferret was a bit of a mystery. She was never seen without heavy makeup, a tightly wound turban, and gloves. Nor was she ever heard to speak above a whisper. Rumor had it that she'd been disfigured in some accident, but apart from these idiosyncrasies there were no apparent flaws in her beauty, which she flaunted by dressing in scant silk garments so tight they appeared to have been painted onto her lithe form. Tonight she wore a gown patterned in jewel-like colors that echoed the resplendent plumage of a peacock. Earrings made from the eyes of a peacock's tail feathers dangled from her earlobes, the only part of her ears that were visible beneath her cobalt-blue turban. The ferret folded her arms and leaned indolently against the door jamb. So, which job strikes your fancy? The baker, the whore, or the thief? Not the baker. Erolyn said with a grim smile. I've tasted his baking. No one should die for insulting it. I say long life to the critic, and may he do better elsewhere. Ah, yes, Ferret sneered. The gods forbid you should take the life of an innocent man. By all means, take the second job. Watching a harem girl at work could do you nothing but good. The harper shrugged off the insult. It was not the first time Ferret had mocked Erolyn's aesthetics of solitude and chastity. In fact, the assassin's favorite taunt for her half-elven colleague was half-woman, spoken with scathing innuendo. Ferret, by all reports, had no such scruples. The woman was said to be omnivorous, with an appetite and skills that astonished even those wealthy and jaded Zazaspurian noblemen who sought to imitate the Pasha by keeping extensive and exotic harems. Ferret was also very, very good with a blade. Erolyn had wondered more than once why the Ferret had never challenged her. Of all the assassins in the guild, Erolyn thought Ferret the one most likely to successfully relieve her of her shadow sash. But the black-eyed woman seemed content with her rank, preferring to spend her time and energy on fee-paying assignments. And speaking of fees, Erolyn noted that the collector was paying very well for the return of his stolen property. Her expenses had been high of late, so she ripped the third posting from the door. Ferret let out a gasp of mock astonishment. Removing a choice assignment before other assassins had a chance to bid for it was considered a severe breach of guild etiquette. The only people here are you and I, Erolyn pointed out, brandishing the paper under Ferret's long nose. Do you want this? It's a job for two, and the fee is certainly high enough to pay for both the woman observed coldly. But you're welcome to it all the same. I'd sooner take payment in the coin of the harem than partner myself to a half-elf. Erolyn blinked, surprised by the venom in the woman's voice. There were quite a few half-elves in Tethir, and for the most part they were treated well. Animosity that burned this bright was unusual. Suit yourself, the harper said as she turned to leave. She had little energy to spare the woman's prejudices, for there was much to be done. Sending a messenger to the collector with a tentative acceptance and a request for more information, finding someone who knew the floor plan of the rival's palace and who would be willing to sell this information, planning methods of circumventing the guards and magical wards that would certainly protect the treasure. Fortunately, the requested item was small, a silver tiara studded with pale amethysts, it was not always so. Once Erolyn had been commissioned to steal back the stuffed and mounted head of a basilisk. That had not been her favorite assignment. On the whole, it would probably have been easier to hunt down and slay a fresh monster. I've no use for tiaras, 
but if you see some nice necklaces or pins, bring me back two or three. Ferret called after her in a penetrating whisper. I'll pay you half the market cost of the gems and save you the trouble of finding a fence. Erelyn did not answer, for she had no intention of taking anything but the requested item, and she knew from Ferret's mocking tone that the woman suspected as much. This Erelyn found disturbing. The brief conversation with the exotic assassin had made it plain that, for whatever reason, Erelyn had yet another enemy within the school of stealth, one who had taken the trouble to observe her closely. Acting on impulse, the harper turned and strode from the complex. She had intended to go straight to the women's guild house and make an early night of it. The tasks ahead of her were many and difficult, and she had slept far too little of late. Yet she doubted she'd get any rest this night if she stayed in the ferret's den. There were enough coins in her pockets to buy her a room in a modest tavern, and a night's sleep would be worth every one of them. Soon I'll be seeing ogres under every bed and drow in every shadow, Erelyn observed as she walked, softly repeating the self-mocking phrase she'd used in Tinkersdam's lair. But she found little comfort in the exercise, for the once jesting words now held the ring of presentiment and the resonance of a well-timed warning. The wary harper took her own advice to heart. As she walked through the lamplit streets of Zazaspur, she weighed every shadow and kept a sword's reach between herself and each passerby. It was a lonely and exhausting way to live, perhaps but Erelyn vastly preferred it to the alternative. Death was the constant companion of any adventurer. She had danced with it for nearly thirty years without surrendering the lead. Survival was a straightforward matter. One merely had to call the tune, know the floor, and never miss a step. The analogy brought a faint smile to Erelyn's lips. She would have to remember that and pass it on to Danilo upon their next meeting, he would seize upon the inadvertent poetry and fashion it into one of his wistful ballads, a song that would never be heard by his frivolous peers. The young man was a prolific amateur composer with two distinct portfolios, a collection of humorous, often bawdy, ballads that he performed in the salons and fest halls of Waterdeep, and the thoughtful songs and airs that were his gift to himself, and of himself. Erelyn was not unaware that she was the only person with whom he shared these deeply felt songs. They had spent many evenings beside wilderness campfires, Danilo singing to his lute while Erelyn contemplated the stars, receiving both starlight and music with silent, elven joy. The measured tread behind her snatched Erelyn from her memories and returned her to the streets of Zazaspur. The cadence of it matched her own quick and long-legged stride, which was usually a sure sign that she was being stalked. Not an assassin this time, a cut-purse, probably, for the man was making no attempt at silence. The best thieves strove to blend with the crowd, depending upon cunning and quickness of hand for success. Erelyn glanced to her left. Sure enough, a scruffy and ill-dressed man reeled along, holding a half-full bottle of riven gut and muttering thickly to himself. But for all his drunken meanderings, he managed to keep pace with her. It was a common enough ploy. A pair of cut purses chose a mark, then one jostled the victim to distract her while the actual theft occurred from behind. The counter-strategy was also simple. When the drunk reeled toward her, Erelyn seized his jerkin and spun him around then hurled him into the outstretched hands of his cut-purse partner. Both went down heavily, the first man cursing with an articulate fervor that belied his inebriated state. This attack earned Erelyn some dark looks from the other passers-by, but no one bothered to challenge or berate her for it. She also noticed that no one made any effort to help the fallen men up, or to inquire after their well-being. The half-elf continued on her way, and as she walked, she tried without success to recapture the dream of the wilderness, the starlight, and the shared solitude. Such moments were becoming harder to grasp with each day she spent among these lawless humans. Soon, she feared, they would be gone past recall, 
and with them the meager remnants of her elven soul. Chapter 4 Days passed, and yet Erolin was no closer to fulfilling her latest contract than she'd been the night she ripped the notice from the council hall door. As luck would have it, the man from whom she was hired to steal was one Abram Asante, a member of her own alleged profession. Once a master assassin, he had retired from the school of stealth a few years back to enjoy his hard-earned wealth. So far, the preparations had been far more difficult than Erolin had anticipated. Not that looting palaces was ever easy. Most rich men learned prudence somewhere along the line. A wealthy assassin could be expected to exercise even more caution. Asante had cocooned himself with enough layers of intrigue, might, and magic to discourage all but the most persistent. In her quest to infiltrate the man's stronghold, Erolin found herself stretching her previous notions of perseverance beyond recognition. Except for Asante's personal servants, all of whom were carefully sequestered, there was no man or woman alive who knew the palace's secrets. Erolin went so far as to search for a few dead servants, for dead men do tell tales, provided one could afford the services of a cleric powerful enough to summon their spirits. The harper had never before considered such tactics. Elves were loath to disturb those who had passed from this life, but there was little information to be found among the living. A few well-placed bribes gave Erolin access to the records of various slave traders, which she checked for sales made to Asante over the last twenty years or so. She laboriously compared these names to the records listing those interred in the low-budget crypts reserved for slaves. But none of this paperwork a task Erolin despised nearly as much as she disliked the notion of disturbing the dead, yielded much insight. It seemed that none of Abram Asante's servants had ever been buried in or around Zazaspur. Either they had somehow achieved immortality, or their bodies had been disposed of inside the palace grounds. The latter explanation struck Erolin as a distinct possibility. Asante's palace, a wonder of pink marble and clever illusions, was a testament to its owner's wealth and wariness, an enormous vault that held a thousand secrets. The extensive grounds were surrounded by a very high, thick wall that looked relatively easy to scale. This, however, was the first illusion. The wall, near the top, curved gently outward, then jutted straight up in a broad, steeply slanted lip. There was absolutely no handhold, no secure hold beyond for a grappling hook. Erolin learned that would-be thieves often fell to their deaths on the stone walkways below. Nor did matters improve inside the courtyard, which was all that most of Asante's guests ever saw of the complex. After seeking out and questioning many of these visitors, assuming a different disguise for each interview, Erolin pieced together the disheartening details. Just inside the walls, lining all four sides of the courtyard, were long, shallow reflecting pools. Rumor had it that the placid-looking pools were filled not with water, but a highly corrosive acid. Several visitors, however, reported seeing gliding swans and flowering water plants in the supposedly deadly moat. After considering all the available evidence, Erolin was betting on the acid. On one thing all agreed. Four graceful bridges, one on each side of the courtyard, spanned the pools, and beyond each was a glowing azure cloud that dispelled any magical illusions. No one could enter the courtyard without either wading the pools or passing through the mist. This alone was enough to convince the half-elf that the pools were deadly. And after a few mugs of ale, one of Asante's visitors had confided that he'd seen one of the swans waddle into the mist and disappear. The swan, apparently, was itself no more than an illusion. Nor were the water plants and swans the courtyard's only surprise. Most of the garden's statues and gargoyles came in matched pairs. It was rumored that one of each was either an animated construct or a living creature. No one was certain which was which. 
The bridges, too, were each flanked by a pair of identical Kalashite guards. This was another small ploy, meant to lull would-be challengers into believing there was but one guard and a magical reflection. In reality, each pair of guards consisted of twin-born brothers, carefully chosen and trained to mirror each other's movements with uncanny precision, until the moment when it suited them to strike individually and unexpectedly. Asante, as Erelin had come to know, possessed a very dark and convoluted mind. The palace itself was a massive, smooth oval. No corners to hide lurkers, no cover of decorative plants around its base, no vines climbing upon its pink walls. Several stories high, it was fashioned after an ancient ziggurat, a stepped pyramid of successively receding, oval-shaped stories. Towers and crenellations there were in plenty, but only on the uppermost level. A high, central tower rose from the top floor. The sentries posted there had an unobstructed view of the grounds, the walls, and several blocks of the city that lay beyond. It was one of the strangest, yet one of the most defensible, fortresses Erelin had ever encountered. None of the usual assassin's tricks would work, for Asante knew them all and had no doubt taken every precaution. Magical disguises were useless, for all who crossed the bridges had to pass through the glowing mist that negated magical illusions. There was no way over, around, or through. That, Erelin surmised, left under. To her way of thinking, the palace had to have at least one escape tunnel. No assassin who'd lived to Asante's venerable age would have neglected such a basic precaution. The problem was finding its point of exit, and then finding a way in. Most escape tunnels were contrived to be one-way passages. The answer came to her slowly, in small pieces. One of the few visitors to enter the palace had spoken of a fountain that smelled of minerals, a sure sign that it was spring-fed. A watery escape route was unusual, but not impossible. But where was its source? Dozens of springs came down to Zazaspur from their origins in the Starspire Mountains. Public bathhouses built over warm, effervescent waters were commonplace in the city. It was this thought that finally provided the connection. Although the wary Asante would never set foot in a bathhouse himself, he kept an establishment for the entertainment of his friends and business associates. This was hardly common knowledge. Erelin spent the better part of two days tracking down the scattered trail of documents that confirmed Asante's ownership of the posh house of pleasure and healing. Along the way, she learned that the former assassin held an impressive amount of real estate in Zazaspur. She tucked away this information for future use, and then got down to the business of finding the tunnel. Mistress Penelope, the chatelaine and manager of the Foaming Sands, looked her new applicant up and down with a practiced eye. She had never employed a half-elven woman in the bathhouse, nor did any of her competitors. The sheer novelty of it might bring in new customers. This one was a likely-looking wench, a bit too thin, perhaps, but such wonderful pearly skin. After a few hours in the steamy chambers, most of the girls looked as red and disheveled as fishwives on washing day. Still, the half-elf did look rather delicate. The job was not all beauty and pleasure. There was real work to be done. The Chatelaine looked down at the references the half-elf offered. They were impressive indeed. She had worked as a courtesan in the palace of Lord Pyrgirin in decadent Waterdeep. That spoke well for her discretion and knowledge of courtly mores and manners. She had served as hostess in the Blushing Mermaid, a luxurious fest hall and water spa in the rough and tumble dock ward of that same city. That indicated she knew the trade and could handle a wide range of patrons. And finally, she had been set up in a private household by a wealthy baron in the northern reaches of Am. That proved that she was skilled enough to capture the attention of a man who could afford the best of everything. The half-elf was also an acquaintance of the young Prince Hashath and Penelope knew the wisdom of maintaining cordial ties with whatever ruling power currently prevailed. One test remained, 
for Penelope was entrusted with the safety of her patrons as well as their pleasure. She opened a carved wooden box on her desk and took from it a pinch of yellow powder. This she sprinkled onto the palm of her hand and then blew into the air. Immediately the ivory pendant that hung over the half-elf's heart began to glow with azure light, a sure sign that the ornament held magic of some sort. The applicant did not look at all startled or chagrined by this revelation. Penelope wondered how the half-elf might react if she knew that the simple spell also compelled truthful answers. "'What manner of device is that?' the Chatelaine demanded. A demure smile curved the half-elf's lips. "'It is an amulet of water-breathing. In my line of work I have found that the ability to remain underwater for a length of time can be very... useful.' Penelope gaped, then closed her mouth with a faint click. She nodded thoughtfully as she considered the possibilities. Can you start tomorrow? Erolyn walked silently along the tunnel, counting her steps and concentrating intently upon distance and direction. She could find her way on the open moor or through the deepest forest as well as any ranger she knew, but her sense of direction was badly skewed in this deeply buried passage. Fortunately, the tunnel was short and relatively straight. There was little need for false turns and multiple passages, for the tunnel was well and truly hidden. And, if Erolyn's estimations were correct, the tunnel did indeed go under Abram Asante's palace. Suddenly, the tunnel took a sharp downward slope. At the bottom of the incline, Erolyn could see the churning warmth of the mineral spring. This, she did not doubt, would lead her into Asante's palace. She was also quite certain that a surprise or two lurked in the water. The harper instinctively took a deep breath, although the amulet of water breathing made this unnecessary, and then slid down the hill into the water. She plunged down, then flipped and began to swim even deeper. The tunnel continued for what Erolyn estimated to be at least twenty feet. On the rocky wall near the tunnel's floor was a hole, not quite two feet across, and as smoothly rounded as a ship's portal. Erolyn peered through the opening into what appeared to be a large well. Several similar openings dotted the rock walls. All had been carved to similar size and shape. Erolyn took a small knife from her belt and wedged it into a crack near the opening. It would be exceedingly easy to wander from one portal to another before finding the way out. And even with an amulet of water breathing, her time in that larger well was best limited. On the well floor, some five feet below her, several enormous crustaceans milled about in a frantic search for food. Erolyn had never seen such creatures, had no idea what they might be called. More than seven feet in length, not including their fan-like tails and long antennae, they scuttled along on several pairs of small, curved legs. Large, toothless mouths spanned the entire width of their heads, and their paired antennae groped about constantly, one sweeping the floor, the other flailing about in the water. The creatures were armored with a plate-like, translucent shell. It took Erolyn a moment to realize what the things reminded her of, to all intents and purposes, they were gigantic shrimp. One of the creatures swirled up into the water, legs churning. As it passed, close enough to touch, the harper realized what had become of Asante's former servants. The giant crustacean's innards were clearly visible, from the single large vein pulsing along its curved back to the partially digested halfling in its stomach. Erolyn glanced down at the floor of the well. It was littered with large rocks, a few bits of rope, and nothing else. Obviously, anyone Asante wished to be rid of was weighed down and tossed into the well. The bottom-feeding shrimp devoured anything and everything that came their way. But Erolyn felt safe enough where she was. The crustaceans were too wide to squeeze through the openings in the wall, she watched the creatures for a while, learning their patterns of movement and judging their speed. After a time, she drew her moonblade and waited. When one of the creatures again ventured within reach, 
She lashed out and severed three of its legs. The limbs drifted down. The other crustaceans were upon them instantly, their antennae flailing each other like whips as they fought over the morsels. The wounded creature, unable to swim, spiraled down toward certain death. Assured that the giant crustaceans would be occupied for some time, the harper shot out of the tunnel and swam for the light. There was precious little of it, which indicated that she would probably emerge in some darkened and hopefully deserted chamber. Even so, Erolyn eased her head out of the water slowly, silently, taking careful stock of her surroundings. The well was in a round, dark room with a low ceiling and a dozen arched portals leading off into long corridors. There was a deep, earthy smell and an intense moisture in the air, unusual for temperate Zazespur, which suggested that this was a dungeon perhaps two floors below ground level. Yet the entire room, from ceiling to floor, was of the same exquisite pink marble that graced the outer palace. Nor was it without luxury. A tangle of pipes led from the spring to a low, curved bath, and a nearby table held the expected sybaritic accoutrements. A heap of towels, several candles in silver holders, a jeweled decanter, and a pair of goblets. Erolyn's keen eyes noted the faint sheen of dust on the table, and she suspected that the luxurious setup was mostly intended to distract the eye from the well and its true purpose. When she was certain she was alone, Erolyn climbed carefully onto the marble rim of the mineral spring. She unstrapped a tarpaulin bag from her back and took out a large linen square. With this, she quickly dried herself off. She wanted to leave nothing, not even a damp footprint, that would enable Asante's minions to trace her back to the bathhouse. The thin silk garments she'd chosen to wear for her first day at the foaming sands were ideal for this. Not only did they dry quickly, but they were of a sandy pink hue, one especially woven and dyed to blend with the marble of Asante's palace. The dungeon's silence was broken by distant footsteps that echoed through the marble corridors like large hailstones on a slate roof. Behind the labored tread was the scrape and clatter of some large, heavy object being dragged along. Soon the sound of a disgruntled male voice joined in the general racket. Erolyn got the gist of the situation from the muttered complaints and the occasional resonant clang that occurred whenever the servant stopped and kicked what she surmised to be a water-filled cleaning bucket. The harper crouched behind the fountain and waited. This was precisely the type of opportunity for which she had hoped. Her optimism wavered for a moment when the servant entered the room, a mop over one shoulder and the bucket dragging behind him. He was a male dwarf, with a form that resembled nothing so much as a squat, two-legged mushroom, and a face that brought to mind an image of storm clouds over a craggy mountain. The dwarf was young, by the measure of his people, seventy or eighty, judging from the length of his dun-colored beard, and not more than four feet tall. Yet the harper, for all her skill with the sword, was hesitant to tangle with the obviously ill-tempered little man. On the other hand, what choice did she have? Erolyn watched as the dwarf dipped and wrung the mop, then turned away and fell to scrubbing the marble floor, muttering imprecations all the while. She rose and silently came up behind him, her sword in hand. A well-placed kick overturned the bucket and sent a tide of soapy water racing toward the dwarf. He spun to face the sound, saw the battle-ready elf, and instinctively kicked into a running charge. The dwarf's booted feet shot out from under him before he'd taken three steps. After a brief, airborne moment, he landed flat on his back. His shaggy head hit the marble with a thud so resonant that Erolyn could feel it in her bones and teeth. While the dwarf was still trying to uncross his eyes, she strode forward and plunged the tip of her sword through his beard until it pressed hard against his throat. Take me to the treasure room, she demanded. Rooms! The dwarf corrected her in a deep rumble. Erolyn noted that the gravel-filled voice had more in common with rain falling on a kettle drum than with human speech. More in one room there be. Lots of them. 
but they're guarded by armed men the size of me mother-in-law's temper and locked up tighter in a gnome's navel. Don't have a key. Ain't none of the servants got keys. I don't need keys, Erolin asserted, and I've never met a man whose sword could match mine. Since the sword in question was still pressed against his throat, the dwarf had opportunity to consider this claim and the fighter who made it. His gaze slid thoughtfully up the shining length of the blade and stopped at the harper's resolute face. You got a lot of brass for an elf woman, he admitted at last. Might it be that you also got a way out of here? Same way I got in. A light kindled in the dwarf's eyes. I'm a good hand at fighting. If you'd care to pass over one of them knives you carry, take me with you when you go, and I'll do for you what I can. By Morodin's beard, he swore fervently. For the chance to get out of this place, I'd be tempted to help you loot me own ancestors' burial chambers. Erelyn hesitated only a moment. It was not in her to leave any intelligent creature in slavery. She slid her moon blade out of the thicket of light brown beard and backed off a few steps. The dwarf scrambled to his feet. She tossed him a dagger, which he nimbly caught. He took off down one of the corridors, beckoning her to follow. Erelyn noted with relief that he could walk silently when he chose to do so. True to his word, the dwarf led her to a massive locked door, before which stood three enormous men, all of whom were armed with wickedly curved scimitars. Also true to his word, fighting was something the dwarf could do well. In record time, the unlikely pair of conspirators stood over the downed guards. The dwarf ran the back of one hand across his damp forehead and then regarded it, his bearded face twisted with disgust. Sad state of affairs, he muttered. Must be getting soft. Shouldn't have broke a sweat on those three. Erelyn suppressed a smile. She and the dwarf dragged the guards to the well and tossed them in, then returned to the treasure rooms. With the dwarf looking on, the half-elf went to work. From her waterproof bag she took a small wooden box, unwittingly provided by her new employer, Madame Penelope, and tossed a bit of the yellow powder at the door. There was no telltale blue light, no magic at work. Motioning the dwarf to stand back, she bent to examine the lock. It was trapped, of course, not once but thrice over, and it took her the better part of two hours' work to disable the lethal devices. At last, the door swung open on noiseless hinges. Erelyn edged into the first room, the dwarf following on her heels like a squat shadow. The treasure rooms were utterly silent and darker than a moonless night, but both the dwarf and the half-elf possessed eyes that were keenly sensitive to heat, and neither felt the need of torch or candle. As they passed from one room to another, the dwarf's eyes widened into avaricious circles his mouth fixed in a permanent ooh of wonder. His awe was not misplaced, for this was beyond doubt the most unusual collection Erelyn had ever seen. Many of the items were priceless. Most were extremely valuable. Some were merely odd. There were rare musical instruments, including a six-foot harp with a soundboard that had been carved into the shape of a woman whose gilded fingers were poised over the strings. Magical, Erelyn surmised, awaiting a command to set it playing. Paintings, sculpture, and carvings from many lands filled several chambers. The art of taxidermy was also represented. Rare beasts, some of which had not been seen alive for several generations, filled an entire room. There were piles of coins from every land Erelyn had ever heard named, and enough rare books to satisfy a dozen voracious scholars. There was an entire shelf of brilliantly colored vases, fashioned by fire salamanders from melted semi-precious gems. There were jewel-encrusted swords, crowns of long-dead monarchs, court gowns embroidered with silk thread and seed pearls, and a golden scepter inscribed with the runes of some far eastern lands. Among these treasures of gems and gold, Erelyn finally found the item she sought, a delicate, filigreed tiara set with a multitude of pale purple amethysts. 
The harper carefully wrapped the crown in a soft cloth and tucked it into her bag. Time to go, she said, turning to her dwarven shadow. That's it? That's all we're taking out of here? The dwarf demanded. When Erolin nodded, he immediately began to snatch up small items and stuff them into his pockets. Back wages, he said in a defensive tone. Been working here for more than ten years. I'm owed. Erolin didn't begrudge the dwarf his due, but gold was heavy, and she worried about the weight he was adding to his already considerable bulk. We're swimming out, she cautioned him. The dwarf abruptly ceased his looting and stared at her, his face growing pale above his beard. Not the wellspring. When the harper nodded, he groaned and then shrugged. Ah, well, always knowed I'd be a-going out that way sooner or later. Suppose it's better to go it alive. But tell me this, what's waiting for us in there? Erolin told him. The dwarf pursed his lips and considered... Then he emptied some of the booty from his pockets and selected a curved, jewel-encrusted dagger as his principal treasure. They retraced their steps to the exit. The door to the first chamber was in sight when one of the treasures, a long case pushed up against the far wall, caught Erolin's eye. The case was covered by a low, rounded dome of dusty glass, and through the film she glimpsed something that looked suspiciously like a woman's form. Curious, the harper walked over and used the sleeve of her shirt to wipe clean a small circular window. She bent and peered in. Within the case was the body of a beautiful elven female. Not alive, but not exactly what Erolin understood as dead, either. The elf looked empty. There was no other word for it. The essence of the elf woman was gone leaving her body behind in some form of deep stasis. How long she had stayed so, Erolin could not say, but the elf's ornaments were of ancient design, and the chainmail that draped her slender form was finer and older than any Erolin had ever seen. The elf was also disturbingly familiar. A single thick braid the color of spun sapphires lay over one shoulder. It was the rarest hair color among moon elves, a color Erolin associated with her long-dead mother. The elf's face was also somehow familiar, although in truth she resembled no one whom Erolin could name or remember. The harper's troubled gaze roved downward and stopped abruptly. Resting on the elf's thighs was a small shield emblazoned with a strange elven sigil, a curving design made of mirror images reaching out to each other, but not quite touching. Erolin's heart missed a beat. She knew that mark. An icy fist seemed to clutch her gut as she slowly pulled her sword from its sheath. Nine runes were cut into the ancient blade. One of them matched exactly the mark on the elf woman's shield. Well, I'll be a one-headed Etten, the dwarf murmured, his eyes round as he peered into the case. A sounder sleep than any I've ever had. And that's a fact. I heard tell of such a thing. Didn't believe the stories for a minute, though. Erolin didn't know which story he referred to, but it hardly mattered. She herself had heard many such bedtime tales, of sleeping princesses or heroes who lay hidden in death-like slumber until a time of crisis brought them forth, and never had she given any of them a speck of credence. There was something about this slumbering elf, however, that made all the old legends seem possible. For once Erolin rued her lack of knowledge of elven ways and her near ignorance of the sword she carried. You go ahead to the well, she urged the dwarf. There are several openings leading out. The dry tunnel is due east and marked with a knife. I'll be along in a bit. The dwarf grinned, and a spark of battle lust set his red eyes aflame. Put the pot on the boil and start chopping up horseradish for the relish. There will be plenty of shrimp for dinner tonight, he proclaimed gleefully as he took off for the exit at a brisk clip. Erolin heard his gusty intake of breath, then a mighty splash as he dove into the water. Left alone, 
the harper turned back to the macabre coffin. Acting on impulse, she touched the moon blade to the glass. A flare of magical power welled up within the sword, like lightning that could not find release. Because Erolin and the sword were linked in ways she did not understand, she felt the moment of recognition as the almost sentient sword acknowledged its former master. There was no doubt in the half-elf's mind. She was looking upon one of her ancestors, one of the elves who had once wielded the sword in her hand. But how could this be? And how had this elven warrior come to such a fate? Erolin knew little of her sword's history, beyond the names of the elves who'd wielded it and the powers with which they'd imbued it. Her mother had died before telling Erolin of her heritage, and her mentor, the traitorous gold elf Kaimul Nymesson, had been more interested in exploiting his young charge than educating her. As the half-elf pondered the sleeping elf woman, the vague dread she had always felt for her moon blade, but could never explain, enveloped her like a suffocating miasma. She got a firm grip on her emotions and quickly reviewed what little she did know of the Moonblade. Nine people, including herself, had wielded the Moonblade since its forging in ancient myth Draenor, and each had added a magical power to the sword. Although Erolin knew what these powers were, she could not match each one to a rune, or each rune to the elf with whom it had originated. She did not know the name of the elf woman who slept here, but perhaps the answer to this could be found in the glass that entombed her. Most humans did not realize that glass was not a solid object, but rather an extremely viscous liquid. Its flow was too slow to be measured, much less noticed in a human's lifetime. After many years, a pane of glass thickened near the base, as the slowly flowing substance settled at the lowest point. Elves knew that in time, all windows would open, from the top. The problem was how to measure this flow without actually breaking the glass. This Erolin did not wish to do, for fear of disturbing the elf woman's unnatural slumber. But as she examined the coffin, she realized that this was not a concern. The glass lid was not sealed, but rather hinged on one side, and a long, meandering crack had already begun working its way downward from the top of the low-rising dome. Erolin pulled a knife from her sash and wrapped the hilt sharply along the crack, then again not far away. A second fissure rippled through the glass, and a curved shard fell onto the sleeping elf. Erolin carefully lifted the lid and picked up the shard. She measured it with a bit of twine, then broke off a piece from each end. These she wrapped securely and tucked into her bag. Tinkerstam could probably estimate the age of the glass with a quick glance. That done, she turned one last searching gaze upon her ancestor. The elf was much smaller than Erolin, with finer features and more delicate bones. Her long-fingered hands lay at her sides, palms facing up. The harper noted that the elf had the deeply calloused fingers and palm of a swordmaster, but only on the left hand. This told her the elf had likely been an early wielder before the moonblade had acquired the speed and power-enhanced strike that demanded a two-handed grip. Outrage, cold and deep, filled the harper as she slowly lowered the glass lid. It was not right for the noble elf woman to be part of some rich man's collection displayed as if she were just one more curious and beautiful object. It would not always be so, Erolin vowed as she slipped from the treasure rooms. She would return, and she would take the Moonblade's unknown wielder away to a more fitting rest. But this was not something she could do now, or alone. Setting her jaw in a grim line, the Harper made her way back to the well and dove in. The dwarf, it seemed, had been busy. The split and emptied shells of two giant crustaceans swirled through the churning water, and the contents had been hacked into bits the size of finger food. The surviving creatures were in a feeding frenzy and, by the look of things, would continue to eat well for days to come. A glow of lingering heat drew Erolin's eye toward the bottom of the pool. 
There, its translucent carapace bulging and heaving with some internal conflict, was the largest shelled monster Erelin had yet seen. One large enough and stupid enough to swallow a live dwarf. The creature would have already died for its mistake had the dwarf not dropped his new dagger in the struggle. The harper caught a glimpse of the jeweled weapon, which skittered about like a frantic squirrel as the crustacean's many feet kicked it this way and that. Erolyn pulled her knife from her sash and dove deeper. The monster did not notice her approach, for it was well and truly distracted by what was certainly the worst case of indigestion it had ever suffered. The giant crustacean whirled and twisted, occasionally toppling over and then scrambling upright again. Although the dwarf couldn't last much longer without air, he was still putting up nine hells of a fight. Erolyn drove the knife deep between two plates of the monster's shell. Straddling the creature and gripping its shell with her knees, she began hacking her way through to the dwarf. As soon as she'd cut through the surprisingly tough and elastic stomach lining, he exploded upward. Stubby legs and arms churning, the dwarf instinctively headed for air. Erolyn followed, quickly passing the much slower swimmer and darting into the marked portal. She turned, seized a handful of beard, and dragged the dwarf into the opening. They shot up through the water-filled tunnel and bobbed to the surface. The dwarf grabbed a handhold on the blessedly dry rocks that littered the tunnel floor and dragged in several long, ragged breaths. Erolyn crawled past him and rolled onto the rocky ground. For several moments she was content merely to lie there and wait for her pounding heart to resume its usual pace. At length she noticed that the dwarf, who was still half-submerged in the water, was regarding her with a baleful stare. "'You pulled me beard,' he pointed out. "'You shouldn't ought to do that.' "'You're welcome,' Erolyn returned pleasantly. "'That too,' he muttered. "'Name's Jill, by the way.' It was more thanks than the half-elf had expected, even without the introduction. Dwarves often declined to give any name even one as abbreviated and obviously spurious as this. Erolyn rose to her feet and extended a hand to help drag her new friend out of the water. Jill? She repeated in an incredulous tone. That's right. Got a problem with it? Well, no. I was expecting something a bit... longer, I suppose. More earthy, and possibly masculine. Twas me mother's name the dwarf proclaimed in a reverent tone that left very little room for discussion. There was one more thing on Erolyn's mind, however. Now that you've seen the treasure, I suppose you'll be back for it? It was a logical question, considering that dwarven people generally rivaled dragons in their love for hoarding treasure. Erolyn wanted to return to the treasure hold some day, and while the loss of a single tiara and one dwarven servant might go unremarked, the ravages caused by a band of dwarven looters would almost certainly ensure that her hard-won entrance to Asante's palace would be ascertained and secured against future incursion. But Jill merely huffed. Been in that pink prison for ten years. Don't plan on going back, not ever. If and there's anything you want in there, elf, you're welcome to it. Just don't get yourself caught. There ain't nothing in there worth that. As he spoke, his eyes roved toward the east, and to the Star Spire Mountains that were his home. Erolyn was inclined to believe him. As they scrambled up the steep hill, she told him briefly what awaited them at the other side of the tunnel. The rapt expression on Jill's face as he contemplated these wonders far outshone his treasure-inspired greed. I thought you were eager to be back under the Star Spires, Erolyn said. Even as she spoke, however, she slipped Jill a handful of silver coins. It would not do to have him pay Mistress Penelope's girls with coins taken from Asante's treasure trove. The dwarf shrugged and pocketed his loot. Been gone from those tunnels ten years, and I'm a-coming back with pockets full of treasure. Ain't no one gonna begrudge me a couple hours more, or ask me how I spent your silvers. Lord Hune held the tiara in his plump hands, 
eyeing it with satisfaction as he turned it this way and that. The relic of a long-gone age, he breathed reverently. This was the bridal crown of young Princess Lehrona, who became queen to her cousin, King Alejandro III. A reminder that those who wear a crown must face the sword, he said piously, quoting a common Tetherian proverb. A reminder that he himself was unlikely to heed, Erelin noted in cynical silence. Lord Hune was a powerful man in Zazespur. Not only was he a wealthy merchant and head of the shipping guild, but he was also a member of the Lord's Council, which carried out the edicts of Pasha Balak. It was therefore likely that he'd been part of the recent attempt to organize a guild takeover of the city. Erelin might not have persisted in her furtive assault upon Asante's stronghold but for the prospect of meeting Lord Hewn face to face when the task was complete, so that she might take his measure. With each moment she spent in Hewn's presence, Erelin's distrust of the man deepened. Rumor had it that this man had killed a red dragon. Erelin was ready to accept that, provided that the dragon in question had still been in the egg at the time. Hewn was a large man, but he looked as if he spent more time downing pastries than wielding a sword. Even so, a less observant person might think him distinguished, even lordly. His dark, costly garments were carefully tailored to disguise his bulk, and his hair and thick black mustache were neatly groomed and just beginning to take on a bit of gray. His small black eyes were filmed over with a veneer of civility. Erelin, however, had known many coldly avaricious men and was not fooled by this one. Hune was not a man likely to be content with his current level of power. Nor, she suspected, was the tiara merely a treasure to be admired. Erelin knew enough to Therian history to suspect what Hune had in mind. With the fall of the royal family of Tethir, many of the royalists had fled to Zazespur. For several years there had been a quiet underground movement to restore the monarchy, perhaps with a new royal family. Balak seemed well on the way to becoming just that, but Erelin doubted the self-proclaimed Pasha would enjoy the royalists' support for long. Pasha Balik's southern sympathies were becoming more and more apparent, and his inner circle was increasingly made up of men from Kalimshan and even Halrua. It would not be long, Erelin suspected, before Pasha Balik was deposed, and yet another powerful man or woman sought the crown. That was no doubt where the tiara came in. Possession of an item of such significance to the old royal family could help Hune endear himself to nearly any faction or family that happened to rise to power. He might even use it as a prop in making his own bid for royalty. And why not? Erelin's mare possessed a more noble pedigree than the man seated before her, yet Hune was accounted a lord for no better reason than the country estate he'd purchased a few years back. Nor was Hune an exception. In Tethir, land was valued above all other forms of wealth, and possession of enough of it granted instant nobility. In the years following the destruction of the royal family, as well as the decimation of many of the ancient noble houses that possessed royal blood ties, manorial lands, counties, and even duchies changed hands like trinkets at a country fair. Men and women who had enough money to purchase land, or sufficient might to seize it, earned themselves instant titles. Tethir was peppered with ersatz barons and countesses. This offended Erelin's elven sensibilities, her deep respect for tradition, and her unspoken longing for family. But what disturbed her most about this trend was that even petty nobles were beginning to show signs of ambitions that reached far above their newly purchased stations. The threat of a guild takeover had been thoroughly, even ruthlessly, suppressed. But already, Zazaspur buzzed with whispers of this baron or that lord gathering strength and supporters. Ambition counted for a lot in Tethir, and Hune had it in abundance. Erelin saw dreams of glory in his eyes as he regarded the amethyst tiara. She noted that it would be wise to watch this man and, if necessary, curb his ambitions. 
At last, Hewn placed the crown on his desk and turned his full attention upon the half-elf. You have done well. I will pay you half again your original fee if you tell me how you got into Asante's palace. Erelin had expected this. To refuse might earn her the same sort of fate that had befallen Asante's servants, so she had prepared a credible half-truth. She manufactured a smile that was both cold and seductive, a useful expression she'd copied from Ferret, and turned the full force of it upon Hune. Asante has new women brought in from time to time. It was a small matter to include myself among them. Hune's black eyes gave her an appreciative sweep. Yes, I can see how that would be so, he said gallantly. But tell me of the treasure room. This Erelin had not been expecting, but she marked the greed in Hune's eyes and decided to exploit it. With a little encouragement, perhaps he might offer to fund her next expedition. What other items did you take? Hune continued before she could speak. I would be most grateful for the opportunity to view them. Erelin spread her hands in a gesture of regret. There is nothing more. The clothes of the harem provide few hiding places for plunder. But I destroyed some of the things I could not take, she said, suspecting that Hewn would appreciate any blow dealt a rival. The guildmaster chortled with delight. Splendid, splendid, but not too many, I trust. I could not begin to describe the wonders that remain, she said truthfully. Then perhaps another expedition? Not soon, Erelin said softly. When next I enter Asante's palace, it will be to tend to a personal matter. Hewn held her gaze for a long moment, then nodded. Such things require much planning, he said casually, no doubt assuming, as Erelin had intended him to assume, that she planned to challenge and oust the master assassin. You will have expenses. Please send all bills to me, discreetly, of course. In exchange, I ask only that you give me first refusal on any treasures you might acquire. All but one, Erelin agreed silently. All but one. Chapter 5 The day was nearly spent. Foxfire knew this, even though in the deep forest no sun-cast shadows proclaimed the hour. Here the shade was cool and deep, the only sky a thousand layers of leafy boughs and velvety pines that filtered the sunlight until the very air he breathed seemed green and alive. The elf was many miles from tall trees, his tribe's hidden settlement, but he and his two companions walked easily through the thick foliage, as silent and invisible as a trio of deer. This forest, all of it, was the elves' home. Its rhythms coursed through their blood and sang in their souls. Foxfire led the way steadily westward, to a grove perhaps a half-day's walk toward the east from the trading settlement known as Moss Stone. In times past, in happier, safer times, the elves of the Elmaness tribe had traded with the humans who lived in this forest-side town. Then came the brutal reign of the Tethyrs, the family of human royals who seemed determined to drive the elves from the land. The Elmaness had withdrawn into the forest shadows and proclaimed their own government via the Elven Council. For many years, all who ventured into the forests had lived and died by the judgments handed down by this council. But in these troubled times, even the wise, collective voice of the council had faltered and fallen silent. The elven alliance had splintered, and each clan had gone its own way. In particular, the Suldusk tribe, always chary of alliance with their Elmaness brothers and sisters, had all but disappeared into the deep shadows of the southeastern forest. No one knew for certain how many elves remained in the ancient wood. Even so, a settlement of elves remained in the council glade, and the elders who lived there were still the best source of news and information in the forest. Foxfire hoped to find answers that would make sense of what was happening to his people. Elves had lived in the forest of Tether from time beyond memory, and elven memories were long indeed. 
But for the first time in his nine decades of life, Foxfire feared that the days of his people in this land might be numbered. Too many changes had come upon the elves, too quickly for them to assimilate or adjust. It was Foxfire's nature to find the good in every situation and to expect that success would be his in all things. It was his gift to inspire those around him with the same confidence. Yet even he could not disregard the fears that a new shadow had fallen upon Tether. Recent events suggested that the time of tyranny might soon return. Nor were the elves helping themselves. Foxfire could not dismiss from his mind the insinuations placed there by the human Bunlap. Was it possible that some clans really were attacking farms and caravans? And if this were so, what further trouble might this bring to the tribes of Tether? Not far now, commented Korgash, a dark-haired hunter-warrior who was Foxfire's closest friend. The taciturn elf seldom spoke, and the fact that he did so now was a sure measure of the gravity of their quest. Though Korrigash was nearly as dour as a dwarf, there was no one under the stars whom Foxfire loved better or trusted more. The two were friendly rivals and had been since long ago, when, as toddlers, they'd pelted each other with whatever weapons they could muster, whether pebbles found on the forest floor or the moss that lined their nappies. These days their rivalry took the form of contests of arms or archery, or the good-natured competition for an elf maid's smile. But when they were on patrol or doing battle, Korrigash fell naturally into place at Foxfire's back, instinctively deferring to the flame-haired warrior. Likewise, Foxfire had learned to hear the unspoken thoughts that lay beneath his friend's few words. Council Glade is beyond those cedars. Foxfire pointed with his bow to a thick stand of conifers. The elders will know whether there is any truth to the human's tales. Korrigash merely sniffed, but his brother, a stripling youth known as Tamson, had no shortage of opinions on the matter. How can there be truth when there is no honor? he blurted out. Humans have no knowledge of either. And if, perchance, the people have been pushing back the invaders, what of it? If I had my way, every human who stepped beneath the trees of Tether would be greeted with a bolt through the heart, and may the silver shadows gnaw upon their bones. Spoken with typical restraint, Foxfire told him lightly, but instinctively he lifted one hand and formed the traditional elven sign for peace. One never knew when the silver shadows might be watching. Only a very rash elf would speak lightly of these mysterious beings, or risk incurring their rare but deadly ire. The Elmaness and the Suldusk were not the only elves in the forest. There were, among these trees, people even more fey and secretive. The Lithari, shape-shifting creatures who were more wolf than elf, had been living in Tether when Foxfire's ancestors still walked beneath the trees of Cormanthor. Although it had been centuries since anyone in the Tall Trees tribe had seen a Lithari in elven form, from time to time they caught a glimpse of silvery fur, or heard the Lithari's hunting songs soaring upward in search of the unseen moon. You are among friends, Tamson, but I would take care before casting those seeds to the wind, continued Foxfire. Think what might occur if such words took root, and the people came to regard all humans as enemies. The young elf shrugged and turned aside, but not before Foxfire noted the smoldering flame in his eyes. Suddenly he understood the true nature of his friend's brother. What Foxfire had taken to be yet one more outburst from the impulsive youth was something much more deadly. Hatred, blind and unreasoning and implacable. For a moment, the elven leader was stunned by the sheer force of Tamson's emotion. Foxfire did not like to think what might result should the hearts of too many of the people's young follow that narrow path. Less talk, more walking, Korgash suggested grimly. Nights not long to come. The words were not meant as a distraction, but as a simple statement of fact. Although the three elves could see as well in darkness as in daylight, 
there was a certain practical need to reach Council Glade before nightfall. The forest was full of dangerous creatures, ogres, giant spiders, wolves, sturges, wyverns, and even a dragon or two. Many of these grew hungry with the coming of darkness, and there was every possibility that the elves, themselves hunters, might become prey. By the stars and the spirits, Tamsin swore in a choked voice. The young elf kicked into a run, dashing through the ferns and vines without regard for silence and without thought for the trail his passing left. Foxfire's reprimand died unspoken. A dagger gleamed in Tamsin's hand. The youth often sensed dangers that older and wiser elves missed, and though he was impulsive, he did not enter battle lightly. Foxfire and Korrigash exchanged a quick, dismayed glance and drew their own weapons. The elves ran lightly through the crushed foliage, pausing at the torn curtain of vines that had veiled Council Glade from their sight. Before them stood Tamsin, his copper-hued face strangely ashen, and beyond him lay a scene of utter devastation. What had once been a lush forest glade now resembled the remnants of a careless merchant's campfire. A large circle of ground was black and barren, littered with piles of charred sticks. The swinging bridges, walkways that had linked the trees and the homes and chambers hidden among them, now hung against the blackened trees. The elven homes were gone, as were the inhabitants. Foxfire's throat tightened as he noted blackened bones lying among the remains of trees. The home of the Elven Council had been utterly destroyed, and with it the best hope of unity among the beleaguered people. A light touch on his shoulder tore Foxfire from his grim thoughts. He turned to face the hunter, who handed him a blackened arrow shaft. Took it from between two naked ribs. Look at the mark. Korrigash advised him. The elf glanced at the shaft. The mark on it was familiar. Three curved lines, combining to make a stylized foxfire, the bright flower from which he had taken his name. The arrow was unmistakably his. Yet how had he lost it? He hadn't missed a chosen target since boyhood. He lifted incredulous eyes to his friend's face. But how? The humans. Korakash pointed to the shaft. Note the length. Foxfire nodded, understanding at once. The arrow shaft was shorter than it should have been by a width of perhaps two fingers. It had been broken off, the jagged edge trimmed smooth, and the arrowhead reaffixed. Since the forest elves retrieved and reused all arrows used in hunting, this one could only have been torn from the body of an enemy. It was possible that this arrow had been plucked from a wounded ogre or bugbear, but such creatures lacked the wit to plant it here for others to find. This was the work of the elves' human foe. Tribe against tribe, the hunter commented grimly. Again, Foxfire nodded in agreement. The marks of the best elven hunters and warriors were well known in the forest, and not every elf who stumbled upon the raised elven settlement would see the ploy for what it was. While it was possible that someone was attempting to turn the elven tribes against each other, the purpose behind this grim act was utterly beyond Foxfire's ken. There was one human, however, who might well have the answers. Foxfire remembered his conversation with Bunlap, and suddenly he knew where he might find the human. He walked up to Tamsin and put a hand on the young elf's shoulder. A surge of guilt filled Foxfire as he noted the haunted look on the fighter's face. Tamsin was fey, even for a green elf. It was likely the youth was seeing the carnage as clearly as if it was happening before him. Such gifts were as much torment as blessing, but Tamsin's was needed. The elf was twin-born and he had a bond with his equally fey sister that enabled them to speak mind to mind. You must send word to tall trees at once, Foxfire told him. The tribe must send a war band with all possible speed to the border trees south of Moss Stone. Thirty elves, 
armed with unmarked green arrows. This last command was unprecedented, for the elf arrows known as Black Lightning were crafted through a long and mystic process. Green arrows were raw and unfinished by elven standards, deadly enough when launched from elven bows, but lacking the rites that imbued the weapons with forest magic and linked the elven hunter-warriors to their home in ways that no human, and few elves, could fully understand. Yet Foxfire knew his request would be honored, and he understood that this was a measure of the high regard his tribe had for his leadership and judgment. He only hoped that with this decision he would not betray his people's trust. If there were no elven raids before, there will be soon, he added softly. We will attack the farm where the elves are held as slaves. At these words, the haunted look faded from Tamsin's eyes, burned away like morning mist by the rising sun of his hatred. In that case, I will send your words to Tamara with pleasure, he said grimly and I will tell her to urge the warriors to hurry. So how's the farming going? Erolyn inquired casually. Her words seemed to irritate her young host, as they were intended to do. Prince Hasheth cast her a baleful look, then quickly composed his hawk-like features into a lofty, lordly expression so studied that Erolyn was certain he'd practiced it before a mirror. It seemed that Hasheth, a younger son of the ruling Pasha, was having a great deal of difficulty finding a life path suited to his ambitions and his exalted sense of self. Erolyn had met the young man several months before, during his attempt to gain fame and wealth as an assassin. He had been charged with killing another assassin, namely Erolyn. She and Danlo had managed just barely to convince the proud youth that this assignment was actually a death sentence handed down by guildmasters who wanted Balak's son out of the Assassin's Guild. Since then, Hasheth had become an ally, helping to insinuate Erolyn into the Assassin's Guild and sponsoring Danilo in the social life of the palace. And in doing so, he had finally found an activity that suited him. The role of Harper informant appealed to the young man, for intrigue was a skill highly valued in Tethir. Yet his Harper activities did not bring him the overt wealth and status he craved. Since he'd left the Assassin's Guild, he had tasted of a dozen occupations. The latest, apparently, was no more to his liking than any of his previous choices. I have scraped the dung and the mud from my boots and left the manor house in the hands of a steward, Hesheth announced with disdain. The life of a country lord is deadly dull. What need have I of lands or title, I who am the son of a pasha? Actually, Erolyn observed silently, lands and title would be a big improvement over Hasheth's current lot. As a younger, harem-born son, his status was roughly that of a skilled tradesman, and his prospects were considerably less promising. At last count, Balak had seven sons from his legal wives, his harem had produced an additional thirteen or fourteen. Hasheth had at least a dozen older brothers. Even if he had perfected the assassin's art, it would have taken him many years to work his way up to the head of the line. The half-elf nodded sympathetically. Land is important, but Zazaspur's wealth comes largely from trade. Have you considered becoming a merchant? The prince sniffed. A green grocer? A camel salesman? I think not. How about apprentice to the head of the shipping guild? A man who also sits on the Lord's Council? The harper countered. Trade and politics work together like a paired dagger and sword. In no place is this more true than in Zazaspur. You could learn much and gather the tools needed to carve out a place for yourself. Those who control trade will always have a powerful hold upon the rulers. And Inselm Hune is an ambitious man. You might do well to hitch your cart to his star. Hasheth nodded, his black eyes regarding her thoughtfully. And the Harpers, they endorse this Lord Hune? His tone was casual, but Erolyn could almost hear the gears of Gond churning in his mind. Clearly, he understood that she had some purpose other than his career advancement in mind. 
The harper suppressed a rueful smile. Hasheth was good and getting better. No, of course not, she said bluntly. As I've said before, Hewn is ambitious. It would be wise for the harpers to keep an eye on such a man. But there is no reason why you cannot do this for us and advance yourself at the same time. This notion seemed to please the young man. Picking up a jewel-encrusted bottle, he leaned forward and added a bit more wine to Erolyn's goblet. She obligingly drank deeply, noting as she did so the glint that entered Hesheth's eyes. It was a common ploy, one he had used time and again in the hope that a quantity of potent Kalashite wine would lower the half-elf's formidable reserve and deliver her to his bed. Erolyn knew without vanity that she was considered beautiful, and she was well accustomed to masculine attention. Hasheth's both amused and exasperated her, for the young man always expressed his admiration in a manner that suggested he was conferring upon her a great honor. Erolyn was an expert at saying no. Her repertoire ranged from gracefully feigned regret to a disemboweling backstroke but it was becoming increasingly difficult for her to turn down Hasheth's advances while keeping a straight face. Fortunately for Erolyn, the young man seemed to be more interested in his future prospects than his immediate libidinous impulses. "'I will ask my father to place me in Lord Hune's service,' he agreed. "'You do that, but first you should know that Hune was probably involved in the plot against your father,' she cautioned him. It is even possible that he had something to do with the guild's attempt to have you killed. Even now you'd do well to watch your back. Hasheth shrugged as if these past offenses were unworthy of consideration. If Lord Hune is truly an ambitious man, he will take whatever path he must, he observed. His unspoken words, and so will I, rang sharply in Erolyn's ears. The young man's attitude did nothing to reassure Erolyn. At best, Hasheth was overly pragmatic. He would do whatever needed to be done to advance his ambitions. As long as his interests lay along the same path as those of the Harpers, all would be well. Erolyn was not certain it would always be so. Yet Honor demanded that she give the young man one more warning. I hope I am wrong, Hasheth. But from what I have seen and heard, it seems likely that the end of your father's rule draws near. It cannot be otherwise when he slights so many ambitious Tetherians in favor of southern courtiers. The prince received this dire prediction with yet another shrug. What is that to me? I stand too far from the throne to mourn its loss, and have long known that I must seek my fortune elsewhere. But I thank you for your words. Now, on to other, more pleasant matters. More wine. Erolyn declined with a delicate wave of her hand and a small, hard-edged smile. Hewn and Hesheth were well matched, and she wished them the joy of each other's company. I would, Hesheth, she purred in a courtesan's creamy tones, but in company such as yours, I dare not drink too freely. I couldn't trust myself to behave. The shops of Zazasper closed at twilight, but in the back room of Garvanel's fine ointments, business continued apace. Behind the lavish shop that offered scented oils and spurious potions to the city's wealthy, behind the counting room where the clerks labored to tally the day's wealth, Garvanel kept a small private room where he received payment of another, more personal sort. Garvanel had been born to farmhands who labored in the distant reaches of the Purple Hills, but from a very early age it was apparent that he would not remain in such remote and humble surroundings. The gods had gifted him with a handsome face and a certain smarmy charm. He had done well with these modest attributes, trading them for the benefits that came along with the favor of older, wealthy women. Step by step he worked his way up in society until at last he married a well-to-do widow of Zazaspur. His wife was a good twenty years older than he, as well as stout and exceedingly homely. Yet all things in life had compensations. 
The woman possessed a thriving business and an ever-increasing passion for playing at cards. Since she won more often than she lost, Garvanel was pleased she'd found something other than him to occupy her time. He took over the perfume shop and did a thriving business. Although less than half of his earnings were paid in coin, he still managed to turn enough of a profit to maintain appearances. A soft tap at Garvanel's door, then a whispered password, announced that his latest payment had arrived. His aging wife had her indulgences. He had his. The perfume merchant opened the door and surveyed the young woman his favorite client had sent him. He'd often expressed a preference for novelty. This woman was more exotic than most. Her almond-shaped black eyes and bright silk turban suggested a Far Eastern heritage, but he doubted the client would have gone to such trouble. Granted, oil of minotaur musk was not an easy commodity to come by, not even the imitations fashioned by unscrupulous lantana alchemists. Then the woman stepped into the room, and the lamplight glistened upon pale skin, the rare color of shoe porcelain. The merchant's pulse quickened. This was the genuine article. For a moment, Garvanel almost wished the same could be said for the oil of Minotaur musk that had purchased her. As Garvanel bolted the door, the bells of Ilmeter's temple began to ring out the midnight hour. The merchant grimaced. The temple was but a block away, and at night the bells seemed deafening. He turned to the woman, intending to pantomime an apology. He froze, and his eyes widened with astonishment and fear. The woman had removed her turban and gloves. Slowly, deliberately, she raised a slender finger to her cheek and wiped a bit of the ivory-colored ointment from her skin, revealing the ruddy color beneath. Before Garvanel could move, she pulled a dagger from the folds of her gown and leaped at him. Small and slender though she was, the speed and fury of her attack sent the merchant tumbling backward. The woman straddled his chest, her knees pinning his arms to the floor. She buried one hand in his hair and jerked back his head, then slid the edge of her dagger against his throat. She leaned down to press her lips directly to his ear. You should be flattered, she said. I bought all my ointments and cosmetics at your shop. They rub off on the bed linens, I find, but so far no man has lived to complain of it. At last the paralyzing fear that gripped Garvanel gave way, and he began to scream for help. Ferret let him scream, for the bells of Ilmater's temple more than drowned out his cries. Mockingly she counted off the chimes of midnight into his ear. When the final peal came, she rolled aside, dragging the dagger down and across as she went. The assassin rose to her feet and stared down at the dead merchant. She felt no elation and no regret. Another tattling tongue had been silenced. It was a needed thing, as necessary as the hunt that provided food. This kill had been easy, but then so were most. In this soft and decadent city, Ferret was like a hawk among doves. Passions ran hot among her people, yet few who knew of Ferret's mission and methods approved. Regardless, she did what she could. Yet as time passed and matters grew increasingly troubled, she'd begun to realize the futility of her chosen path. Ferret's skills were considerable, but they were not equal to the layers of intrigue nor was her mind fashioned to comprehend the complexity of plot and counterplot that was Tethir. If she was ever to find and destroy the one she sought, she needed help. I need help, she murmured angrily, for the admission did not come easily to the proud and fierce female. The very idea was repugnant, but Ferret was committed to doing anything that might serve her people. Unfortunately, finding help would be even harder than accepting it. Ferret had learned much about Tethir and its people, but she had no idea where to turn, no knowledge of anyone in whom she might place a degree of trust. Frustrated beyond words, 
The female picked up her gloves and turban from the floor and donned both. Next, she smoothed the makeup on her cheek to hide her true skin color. When her disguise was once again firmly in place, she slipped from the shop and made her silent way to the nearest tavern. One of the things she had learned during her stay in Zazaspur was that useful information was more likely to be found in a fest house than in a council hall. Perhaps tonight she would find the inspiration she needed to complete her chosen task. Morning broke over the hills, casting long golden shadows over the lush and fertile landscape. With deep satisfaction, Lord Inselm Hewn gazed at the scene spread out before him. His country manor was set atop a high hill, and the view from the balcony outside his private study was vast and spectacular. Hewn's estate was an oddly shaped little kingdom, a collection of small, well-tended farms that stretched along both sides of the Suldaskun River for several miles, not coincidentally giving him a certain degree of control over trade on that section of the river. To the north, Hewn could see the narrow ribbon of hard-packed earth that was the tradeway, and farther still, the rooftops of Zazaspur. Though it was yet early summer, the fertile farmlands of these lands and the Purple Hills region to the south were lush and green. To the west lay the sea, and Hewn could just make out the glimmer of sunlight on the distant waves. He drew considerable wealth from the labors of the farming folk, and more still from the sea. His labors as a merchant and as guildmaster of Zazaspur's influential Shippers Guild had won Hewn power and wealth that far surpassed his early goals. But what had once been distant dreams were now merely milestones on Hewn's road to ever greater things. It is remarkable how ambition manages to keep a pace of one's success, the Tetherian mused aloud. On such a day, all things seem possible. A firm knock at his door pulled the Lord from his comfortable thoughts. A frown dented Hewn's brow for a moment as he considered the possible source of this interruption. Then he remembered, and a slow smile lifted the corners of his vast mustache. His new apprentice was to report to him today, bearing gifts, as was the custom. Hewn was very interested to learn what gifts a son of Pasha Balik might deem worthy of his new master. Come, he commanded, and in response the door was flung open with a force that sent it thudding against the far wall. Two armed men, clad in the purple tunics and leggings of the Balak house guard, strode into the room. They held between them a slender, golden-haired woman whose slightly pointed ears proclaimed her a half-elf. She was simply clad in a gown and kirtle, but the small, silvery lyre she clutched to her chest was both old and valuable. It was clear she had not come of her own will. Her lovely face was frozen, her eyes so dilated with terror as to appear almost black. Before Hewn could speak, young Prince Hasheth pushed past the trio and made his bow. There was a haughtiness about his manner that bordered on disdain. This insolence was not lost upon Hewn. With difficulty the Lord swallowed his first angry response. Hewn was low-born, and he bitterly resented anything that might be construed as a slight. But with him, profit ever came before pride. You see before you my gift, the young man began, gesturing toward the half-elven musician. He lifted a hand in a quick, peremptory gesture. I do not offer you the woman. Those you no doubt have in plenty. My gift to you is something far more valuable, information. Go on, the Lord said in an even voice. Despite the young man's lapse of judgment, it was never wise to anger or mistreat a bard of any sort. This struck Hewn as a promising beginning, for he dealt in many commodities, not the least of which was information. Just last night I heard this woman singing a song recently brought down from the Northlands. It seemed important to me that you hear it, Hashath proclaimed. Hewn nodded to the men, who released their hold on the woman's arms. She stumbled a bit. The Lord leaped forward, catching her before she could fall. With a solicitous air that would have done honor to a countess, he helped her into a nearby chair. 
My sincere apologies, my dear lady, for the ungracious manner in which you were brought to me. By all means I would hear the song of which my too eager apprentice speaks, but first, I pray you, rest and enjoy a bit of refreshment. The ride from Zazaspur can be very tiring, can it not? The Lord chatted on as he reached for an embroidered bell pull, speaking lightly of inconsequential things. The balm of social amenities had the desired effect. The tension began to drain from the half-elf's face, slowly to be replaced by pleasure, even pride, as she came to understand that she was not a prisoner, but an honored guest. In moments a servant appeared, bearing a tray laden with wine, fruit, and sweetbreads. Lord Hune waved the servant away and served the refreshments himself. He then offered brief and perfunctory prayers to Selvanus and Sune and Ilmater, the preferred deities of the land, and proposed a toast to the health of Pasha Balak. Hune might not have been born into the nobility, but he had made a point to learn the proprieties, and, like many new-made nobles, he adhered to them with a near religious zeal. It would not be said of him that he was unmannered and common. The half-elven bard warmed to Hune's courteous treatment, even flirting a bit between sips of her spiced wine. Through it all, Hasheth bore himself with the patience of one well accustomed to courtly manners. But as soon as propriety allowed, the young prince turned to business. Might we now hear this song? he asked. Hune bit back an impatient retort and turned to the woman. If you feel ready to sing, we would be most honored to listen. With a coy smile, the half-elf reached for her lyre and checked the tuning on the strings. She played a few silvery notes and then began to sing. The song was a ballad, and as the story unfolded, Hune began to understand why his new apprentice was so eager for him to hear it. It was a story of betrayal and treachery, and of a heroic young bard who uncovered a plot to destroy the Harpers from within. The Harpers. The very mention of this secret organization of meddling northerners was enough to set Hune's teeth on edge. There had been rumors that the Harpers were courting Pasha Balak, but the city's ruler had spurned their advances, as he did those of any northern courtier. Or had he? Hune often wondered how and why the guild's plan to oust Pasha Balak had failed. It had been so carefully planned, so flawlessly executed. Yet the main conspirators had been found slain, and the Pasha himself had sponsored laws that severely limited the powers of the guilds. Clearly, word of the plot had reached his ears, yet, try as they might, no one could learn who might have turned traitor. Hune settled back in his chair and regarded the half-elven bard thoughtfully. Harpers, at work in his Zazaspur. He shuddered at the thought of adding this canny society to the ever-growing list of those who sought to seize power or influence events in Tethir. Their agent must be removed at once, before more of Hune's long-laid plans were discovered and brought down. When the last silvery notes of the lyre shimmered into silence, the Lord turned a smile upon the bard. Thank you for this song, my dear lady. My steward will compensate you for your performance and for the troubles of your journey. But first, can you tell me where you heard this most interesting story? In a tavern, my lord, just as did your young apprentice, the half-elf said. It is widely sung but it is said that the ballad was brought to Tethir by the harper bard who wrote it. And can you name this harper? I cannot, my lord, but they say that in his song he has named himself. Understanding jolted through Hune like a dagger's thrust. Indeed, now that he considered the ballad, the identity of this bard became achingly clear. Surely the composer and the hero were one, the ballad was too self-congratulatory for it to be otherwise. And the description of the hero was very like someone Hune knew. Not well, but far too well for his liking. 
the Lord carefully hid his response. Again he summoned his capable servant and placed the half-elf into the man's care, instructing him to treat their guest with all courtesy and have her escorted back to the city. That settled, Hewn shut the door and took a chair directly across from his watchful apprentice. The Lord knew, of course, who the Harper agent was. It was someone whose identity should have been apparent all along. A newcomer, a northerner, a wealthy young man nobly born into one of Waterdeep's powerful merchant clans. All of these things were ample grounds for suspicion. But with an audacious nerve worthy of master thieves, the Harpers had hidden their agent in plain sight. Who would have suspected that the frivolous young man who'd composed this ballad, to all appearances a fop and a fool, was in reality a viper disguised by a jester's motley? In short, who would have suspected Danilo Than? What Hewn wanted to know now was how this knowledge had come to Hasheth. The Pasha will be interested to learn that these meddlesome northerners are at work in his kingdom, Hewn began, feeling his way a step at a time. He knows already, the young man stated coldly. This so-called bard sings his tales directly into my father's ear. Word of it came to me, I do not approve. Yet it is a wise man who will take a valuable gift even from an enemy, the lord observed cautiously. He could hardly voice his agreement with Hasheth's harsh sentiments. For all he knew, this could be a trap, and it would not do to have the young upstart run to his father with word of Hewn's disapproval. The gift is given. We have no more use for this man, Hasheth continued. We? Hewn let the question hang in the air, observing his apprentice closely as the young man formulated a response. There was much in the youth's eyes that interested Hewn. Whatever Hasheth's talents might be, the prince had not yet learned to hide his emotions. There was a personal matter between him and this harper, of that Hewn was certain. I am now in your service, Hasheth said, speaking with careful emphasis. It seems to me that you would not be well served should a harper remain within the guilds. Well, that answered many questions, Hewn thought wryly. The palace was aware of the guild's plot against Balak. It was even possible that young Hasheth had been placed here in Hewn's service to act as an informant, perhaps by the Harpers themselves. Well enough. Information could flow both ways. Hewn settled back in his chair. I consider myself a fair judge of men. You know this Harper. You have something against him, something of a personal nature. An image of Denilothan flashed into the Lord's mind. A handsome blonde youth, dancing at a recent party and charming the ladies of the court. A woman, perhaps? Hewn concluded slyly, and was rewarded by a flash of sullen resentment in the prince's eyes. A woman, then? And you want the rival for her affections removed? It is not so simple a matter, and even if it were, as your apprentice I would not act without your approval, Hasheth said stiffly. Ah, let us say you have obtained it. What would you do? I would hire every assassin in the guild to hunt him down with all possible haste, the young man said coldly. This is more than a personal matter. Any amount of gold needed to buy the death of this particular traitor would be well spent. But Hewn shook his head. Wait three days, he said. The young fool has powerful friends in Waterdeep, and there would be grave repercussions should we in Tethir move against him too quickly. Give the ballad time to do its work before we strike. The Harpers can hardly avenge an agent who betrayed himself with a song. This ballad will be sung in every tavern in Zazaspur, Hewn finished firmly. You may believe me when I say this. With these words, he took a large gold coin from his pocket and flipped it to his apprentice. The young man deftly fielded the coin and studied it. The proud, stiff posture of his shoulders melted, and the eyes he lifted to Hewn's face were wide with wonder. 
and the dawning of true respect. I see that you know the marks on that coin, the Lord said dryly, and it is well that you do, for the knights of the shield were largely responsible for your father's rise to power. If you are to enter my service, you should also understand my position with this powerful group, and your worth to me. That coin may mark me as an agent of the knights, but information is the true currency. With this currency, an ambitious man can purchase power. Do you understand me? Yes, my lord, Hasheth agreed eagerly. Good. You should also understand that very little happens in these southern lands that the knights have not planned, and by which we do not profit. It is not so in the north. This could change if we had agents who could infiltrate the ranks of the Harpers and bring us information gathered by those northern meddlers. Could such a thing be done, do you think? It can, my lord. Hewn noted the confidence in the prince's voice, the proud, determined tilt of his chin. So there was another Harper beside that Than nuisance, Hewn mused, and one whom Hasheth knew. Perhaps the woman for whose affections Hasheth was willing to betray a former ally. She's very beautiful, this harper? Hune asked casually. A goddess, my lord, the prince blurted out, and then bit his lip as he realized what he had revealed. The lord chuckled. I care not how you amuse yourself, nor do I wish to know the name of this other harper. Not yet, at least. Do all that you can to gain her trust. Prove yourself a competent informant. In doing so, you will serve me well. As you wish, Lord Hewn, he agreed. Hewn, who was in fact a rather astute judge of men, did not doubt that all would be done as agreed. He recognized the fires of ambition, and seldom had he seen them burn so brightly as they did in Hasheth's black eyes. This youth would do whatever he could to further his own cause. The Lord rose to his feet, signifying that the interview was at an end. You will return to the city at once. My scribe, Aknib, has been instructed to teach you of my shipping affairs. Learn well. We will speak more when I return. Return, my lord? Each summer I travel to Waterdeep to attend the Midsummer Fair and to receive the report of our agent there, a countrywoman, Lucia Theon, who is highly placed both in business and society. The young man looked impressed, as Hewn had intended. The Theon family was related to the royal house of Tethyr. Few members had escaped the sword after the fall of the royal family. That one of these survivors was allied with the Knights of the Shield gave an additional luster to the secret society. All things, including loyalty, had a price. As Hewn sent the young man on his way, there was no doubt in his mind that he was now the proud owner of a prince, a prince who also happened to be a trusted ally of the Harpers. It was, in his estimation, a bargain well made. The night passed slowly for Erelin, for try as she might, she could not banish from her mind the image of the elven warrior she had seen in Asante's treasure rooms. When at last she slept, her dreams were haunted by the face of her unknown ancestor, and by a chorus of elvish voices that demanded that the dishonor done to the sword mistress be redressed. Erelin woke before dawn with the voices still ringing in her ears and the conviction that there was more to the night vision than the promptings of her own outrage. The dream had an eldritch intensity of a sort Erelin had not experienced in over two years. Instinctively her eyes went to her moon blade, which lay bared and ready on her night table, within easy reach. Erelin reached out a tentative hand to touch the sword. As she expected, a surge of restless magic jolted through her. The harper snatched back her tingling hand. Then, with a sigh, she reached for the weapon and slid it back into its ancient sheath. She kicked off her covers and rose, buckling on her sword belt with practiced fingers. Barefoot, and clad only in her leggings and under tunic, and, of course, the moon blade, Erelin walked over to the window. 
The city below still lay sleeping, except for those who, like herself, were most likely to do business under the cover of night. For a long time, Erelyn stood at her tower window, staring at Zazaspur's rooftops with eyes that did not see, struggling to accept what she knew to be true. After a silence of more than two years, the elf shadow, the essence of the Moonblade, was growing restless. Once again, the spirit of the magic sword was demanding something of the half-elf who commanded it. The last time this had happened, twenty and more harpers lay dead before Erelyn finally recognized the voice of the sword. She knew the cost of ignoring the Moonblade's warnings, yet the sunrise colors had faded from the sky before she was able to decide upon a course of action. The morning was nearly spent before she was ready to proceed. The half-elf did not consider herself a coward. From an early age she had battled armed men, fought monsters of almost every description, met the Tuigan horde in the lingering horror that was war. There was only one thing under the stars that Erelyn Moonblade truly feared, the unknown powers hidden in the ancient sword that was strapped to her side. There were aspects of the Moonblade's magic that Erelyn understood and wielded with skill. The Moonblade warned her of danger, struck with preternatural speed and power, enabled her to take on a number of disguises, and gave her a resistance to fire that had spared her life more than once. It was the elf shadow, her own mirror image, that Erelyn dreaded. Yet what else could she do but summon the elf shadow and learn from it what she could? The harper placed her hand on the moonblade's hilt and drew a long, steadying breath. The elven sword hissed free of the scabbard and glittered in the bright morning light as Erelyn held it high in her two-handed grip. Come forth she called softly. In response, a faintly azure mist rose from the sword and swirled into the air, taking on a familiar yet ghostly form. The harper's arms lowered until the moonblade's point rested on the wooden floor, but Erelyn hardly noticed, so intent was she on the image taking shape before her. For a moment she had the feeling she was looking at her own reflection in some moonlit pond. Then the elf shadow stepped out of the mist and stood before her, as apparently solid and mortal as Erelyn herself. Unlike the harper, the elf shadow was dressed as if for the road, in the worn but comfortable boots and breeches that Erelyn favored when left solely to her own desires. For a long moment the half-elf and the elf shadow regarded each other solemnly. A strange impulse, the urge to scratch her nose just to see if the elf shadow followed suit flashed into Erelyn's mind. The absurdity of this brought a tiny smile to her lips. Well again, sister, the elf shadow said, speaking in an exact duplicate of Erelyn's contralto tones. I had hoped you would call me forth long ere this. The harper folded her arms over her chest and glared. I've been busy. A sad smile crossed the elf shadow's face. You still blame yourself for the death of those harpers, though the hand that slew them was mine. There's a difference? Erelyn asked bitterly. Oh yes, for the time being at least. The half-elf's brow furrowed with puzzlement. She had many questions. This one seemed a logical place to start. I don't suppose you want to explain that. No more than you want to hear the explanation, the elf shadow responded with an unexpected touch of dry humor. Erelyn lifted an inquiring brow. That's something I might have said, she observed. What are you? Are you the Moonblade or are you me? Both, and yet neither. The elf shadow fell silent, as if carefully measuring her next words. You know that each wielder of a moonblade imbues the sword with a new power, but you do not understand the source of that power. Unlike any other moonfighter who came before you, you were not told of the moonblade's secrets before you claimed the sword. So tell me. It is not so simple, the elf shadow cautioned her. The moonblades are ancient elven artifacts, and the mysteries that went into their crafting cannot be adequately described. 
no more than I could convey to you with mere words a melody you have never heard, or a color you have never seen. Noted. Go on, Erlen said tersely. First, let me point out that the Moonblade accepted you when you were but a child, not to mention the first half-elf ever to inherit such a sword. This decision was not lightly made, for it was foreseen that you would do a great service to the people. The Elf Gate, Erolyn murmured, naming the magical gateway to Evermeet that she had discovered and then fought to protect. That and more, the Elf Shadow agreed cryptically. Once accepted, you slowly became attuned to the sword. That is how I came into being. For lack of a better description, I am the personification of your union with the sword. I see. Do all Moonblades have people like you? By the sea and stars, no, not at all. The ability to form and summon an elf shadow was one of the powers added to the Moonblade you carry. By Zoastria, the shadow added in a lower voice. Something in the elf shadow's tone convinced Erolin that this was the name of the sleeping warrior. So that's why I've been having these dreams. Not since the time of the Harper assassin have I had such visions. But why would finding Zoastria's body stir them, if you are the personification of my union with the sword? Like the elves who have gone before you, you added a power to the Moonblade, the elf shadow continued softly a power that reflects your character and your needs. Erolyn shrugged, impatient for the elf shadow to move on to something she did not already know. Moonblades contain great magic, and they grow in power with each wielder. But as with all magic, the cost is high. The elf shadow paused and spread her hands, as if inviting Erolyn to observe in her what that cost might be. My name is chosen well, for I am the shadow of what you will become. Erolyn stared at her image, not wanting to understand. Yet she suspected that she knew what the elf shadow meant. Suddenly she realized that in some small way she had always known. Then, when I die, she began, you will not die, strictly speaking. Your life essence will enter the Moonblade. This is the ultimate source of the sword's magic. Erolyn turned abruptly away. For a long moment she stared at the wall, her face frozen as she struggled to control her roiling emotions. So, what you're saying is that this sword is full of dead elves, she said at last. No, that explanation is simplistic and crude, not to mention entirely inaccurate. Except in unusual cases elves are immortal. We pass from this world on to the realms of Arvindor without tasting death as humans know it. But yes, each elf who accepts a Moonblade understands that his or her passage to Arvindor will be delayed, perhaps for thousands of years, until the Moonblade's purpose is fulfilled. When a sword falls dormant, the elves are released. It is an enormous sacrifice, but one that certain noble elves take on gladly for the greater good of the people. But what of me? The words poured from Erolyn in an agonized rush. I am half-elven. The gates of Arvindor are closed to such as I, and most of the elves I've known believe I have no soul. What will become of me, of us? She amended bitterly. The elf shadow merely shook her head. I do not know. None of us know. You are the first half-elf ever to wield such a blade. At the risk of sounding like a two-copper cleric discussing the afterlife, you will have to wait and find out. But your best guess would be eternal servitude, cooped up like some genie in a cheap bronze lamp, Erolyn said with cold rage. Thanks, but I'll pass. You cannot. The hell I can't. I didn't sign on for any of this. Your fate was decided when you first drew the sword, the elf shadow insisted. But Erolyn shook her head, her eyes blazing. 
I'll accept that when I'm drinking tea and swapping stories with Zoastria's shade. There has to be a way out. Where would I find someone who knows it? Arvindor, the shadow replied grimly, and possibly ever meet. Erlen threw up her hands. To her, one was about the same as the other. She would never be accepted on the Elven Island, and not even for the sake of her soul, if indeed she had one, would she take something unearned from the hands of her mother's people. Unearned. Suddenly, the furious Harper remembered the missive from the Queen of Evermead, and she knew what she must do. She would accept M. Laurel's impossible mission, and she would find a way to succeed beyond the elven monarch's highest expectations, and she would do it in her own way and on her own terms. And once that was accomplished, the queen would pay dearly for services rendered. Erolyn lifted the sword and faced down her elf shadow. In you go, she said grimly. Where I'm headed... The patrons are already seeing double. Chapter 6 It's been days, and no sign of them elves, Venlar fretted, and not for the first time. How are we to know when they're coming? You'd sooner hear your own shadow coming up behind you than one of them unnatural things. Like ghosts, they are. For all we know, every man on patrol is lying under some bush right now with a second smile under his chin. Bunlap threw a quelling glance toward the nervous archer. Maybe so, but we'll know, he said shortly. I'll know. As the mercenary spoke, his hand lifted to touch the livid scar on his cheek. Three curving lines that combined in the simple but distinctive design of a woodland flower of some sort. Bunlap had seen that mark elsewhere, and since the day the red-haired elf had marked him, he had done his dead-level damnedest to make sure other people saw it too. People who wouldn't think kindly of the elf it identified. And by extension, the rest of Tether's elves. Bunlap's hatreds were nothing if not inclusive. They were a scrappy bunch, the wild elves of Tether, even if they were short and scrawny. The half-dozen that Bunlap's men had captured from the forest glade had put up a fight all out of proportion to their size and number, and these were but womenfolk and half-grown elf brats. The mercenaries kept these few around as bait for a trap, but there were many other elves in the forest who might well blame the red-haired elf whose arrows Bunlap had strewn judiciously around the ravaged elven settlement. Bunlap liked the idea of angering some of the Elmaness border tribes and turning them against the elven warrior who had maimed him and who had eluded him for too long. Keep the long-eared bastards busy, that was what he was getting paid to do. But when it came time to kill the red-haired elf, Bunlap wanted the honor for himself. The mercenary propped his boots up on a bale of dried and cured pipeweed. From his left boot he pulled a small knife, with which he began to carve some of the dirt from under his fingernails. From the small window across from him, he had a clear view of the field that stretched between the drying barn and the forest's edge. Sunset colors spilled into the small, winding creek that separated field from forest and provided water for the thirsty crops. In the dying light, the shadows were deep and long. Even so, nothing, and no one, would be able to sneak past him. Most of the men in the barn's loft seemed to share Bunlap's confidence. A dozen men sprawled about throwing dice, whittling, or otherwise killing time. Several days had come and gone since their last foray into the deep shadows of Tether, and as time passed, their dread of elven retaliation had faded into nonchalance. Venlar, however, was still as nervous as a mouse in a hawk's nest. The archer paced the barn's loft, watching the windows but keeping well out of the line of fire. In the field directly below them, six bedraggled elves were chained and staked amid the rows of aromatic plants. It was Bunlap's plan that the elves appear to be field slaves, a plan that was about as effective as hitching three wild deer to a plow and expecting a straight furrow to come of it. The strange little folk adamantly refused to cooperate with their captors. 
Even the smallest child would rather take a beating than harvest a single leaf. Weakened by lack of food and sleep and by the frequent lash of the whips, the elves nonetheless showed a fierce, stubborn resistance that Venlar almost admired. The archer watched as one of the mercenaries on guard duty drew back his whip to punish a recalcitrant slave. His intended victim, an elven lass not yet old enough to bed, faced the man defiantly as the whip flashed up and forward. Up came the girl's arm, moving with the speed that rivaled that of the flailing leather thong. Even as the whip curled around her wrist, the elf maid exploded into action. Moving faster than Venlar would have believed possible, the girl seized the whip with both hands and threw herself into a backward roll. The sudden tug worked with the whip's momentum to pull the mercenary off balance. He stumbled forward. Before he could recover, the elf was on her feet. With the speed of a striking hawk, she was upon him. A quick flash of her bleeding arm and the now slack whip was looped around the mercenary's neck. Darting around him, the fierce elf child leaped up high and planted both bare feet on the small of the human's back. She kicked out hard, launching herself back and pulling at the whip with all her might. Venlar winced as the mercenary's head snapped back sharply. He fancied he could actually hear the distant cracking of bone. Another man down, he noted laconically watching as three of the guards rushed in and wrestled the girl to the ground. When Bunlap merely shrugged, the archer turned back to the scene below. He felt oddly ill at ease in the barn's loft, trapped almost. Yet Venlar was no stranger to the task before him. During his years stationed in the fortress known as Darkhold, he'd often hidden in the rocks above some nearby mountain pass, picking off travelers. When would-be invaders challenged the Gentish stronghold, Venlar was always called to the walls to help pin down the attackers. His aim was almost legendary, and he had over two hundred confirmed kills to his credit. But compared to the uncanny skill of the forest elves, Venlar felt like a clumsy-handed novice. Not even the extra measure of precision granted him by his elven bow evened the score to his satisfaction. Suddenly the mercenary captain leaped to his feet, his gray eyes blazing in his elf-scarred face. There it is, men, hissed Bunlap. Take your places, move! Although Bunlap's men exchanged uncertain glances, all did as they were told. Kneeling beside the small windows that vented the loft, they gathered their weapons, fixed their eyes upon the tree line, and waited. What'd you hear, captain? Venlar murmured as he knocked an arrow one of his own this time, steel-tipped and fletched with the blue and white striped feathers of a bird that brightened the bleak landscape of his native Cormier. The arrow felt good in his hands, not at all like the black shafted arrows he had pillaged from the quivers of slain elves or torn from the bodies of his own comrades. There was something unnatural about those elven bolts. Venlar couldn't pick up such an arrow without the strange feeling that it might at any moment turn against him. The call of a wood thrush, Bunlap returned with grim satisfaction. A sort of bird that never ventures from the forest to the fields. It would appear that our elven friend has less sense than the bird he imitates. Venlar squinted into the trees, but he could see nothing. He nodded toward the captured elves in the fields below. If you recognize that bird song, so do they, he pointed out. This, Venlar thought, was the weakest point of Bunlap's plan. Surely, the elven slaves realized they were bait for an ambush. If they had bothered to count, they would have to know there had been more humans in the raiding party that destroyed their homes than the few who now guarded them. But the elves also knew enough about their human captors to realize that they themselves would probably not survive a rescue attempt. Venlar had no idea whether the elves would try to warn away any would-be rescuers or whether they'd keep quiet and hope for the best. Then a pale bolt arched up high over the field, followed by two more. The arrows descended upon the three guards who were busy subduing the elf girl with considerably more force than was needed. Startled oaths and shouts of pain floated up toward the barn as the guards leaped to their feet. The men whirled about, 
pawing at the arrows embedded between their shoulder blades. Just out of reach, just above the heart, murmured Venlar with admiration. It was an astonishing feat of skill. Even more remarkable was the range at which the shot had been made. Not even a crossbow-fired arrow could have taken the guards with a level shot. To reach the humans at all, the elves had had to shoot upward at a sharp angle, trusting that the arrows would fall in precisely the right place. Before he had time to marvel at this feat of marksmanship, the unseen elves' purpose became apparent. The elf maid, suddenly freed, seized a hand-axe from the belt of one of the distracted men and with one fierce blow severed the chain that tethered her. At once, a second barrage of arrows exploded from the forest and took all three of her tormentors through their throats. She nimbly dodged their falling bodies and ran like a deer for the trees. Instinctively, Venlar dropped the elf bow and snapped his loaded crossbow up into place. Before he could bring down the elf maid, Bunlap seized his wrist. Fool! You'll give away our position! And she won't? Venlar retorted. For once, Bunlap had no argument. He released the archer's wrist and nodded grimly. Venlar pulled the crossbow's trigger. The arrow streaked toward the fleeing girl, and though she was at the outermost edge of his range, he saw his aim would be good. But while the arrow was still hurtling downward toward the elf maid's back, an answering flash came from the forest's edge. There was a sudden bright spark clearly visible against the darkening forest as Venlar's steel arrowhead met one of stone. Both arrows fell to the ground, and the elf maid disappeared into the trees. Bane's dark blood! the archer swore in an awed tone. Had he not seen it with his own eyes, he wouldn't have believed any mortal being could shoot accurately enough to hit an arrow in flight, point to point. Bunlap seemed to be having similar thoughts, for he edged away from the open window. He cupped his hands to his mouth and bellowed instructions to the men below. The guards unchained the captured elves and, holding them as shields, began to drag them back behind the barn. Lot of good that will do, Venlar muttered. Elves are small. There's still too much human target exposed. Those elven archers could put a bolt through a hummingbird's eye. So we might lose a few guards. The captain returned coldly. What of it? Enough men remain to bring the captives out of range and out of sight. The wild elves won't stand and fight, but we'll give them something to think about. Every now and again we'll cut one of their women folk. They can sit there and enjoy the music while we kill off their people bit by bit, or they can leave the shelter of the trees. The archer responded with a derisive sniff. An easy choice for them to make, is that what you think? inquired Bunlap. Mark me, that fox-haired elf will come. Hell's dungeons I'd come, if for no other reason than to take up the gauntlets we've been leaving all over the forest. But more than that, he wants me. The mercenary captain continued with dark satisfaction. I've looked into that elf's eyes. He's the sort who likes to think of himself as a noble leader, but deep down he's the same as I am. For both of us, this has become personal. The elven maiden stumbled into the forest and into the waiting arms of Tamara Oakstaff, the only female in the war party. The young fighter steadied the child, then held her out at arm's length. Tamara's expert gaze slid over the girl, measuring her hurts. These were many and considerable. Welts and gashes dealt by the whip, Skin rubbed into raw, angry wounds by rusted chains. A frail body weakened by lack of food and water and rest. There were unseen hurts, too, apparent only to Tamara's fey eyes. For a moment the elf woman flinched away from the terrors the child had endured. But any thought of pity died when Tamara's gaze reached the girl's fierce eyes. The older female nodded approval. This one would not only survive but fight. Give the little hawk some water, she said with a smile, and then give her a bow and quiver. But the elf maid waved away both and pointed to the retreating humans. Too late for that, she said. They are beyond range, Foxfire agreed. 
As the leader handed the girl a water skin and indicated that she must drink, his eyes searched the windows placed high on the large wooden structure that stood at the far side of the field. There, archers lay in wait for them. As he'd expected, this was an ambush. What he hadn't bargained on was that Bunlap would use elven children and females to lure his opponents into the trap. Silently, Foxfire berated himself. He should have foreseen something like this, given what he knew of the man. Tell us of our foe. How many humans do we face? He asked the elf maid, speaking as one warrior to another. This show of respect brightened the child's eyes. She bit her lip, concentrating, nodding off the count as she silently tallied their foe. More than a hundred men attacked Council Glade. Of that number, perhaps half survived. We six managed to kill a few more since we were brought here, but there were far too many for us. A familiar story when dealing with humans, muttered Tamson, Tamara's twin-born brother. And in the barn? Foxfire pressed. Ten, maybe more, she said. There were twelve guards in the field, and two patrols of ten each in the forest. You needn't worry about them, Tamson assured her in a tone that left little doubt as to their fate. A score of humans. We outnumber them three to two, exulted Tamara. And in the forest that would be overwhelming odds, the leader said. But the humans have turned this battle around, forcing us into a stupid and suicidal charge while they fight from cover as forest people do. It is not our way, but if you say it must be done, we will follow you, one of the warriors said. The others, thirty in all, nodded and raised their hands in a silent gesture of assent, as the elves of tall trees pledged their lives to their war leader. Foxfire thanked them with a nod, then turned back to study the unfamiliar battleground. For a long moment, the warriors at his back remained silent in the shadows, waiting with elven patience for his decision. As the darkness around them deepened, the only sounds were the night songs of birds and the quickening chirp of crickets. Then the quiet twilight was rent by the sound of a female's scream, high and piercing and anguished. The elves tensed, their dark fingers curving around their bows and their muscles tensing as they prepared to sprint through the deadly field. Do not, Foxfire said softly, though his own face was twisted with distress. They are baiting us, and their archers will pick us off long before we reach our people. Your deaths will only speed theirs. What then? demanded Korragash, coming up to his friend's side. With a strange smile, the leader pulled his bone knife from his belt and cut the thong that bound his forehead and held back his fox-colored hair. From it hung a number of ornaments that helped his bright russet locks to blend in with the forest. Feathers, cunningly woven reeds, a dried cattail he'd cut that spring from the swan maze glade. Foxfire's hands moved deftly as he slid the cattail onto an arrow's shaft. Murmuring a quick prayer of explanation and apology, Foxfire slashed at the bark of a scrubby pine until it bled thick sap. He scraped up the pine pitch with his knife and pressed it into the cattail, then called for the loan of a fire-forged knife. Wordlessly, Korragash handed one over. The horrified expression in his black eyes was echoed on the face of every elf in the company as Foxfire struck steel against stone. What the leader proposed to do was unthinkable to the forest elves, for in their world no force was as feared or as destructive as the one Foxfire prepared to unleash. The plants in that field are green and fresh, he said softly as he struck a second spark, and water runs between the barn and the trees. The barn will burn, but fire will not reach the forest. When the humans are forced from the building, we will attack. They force us into the open, we will do the same. But they will not let our people live that long, protested Tamson. They will, Foxfire said with absolute certainty. They will keep them alive and in torment for as long as it takes to bring us to them. There is much about the humans I do not understand, but this thing I know. Their leader will not rest easy until he has washed his pride with my blood. 
Another scream pierced the night. Foxfire winced and bent over his fearful task. Again, he struck steel to stone. This time the spark fell upon the pitch-coated cattail. The elf blew softly upon it, coaxing the makeshift torch into flame. When the arrow was ready, he quickly fitted it to his bow. With a strength far beyond that suggested by his slender frame, the elf pulled the arrow back to its flaming point. For a moment he held it, drawing up strength from the forest floor beneath him. Then he loosed both the arrow and a hawk-like cry. The fire-bearing arrow streaked through the night like a falling star, plummeting into the dried weeds, crushed and matted by the passage of many feet that surrounded the wooden building. As smoke spiraled upward toward the stars, elven arrows kept at bay all those who tried to quench the gathering flames. Vile oaths and shouts of anger and fear poured from the building like smoke, but at last the humans were forced to stagger from the burning barn into the night. Shoot while you can, fight hand to hand when you must, Foxfire said tersely. Have ready a second weapon. As soon as possible we must arm any of the captives who are still able to fight. You, little sister, bide here and await our return. But the rescued elf maid seized the steel knife from his hands. For my mother, she said before he could protest, and she showed him the bone dagger Tamara had already given her. You are a brave and blooded warrior, but you are hurt, he said gently. I can still fight, she insisted. Her eyes glowed with intense fervor as she seized his hand and pressed it to her lips. And I will follow you to death and beyond. With these words, the elf maid darted out into the field, her thin, dark form silhouetted against the leaping flames. The other elves followed suit at once, fanning out as they went, running as silently as a pack of wolves. Foxfire and Korrigash exchanged a wry glance and then kicked into a run. I used to wonder why, of the two of us, you ended up as war leader, the dark-haired elf observed, especially seeing as how I can outrun, outshoot, and outfight you. A fleeting grin softened Foxfire's grim face. I'll remember that challenge, my friend, and disprove it another day. So, what is this secret? You know when to follow, Korrigash said. The elven leader's black eyes settled upon the child warrior. She was the first to reach the humans. Her frail form was barely visible in the roiling smoke, crouched as she was astride a fallen man, but her arm rose again and again as the steel sank home. Foxfire nodded, recognizing the truth of his friend's observation, though he himself had never thought long on the matter. Korrigash had a gift for saying much with few words. Hi, son, and two, Korrigash gritted out, naming a time of day and a direction. Reflexively, his friend snapped up his bow and loosed an arrow ahead and to his right. The swirling smoke parted to reveal a human fighter, an elf bolt buried in his gut and a look of surprise on his face. In his hand was a length of chain, still whirling, that he'd been preparing to launch at Foxfire. The impromptu weapon wrapped around the human's arm with a sickening thud and a crack of bone. When the human opened his mouth to scream, all that emerged was a sudden bright gush. Foxfire turned away from the sight, for the death of his enemies gave him no pleasure. He touched the other elf's arm in silent thanks and pulled his dagger. Suddenly there was no more time for words. The battle closed around them with a hellish cacophony. A roaring of flames, the shrieks of rage and pain, and the deafening pounding of their own blood against their ears. The two elves spun and stood back to back to confront together a horror that both had long feared and neither understood. A war against the humans. The door of the breaching whale tavern slammed open, sending shutters through the many paned windows that fronted the dock. An elf woman burst into the taproom as if she'd been thrust through the door by the winds of a freak summer storm. She was uncommonly tall for an elf, white-skinned and raven-haired, a startling coloring common to the moon people. 
Vivid blue eyes flamed like wizard fire as she stalked across the suddenly silent room. Sandusk Truffle Digger, the halfling barkeep, watched warily as the elf woman descended upon him with the force of a funnel cloud. Where is Carrie Macomail? she demanded, punctuating her question by slamming both hands upon the polished wooden counter. The halfling was gratified to note that her voice, a melodic alto, despite her anger, was definitely that of a half-elf, not as flat as a human's tones, but lacking the music and magic of an elven voice. Elves and humans both were trouble, but to Sandusk's way of thinking, an elf-human hybrid was to be preferred over a pure-blooded version of either variety. Half-elves were treated well enough in Zazaspur, but they walked a thin rope and most of them knew it. The ever-increasing racial conflicts of Tethir put half-elves in a tenuous position that prompted them to watch their manners and mind their own affairs. This one, however, seemed determined to be the exception. When the barkeep did not answer fast enough to suit her, the half-elf seized his tunic with both hands and pulled him up over the bar until they were eye to eye. I know and appreciate the breached whale's reputation for protecting its patrons, and I assure you I have no intention of harming Captain Macamail, she said softly. You, however, are another matter entirely. Now talk. He's gone, the barkeep squeaked. He left! Erlen gave him a sharp shake. I know that. I also know that he routinely informs you of his next destination. Tell me, or I'll skewer you like a roasting rabbit. But I'm a halfling, Seldusk protested in a piercing whine that carried to every corner of the tavern. He had long ago learned that those larger than he could easily be shamed, and like most halflings he doled out guilt with a lavish hand. I'm but half your size! The half-elf smiled coldly. So I'll use a short sword. Seldusk considered the grim practicality of this solution. He's not gone far, he said in tones more modulated toward discretion. Mist Walker raised anchor just this morning. Captain Macamail said something about hooking up with some pirate hunters. Might be that you could still catch him. Erolyn stared at the halfling for a moment, then she gave a curt nod and lowered him to the floor. She turned and strode from the tavern. Without pause, she went to the edge of the dock and dove cleanly into the water. One of the bemused patrons shook his head and snorted. By the wounds of ill mater! What's the fool elf wench thinking of? Swimming out to Macamale's ship? The halfling heard in these words the voice of opportunity. He smoothed his tunic back into place and then topped off his customer's mug from a foaming pitcher. My dear sir, that wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. And if you're wagering, man, I'll happily lay odds that you'll have him back here by sunrise. Erolyn dove deep and began swimming steadily toward the west. As she did, she blessed Black Pearl an old friend and a half-sea-elf, for the enchanted amulet of water-breathing that allowed Erolyn to enter her world. The harper was not fond of magic or magical devices, but she'd kept the talisman for many years in honor of her friend. Of late, she'd had need of it so often she'd gotten into the habit of wearing it. As she swam, she kept a keen watch for threats from the many dangers in Zazaspur's coastal waters. Colonies of Sahuagin abounded, there were even rumors that the creatures had managed to capture several ships, which they used to engage in piracy. These rumors were unconfirmed. Lost ships were not uncommon, but survivors of pirate attacks were rare, and so far none could establish the truth of the strange buccaneers. But Erolyn knew what she knew. Where there were Sahuagin, there were also sea elves, and she had long been on better terms with the people who dwelt below the sea than those who walked beneath the stars. She probably knew more about the sea folk's affairs than did the insular elves of Tethir's forest. The forest of Tether was vast and ancient, stretching from its easternmost point in the foothills of the Snowflake Mountains to the Starspire Peninsula, almost to the very edge of the sea. 
But few elves lived on this swampy western arm of forest land, a part of Tethyr that had long since been abandoned to the humans and their clandestine activities. Poachers cut down the ancient trees for mast poles, pirates docked in finger-like coves. Even the Sawagan had bases on the star spire. So therefore did the elves. And not just the sea people. Once the sea creatures had taken to ships, the elven nation of Evermeet had sent in vessels of its own to even the balance. In a deep cove near the tip of the peninsula, shielded from discovery by jagged rocks both real and illusionary, was a small outpost of the elven navy, cloaked with concealing magic and commanded by moon-elven sailors from the royal fleet. Macamale had confided this to Erelin a couple years back, right after he'd first been named Elf Friend and allowed to make port on Evermeet. The captain had returned from the elven island overbrimming with stories of elven wonders and glowing like a moon in the reflected glory of Queen M. Laurel. Although Erelin had little patience for his stories about the elven queen, she'd listened and learned what she could. Since Macamale could stay in Zazespur for only so long without raising suspicions about his intentions, Erelin guessed he was bound for the elven port. She did not doubt that he would stay close at hand until he had done M. Laurel's bidding. From the corner of her left eye, Erelin glimpsed a familiar shape in the dark water. An elven form, smaller than that of land-dwelling people, and almost invisible behind the writhing strands of seaweed he used as cover. If not for her infravision, Erelin would not have seen him at all. The elf was clearly part of a patrol. A tightly rolled net was tied to his belt, and he wore several sharp weapons and a wary expression. Erelin had no doubt that another elf, similarly armed, closed in on her from the right. She raised both hands high and to her sides to show that they held no weapons. Then she slowly turned to face the first elf. Using the hand gestures she'd learned from Black Pearl, she laboriously spelled out her need to find Macamale. Grudgingly, she added that she was on an errand for Amlaril of Evermeet. The sea elf's eyes brightened with adoration at the mention of the elven queen, an expression Erelin had seen far too often on the face of Macamale, or for that matter anyone else who knew of Queen Amlaril. Even Alaith Kralnover, a rogue moon elf of Erelin's acquaintance who'd spent his many years away from Evermeet honing his reputation for battle prowess and cruelty, grew positively misty at the mention of the queen's name. The harper gritted her teeth and focused her attention upon the sea elf's gesticulating, webbed fingers. Macomale elf friend has spoken of you, Erolyn Moonflower. The people have been charged with watching for your approach, though we expected you to come by boat. He lifted one hand in the directional inflection that indicated humor. Erelin, however, was in no mood to be amused. Moonflower was the name of the royal family of Evermeet, her mother's name, and one that Erelin had no thought of claiming for herself. A simple error, no doubt, but one that grated on her. Moonblade, she corrected him, spelling out the word with emphatic deliberation, but the elf had already turned away and was gesturing excitedly to his partner, a female distinguished by her close-cropped green curls and the gleaming trident she carried. The two carried on a brief discussion, their fingers flashing with a speed Erelin could not follow. Then the elves gestured that she should follow them. The harper sighed, sending a rift of bubbles floating upward, and then began to swim after the sea folk. Erelin was a strong swimmer, but there was no possible way she could keep pace with these elves. Time and again her escort forgot her limitations and left her behind, only to circle back. Fortunately, Mistwalker had not gone far into the bay. By moonrise the trio had the ship in sight. The sea elves bid farewell to their charge and disappeared into the black waters, leaving Erelin to approach the human vessel alone. To Erelin's surprise, the ship had dropped anchor. That was risky for even so close to Zazaspur, piracy was far from uncommon. She climbed the anchor's rope and quietly pulled herself over the side of the vessel. 
As she shook the water from her ears, she heard behind her the unmistakable hiss of steel sliding free of a scabbard. Her own sword fairly leaped from its sheath. Moonblade held firmly in her two-handed grip, Arolin whirled to face the challenger. The swordsman was young, a son of one of the western Moonshay Isles, if his bright red hair and broad, blunt-nosed countenance spoke truth, and he was armed with a two-edged blade and matched dagger common to that area. Arolin adjusted her grip slightly to prepare for the expected attack. Sure enough, the man fainted low, a common move that would no doubt be followed by a dagger feint and a sweeping overhead sword cut. There were many styles of swordplay among the humans of Faerun. Erolin was acquainted with them all. She parried his sword feint with a hard downward swing that forced the point of his blade to the deck. Before he could bring his dagger into play, she swept the moonblade up and to her right with a force that sent the smaller weapon spinning. At the same time, she stomped down hard on the man's downturned blade, wrenching the sword from his hand. The whole exercise took perhaps ten seconds. For a moment the youth merely stood there, unarmed, too stunned by the pace of the battle to assimilate its results. Then understanding of his fate dawned in his eyes, and he drew breath to shout an alarm before he died. Erolin slammed the moonblade back into its sheath and plunged both of her hands into the young man's bright hair. She yanked him forward, drove her head hard into his forehead, then thrust him away as she pivoted hard to her left. Up came her right knee, slamming hard into his gut. As he folded with a soft oof of surprise and pain, Erolin changed directions and spun again, bringing her right forearm down hard on the back of his neck. Down he went. Senseless, but with no lasting damage. A shame, observed a deep, faintly amused voice behind her. And me having such high hopes for the lad. He hasn't his father's luck with the ladies, that's for sure and certain. Erolin spun and looked up into the bewhiskered face of the captain. Oh no, not your son. Maiden voyage, agreed Macamail with a wry grin. And you should pardon the expression. Don't look so worried. The lad is well enough, though he'll have Umberley's own tempest raging in his head come morning. Let him sleep it off while we speak of other matters. My cabin? Erolin nodded and allowed the captain to lead her into an unusually large and luxurious cabin furnished with an enormous bed sufficient to Macamale's size and girth, a brass-bound chest, a small writing table, and a pair of chairs. As Erolin took a seat, she was suddenly conscious of the puddle her dripping clothes left on Macamale's termish carpet. Drink this. It'll help stave off the chill, the captain said cheerfully as he handed her a goblet of wine. She accepted it and sipped, then placed the goblet on the sea chest. I've reconsidered your offer. I was hoping you might he said with equal candor and then grinned. You charmed word of my whereabouts from our little friend Suldusk, I take it? Erolin shrugged away his teasing. Her methods had been abrupt, even by her standards, but the stakes in her quest were too high and too personal to allow room for regrets or time for diplomacy. Would you carry my answer and my terms to Amlauril of Evermeet? And can you duplicate her commission? I'm in a hurry, but I'll need as good a forgery as you can manage. No need for that, Macamel said. He took a sheet of parchment from the pile on his writing table and handed it to her. Erolin scanned the elvish script. It seemed to be a duplicate of the document she had destroyed. The genuine article, the captain avowed. Lady Lerrell insisted that I carry a spare copy or two, and as for terms, the Queen has authorized me to promise on her behalf any payment you might request. Such wisdom and foresight, Erolin murmured dryly, still studying the parchment in her hands. I'm seldom paid with bank promissory notes, though the benefits of time saved should be apparent to all. When she was satisfied that the elven queen's offer was genuine and that all was in order, Erolin put the parchment on the table and lifted her eyes to her host. 
Can you take me back to Zazaspur at once? In response, Macamail rose from his chair and tugged at the bell pole hanging against one polished wall. My dear lady, I am entirely at your service. You know, of course, that the docks are chained off until dawn. Dawn's good, Erolyn agreed. There is a cabin next to mine. It is empty, this voyage, and you are more than welcome to rest there. You might find some dry garments in the large sea chest that will do until morning. If you need anything else, you've only to ask. Erolyn's face relaxed into a grateful smile, one that transformed her face and brought an answering and familiar spark to the captain's blue eyes. The half-elf suppressed a sigh. Perhaps the captain was acting at the behest of the elven queen, but by all reports his fondness for elf women did not begin and end with M. Laurel. It did not surprise Erolyn to hear that the guest cabin boasted a feminine wardrobe, and she did not doubt that she would find a number of garments that would fit her elven frame. Rumors suggested that the green elf druid was not the only elf woman who had found a place in Macamale's heart. Furthermore, the glint in his eyes suggested he would not be averse to adding a half-elf to his collection of fondly held memories. Not wishing to pursue this path, Erolyn thanked her host and rose to follow the cabin boy who came promptly to the ring of Macamale's bell. The captain watched her go and waited until he heard the bolt of her cabin door slide shut. Then he seated himself at his writing table and took up the parchment Erolyn had left there. Slowly, laboriously, he read the elvish script to the place where the queen's ambassador was named. Macamail opened a small drawer beneath his table and took from it a tiny bottle of ink. It was of elven make, a rare, deep purple hue fashioned from a mixture of berries and flowers that grew only on evermeat. Carefully, he unstoppered the bottle and dipped a quill into the precious fluid. With painstaking care, he added a few tiny curves and lines to the elvish script. It was fortunate, Macamale thought, as he sprinkled the parchment with drying powder, that the elvish words for moon blade and moon flower were so similar in appearance. The captain had heard from Laryl the tale of the elf gate and the deep sorrow it had brought to Queen M. Laurel. Having witnessed the sadness in the queen's eyes and mourned it for love of her, Macamail was loath to do anything that might bring additional pain to the wondrous elven monarch. Yet, Macamail also held the half-elven fighter in high regard, and he understood the importance of the task before her. And he knew, as well as any human alive, the difficulty that would face Erolyn in the shadows of Tether. He himself had loved a woman of the forest— a green elf druid whose strange fey ways had left him mystified much of the time. But from his elven love he had learned enough about the forest folk to suspect that the people of Tether would reject a half-elven ambassador, and perhaps even slay her. Passing as a full-blooded elf was never easy for the half-elven, not even for one as resourceful as Erolyn. Macamale had therefore devised a strategy that might help her do just that. Elven naming customs were endlessly complicated. Although it was not unusual for an elf to take on a surname that spoke of a particular skill or weapon, names such as Snow Runner or Oak Staff or Ashen Bow, these descriptive titles were for common use, a name to use during travels or to give acquaintances or outsiders, especially dwarves and humans. Among themselves, however, Elves considered the giving of a family name and the recitation of lineage to be a vital step in formal exchanges. For Erolyn to identify herself to an elven tribe by only the sword she carried would be an egregious breach of protocol. It would almost certainly shout that her claim as Evermeet's ambassador was spurious. In her case, this was particularly true, for Moonblades were known to be hereditary swords and a refusal to identify herself by family would be regarded by the elves as a blatant, arrogant admission that she was not what she claimed to be. And that, Macamale noted wryly, would go over in elven society about as well as an ogreish daughter-in-law. With this in mind, 
the captain had decided to give Erolin a family name and an ancient lineage, all with a few small strokes of a quill pen. His opinion that these honors were truly hers to claim eased his mind somewhat. Nor did he doubt that the borrowed glamour of the royal family would drape a protective mantle over the half-elven woman and silence many questions before they were spoken. And after all, it was well known that of all the races of elves, moon people were most like humans. The elves of Tether's forest were insular, but they knew that no half-elves were allowed on Evermeet, and it would not occur to them that a half-elf would be permitted to carry the name of the royal family. A missive from M. Laurel's own hand, claiming Erolin as her descendant, would settle the matter. It was not a ploy that would enter the proud half-elf's mind, nor would she agree to it if the captain explained his intentions. To Macamale's way of thinking, they were much akin, the elven queen and the not-quite-elven swordmistress. Forgive me, my ladies, he murmured as he rolled the parchment and slipped it into a tube. And may the gods grant that broad and stormy seas lie between me and either one of you when you learn what I've done. True to his word, Captain Macamale had Erolin back in Zazaspur before sunrise. Her last day in the Tetherian city flew by, for there was still much to do before she left for the forest. Arrangements long in the making had to be confirmed, messages sent, materials gathered. There was one personal detail, however, that Erolin left off attending for as long as she could. She could not leave Zazaspur without word to her Harper partner, nor would she inform him of her going by note or messenger. Yet she was reluctant to face the young nobleman. Danilo would understand at once the danger of her mission, and he would not accept lightly what might well be a final leave-taking between them. Worse, the stubborn fool might even devise a way to follow her. But when the hour of even feast approached, Erolin prepared herself to enter Danilo's world. She dressed herself in her one fine gown, a simple shift of deep blue silk, with an embroidered overgown that was draped and sashed in a manner that hid her weapon belt, yet gave her quick access to her moon blade. Erolin arranged her hair so that it covered her pointed ears and applied a bit of rosy ointment to add a more human tint to her white skin. As a final touch, one that would give her an aura of wealth and grant her instant admission to the posh fest houses and taverns that her partner frequented, Erolin slipped gold and sapphire rings onto several of her fingers and fastened a matching jeweled pin onto her bodice. Danilo had a passion for fine gems and an apparent desire to see her covered with them. After nearly three years, Erolin had amassed quite a collection. She had declined his first few offerings, but he'd made it a point to learn of elven festivals and special days so that he could press his tokens upon her when it was hardest for her to refuse. Among Danilo's annoying traits, and these were numerous, was his ability to circumvent, if not forestall, nearly any feminine objection. Nor did it escape Erolin's notice that she possessed a much sterner resistance to his charms than many of the women of Zazaspur did or the women of Waterdeep, for that matter, or Baldur's Gate, or... With a sigh, Erolin banished this unprofitable line of thought. She climbed into her hired carriage and settled down for a long evening. Danilo customarily took his evening meal at one of several fest halls or taverns, at her insistence never in any predictable pattern. Thus, it might be some time before she would find him. The first stop was the Hanging Garden a tavern fashioned to reflect the tastes and preferences of Zazaspur's current ruler. Erolin was not fond of the place. It was too much like being in Calumport for her liking, but Danilo came here frequently to enjoy the quality of the wine and the music. Traveling bards, as well as local musicians, performed nightly. As a hostess dressed in flimsy silk draperies ushered the disguised harper to a table, the strains of a harp mingled with the sounds of soft conversation. As was the current fashion, the harpist played the melody of a ballad through once before joining the strings in song. There was something vaguely familiar about the tune. 
Erolyn was not one to give much heed to tavern performers, but she listened carefully when the singer, a young woman with the olive skin and dark hair common to natives of Tethir, began the ballad. The melody was catchy but common enough, the rippling chords of the harp pleasant but not especially clever, the singer's voice a clear but unremarkable soprano. In all, the music deserved to be no more than an agreeable backdrop to conversation. Yet by the time the ballad entered its third stanza, the Tethyrian woman sang into complete and utter silence. Erolyn was no bard, but she understood full well the impact of the song. It told a story she knew all too well, even though the facts had been changed to conceal certain secrets and to glorify the alleged hero of the ballad. A nobleman and a bard, who had done a great service to the harpers by bringing to justice, single-handedly, if the ballad was to be believed, the gold elf assassin who caused the deaths of twenty and more of those who harped. As Erolyn watched the listening patrons, she had no doubt that their sympathies fell firmly on the side of the gold elf killer. Harpers were not welcome in troubled Zazaspur, and harper heroes were hardly an acceptable subject for tavern tales. A visiting bard might possibly be forgiven for a social blunder of this magnitude, but Erolyn could think of only one reason why a tetherian born singer would risk performing such a ballad as a dramatic prelude to exposing a harper in their midst. Erolyn carefully painted an expression of disdain on her face and rose from her table. She slowly left the tavern, forcing herself to move with the languid stroll of a wealthy lady who had no more compelling purpose than to remove herself from a performance that did not suit her tastes and political inclinations. She held her sedate pace until she'd reached the dimly lit side street where her hired carriage awaited her. Erolyn tossed a couple of coins to the driver and cut the traces that held her own mare to the carriage. She hiked up her skirts and leaped onto the horse's back. The mare seemed to sense her mistress's urgency, for she fairly flew over the streets that led to the assassin's guildhouse. Normally, Erolyn would have gone back to a safe room to change from her disguise and would have made several additional stops to distract any who might make a connection between the rarefied world of high society and the guild of hired killers. She dared not take time for such precautions now. At dusk, the assassins of Zazaspur gathered to bid on the new assignments that were posted nightly. If this ballad had been widely sung, Danilo's name might well be among them. Chapter 7 Erolyn left the Assassin's Council Hall with a large gold coin clamped in her fist and dread chilling her heart. The situation was worse than she had feared. The damning tavern song had spread through the city like lice, and a commission had been placed upon the life of the bard mentioned in the ballad. Unlike most assignments, this one offered a fee to all and sundry who wished to take up the challenge. A half-dozen fighters had been hired to ensure that no single assassin removed the paper and hoarded the assignment for himself. Apparently speed was of more concern than money. There were many wealthy men and women in Tethir who would pay dearly to swiftly eliminate even the possibility of Harper involvement in their multi-layered affairs. Danilo's name had not been mentioned on the pronouncement, but Erolyn knew that the highly skilled assassins of the guild would not need much time to discover his identity. The fact that she had been the first to read the pronouncement did little to ease her mind. She hurried to her room in the women's guildhouse, changed into her working clothes, and quickly packed her saddlebags with the things she needed for her mission. It was unlikely she would have an opportunity to return. Without a backward glance at the complex that had been her home for several months, Erolyn rode as swiftly as she dared down the streets that led into the city's most fashionable quarter. Even so, she took a few twists and turns to make certain she was not being followed. Each one took her closer to the Purple Minotaur, the finest and most costly inn in all of Zazaspur. The half-elf reined her mare to a stop several blocks away from her destination, for she could hardly ride up to the white marble walls that surrounded the garden courtyard and present herself at the arched gate. Assassins were hardly respected in this city, 
but that regard did not extend to social settings. Many of the Minotaur's guests were wealthy and powerful men, likely recipients of an assassin's blade. The guards posted at the inn's gate were about as likely to give Erolin access to these guests as poultry farmers would be to invite a fox to dine at will among their hens. And so Erolin left her horse, and a handful of silver pieces, at a public stable in the care of an enterprising lad who had a talent for averting his eyes at precisely the right moment. While the boy tended to her mare, Erolin climbed the ladder that led into the stable's hayloft. A large pile of straw leaned against one wall. This she climbed to the top. The half-elf studied the rough ceiling carefully. Then she pulled her sword and used it to push open the nearly invisible trap door. She leaped up and grabbed the edge. Quickly, she hauled herself up and crawled out onto the flat, tiled roof of the stable. After replacing the trap door, Erolin stood and surveyed the many levels of the city laid out before her. The rooftops of Zazespur offered a landscape of their own. Here were paths well worn by the feet of those who did business in darkness. Although she had been in the city but a few months, Erolin knew these pathways as well as most of Zazespur's citizens knew the streets. Between her and the soaring palace known as the Purple Minotaur lay a fest hall, two taverns, the homes of several shopkeepers, the stables that served the posh inn, and the humble dwellings used for the servants and slaves who tended the pampered guests. With practiced ease, Erolin made her way from rooftop to rooftop. As she neared the Purple Minotaur, she glanced toward the upper floors of the inn and noticed that Danilo's window was flung open to admit the summer night's breeze, and possibly in the hope of an unexpected visit. From the open window wafted the gentle strains of a lute accompanying a well-trained tenor voice. Erolin's first response was relief. Danilo was yet safe. For a moment she paused to listen to the faint song and the carefree singer who seemed far removed from the sordid reality of the squalid streets. For some reason this solidified Erolin's resolve. What she intended to do this night would not be easy but it was a needed thing. A sliver of new moon rose high into the sky as Erolin crept across the roof of the purple minotaur, but its feeble light was veiled by the thick sea mist that settled in with the coming of night. On the street far below, dim circles of light clung to the street lanterns, and faint light spilled from the windows of the fest halls and gambling parlors on the lower floors of the building. But where she trod, all was darkness. Danilo's chamber was only two floors down from the roof, a location chosen to allow Erolin to make her infrequent visits with discretion. Indeed, her slender figure was barely discernible against the dark sky. The pale skin of her face had been smudged with dark ointment, and she wore the garb of an assassin, leggings and a loose shirt of an indistinct dark hue that seemed to absorb shadow. In the mist-laden air her black curls clung to her head in damp tendrils, and her only ornament was the sash of pale gray silk at her waist. Erolin took a rope of spider silk from her pack and affixed one end firmly to the nearest chimney. She crept to the roof's edge and counted carefully down the rope's knotted length. Holding the rope firmly, she backed up, took a few running steps, and flung herself as far out into the darkness as she could. As she dropped, she braced herself, accepted the jolting tug that came when the rope snapped taut. Then she swung like a pendulum toward the open window, shifting her weight a bit to adjust her course. At the last possible moment, she pulled up into a tight tuck. The agile half-elf cleared the window. In one smooth move, she released the rope and pulled a dagger from her boot, and then landed in a crouch. Her blue eyes swept the room, checking for danger. Satisfied that all was well, she stood and faced her harper partner. The young nobleman had apparently expected her, for he stood facing the window, a smile of welcome lighting his gray eyes, and a goblet of elverquist in each hand. Erolin had known Danilo Than for almost three years now, but she had yet to reconcile herself to the disparity between his public persona and the man she had come to know. 
Few saw him as anything more than the youngest son of a Waterdavian noble, a dandy and a dilettante who dabbled in magic and music. It took a keen ear to hear the artistry beneath the bawdy little ballads he composed, a sharp eye to note the ease with which he tossed off his miscast spells. But few people were inclined to seek deeply, and as a handsome charmer blessed with a noble's rank and a merchant's heavy purse, Danilo was welcomed in circles that a half-elven assassin could not hope to enter. Although Erelin recognized the worth of this disguise, the contrast between Danilo's appearance and his true nature did not, for one moment, cease to irritate her. As was his recent custom, he was clad entirely in shades of purple, the traditional color of Tethir, and bedecked with a small fortune in gold and amethyst jewelry. Erelin had told him more than once that this affectation made him look like a walking grape, but in truth the opulent color suited him well. Everything about the young man in his setting bespoke wealth, ease, and privilege. The room behind him was vast and luxurious, although a bit cluttered with the trappings of his public and personal endeavors. One long table was heavily laden with goblets and bottles of fine wine, a testament to his current role as a member of Tethir's Guild of Wine Merchants. Spellbooks were scattered across a reading table of Chulton Teak, and the small crystal scrying globe on the table near the window was but one of many magic devices that protected the room and its occupant. The chamber's hand-knotted carpet, rendered in shades of purple, of course, was heaped with tapestry pillows. Lying among them was the lute Danilo had set aside, an exquisite instrument inlaid with darker woods and mother-of-pearl. Beside the lute was his sword belt, which held not only his rapier, but an ancient sword in a bejeweled scabbard. A magic weapon, Erolin guessed, noting the distinctive curved pommel that marked it as a sword of Halruin make. All this she took in with a single sweeping glance. Noted, too, was the sudden intense flash, quickly hidden, that came into the young man's eyes as his gaze swept over her. Erolin knew her partner's perception and attention to detail at least equaled her own, and for a moment she wondered what he saw in a disheveled, too thin, half-elven assassin that could kindle such a flame. "'Lovely night for second-story work,' Danilo observed in a casual tone as he handed her a goblet. That jump was most impressive, but tell me, have you ever miscalculated the rope's length? Erolin shook her head, then absently tossed back the contents of her goblet. We're leaving Tethir, she stated, plunking her empty goblet down on Danilo's table. He placed his own goblet beside hers. Oh? he asked warily. Someone has placed a bounty on your head. Erolin said in a grim tone as she handed him the heavy gold coin. These were given to any assassin willing to take on the job, one hundred more to whoever makes the kill. Danilo hefted the coin in a practiced hand and then let out a long, low whistle. The coin was about three times the normal trade weight. The amount Erolin had named was a substantial sum, one likely to tempt even high-ranking assassins to take on the assignment but the young harper did not seem concerned by the danger. He examined the gold piece with the detachment of a coin collector, running admiring fingers over the embossed pattern of runes and symbols. It would seem I'm attracting a better class of enemies these days, he observed wryly. Listen to me, Erolin snapped, clasping both his forearms and giving him a little shake. I heard someone singing your ballad about the harper assassin. Merciful Millil, he swore softly, and Erolin saw understanding dawning in his eyes. Danilo had written the ballad about their first adventure together. He hadn't performed it in over two years, and certainly had the sense not to sing it in Tethir. Although the song did not identify him as a harper, even a mention of those meddling northern barbarians could create a good deal of resentment and suspicion in this troubled land. Woven into the ballad were hints concerning Danilo's identity, and the careful listener could soon ascertain that the hero and the composer were one. 
He had written the song to convince Erolin that he was a vain and vapid courtier, and it had effectively served its purpose. But the fact that it was being sung here in Tethir would force a rapid end to their mission. The young harper contemplated the loss of all this work with a rueful smile. The locals express their musical preferences rather forcefully, wouldn't you say? He commented lightly. Before Erolin could draw breath for an exasperated rejoinder, Danilo silenced her with an apologetic smile and an uplifted hand. I'm sorry, my dear. Force of habit. You're right, of course. We must ride north at once. No. She reached out and touched one of Danilo's rings, a magical gift from his uncle, Kelvin Aronson, that could teleport up to three people back to the safety of Blackstaff Tower, or elsewhere if the wielder so chose. Erolin hated magical travel. In her mind, it was a choice of last resort. The knowledge of this was written clearly in Danilo's eyes. Understanding her urgency, he quickly donned his sword belt and affixed to it the magic bag that held his wardrobe and travel supplies. He added three spellbooks to the bag and then absently dropped in the assassin's coin. With one hand he snatched up his loot, with the other he reached out to Erolin. She took a step backward and shook her head. I'm not coming with you. Erolin, this is no time to be squeamish. It's not that. She took a deep breath, for the words were harder to say than she had imagined possible. Word came from Waterdeep. I've been assigned another mission. I leave in the morning. Danilo's eyes widened. For a moment, Erolin glimpsed in them the poignant longing that he was so careful to hide from her. Then, deftly, his expression changed to portray the peak of a spoiled nobleman who was unaccustomed to events that strayed from the path of his preference. His eyes betrayed nothing but incredulity that the master harpers would presume to separate them. It was a fine performance. Erolin, however, was not fooled. But before she could speak, the alarm on Danilo's magical scrying globe began to pulse again. The half-elf snatched up the crystal and peered into it. The scene within showed three shadowy figures moving toward the edge of the roof, just two stories above them. Some of Erolin's colleagues were coming to collect their prize. She tossed the alarm aside and cast a glance toward the open window and the nearly invisible rope outside. There's no time to explain, she told him. Go! But Danilo, who had also taken a good look into the crystal, shook his head. And leave you to face them alone? Not bloody likely. Erolin attempted a smile and touched the gray silk sash that proclaimed her rank among Tethir's assassins. I'm one of them, remember? I'll say that you were gone. No one will challenge me. Of course they will, he snapped, for he well knew how Tethir's assassins rose through the ranks. Erolin was aware that her partner had paid out large sums to keep apprised of her dark and solitary path. She'd been able to keep news of many of her adventures from him, but he knew she'd been forced more than once to defend her reluctantly worn sash from ambitious fellow assassins. There were three of them now, and if she was alone, they would almost certainly seize the opportunity to attack her. Which of them would eventually possess her shadow sash would be a matter they'd settle among themselves at a later time. The rope she'd left hanging outside Danilo's window began to sway as someone inched down it toward his room. Go, Erolin pleaded. Come with me, he demanded in an implacable tone. The half-elf shook her head, cursing the streak of steel that hid behind Danilo's foppish persona. She knew it well and knew also that there was little chance of reasoning with him once his mind was set. Predictably enough, the harper tossed aside his priceless loot without thought or care and pulled her into his arms. If you think I'd leave you, you're a bigger fool than I am, he said quickly, angrily, his words racing against the approaching danger. This is hardly the moment I'd have chosen to mention this, but damn it, woman, I love you. I know. Erolin replied softly, clinging to him in turn. For a single, intense second, she let her eyes speak her heart. Then she eased out of his arms and lifted one hand to stroke his cheek. 
It was the first such acknowledgement, the first caressing gesture she had ever offered him. His eyes darkened as he cupped her hand in both of his and pressed her fingers to his lips in a fervent kiss, leaving his midsection conveniently unguarded. Erolyn doubled her free hand into a fist and drove it hard into a point slightly below his ribcage. Danilo folded and went down like a felled oak. As the winded nobleman struggled to draw breath, the half-elf stooped and twisted the ring of teleportation on his hand that would send him back to Waterdeep and safety. He lunged for her wrist, obviously intending to drag her along, but Erolyn was already on her feet. The moonblade, glowing the intense blue that warned of approaching battle, hissed free from her scabbard as Danilo faded from view, one hand outstretched for her and naked anguish written on his face. Although she'd seen no other way to save her would-be lover, Erolyn's necessary act of treachery left her feeling shaken and strangely empty. She took a long, ragged breath and turned to face the trio of Tetherian assassins, feeling a certain grim comfort at the thought of impending battle. That, at least, was something she understood. Chapter 8 the spider silk rope swayed as Ferret worked her way down toward the harper's open window, cursing silently as she went. The female assassin had encountered many frustrations during her sojourn in Zazaspur, not the least of which was the odd fact that under Pasha Balak's rule, men enjoyed social dominance. It was, in her opinion, a folly beyond comprehension. Ferret only hoped this bit of stupidity didn't cause her to lose her quarry. Had she gone first, she'd be down already, and her task would be done. But no, the two men had to precede her. For a moment, Ferret entertained the idea of stomping on the head of the man below her and knocking him off the rope. She would have done so gladly, but for the fact that he was unlikely to oblige her by falling to his death in silence. Indeed, only the need for stealth had kept her from battling the two other assassins who had converged on the rooftop with such inconvenient speed. All three had realized the folly of such action, and they'd agreed to cooperate for a quick kill and a share of the reward. But once they were all within Danilothan's chamber, Ferret would gladly turn her blade against them to defend the man she had been hired to kill. Perhaps doing so would pique the harper's interest and convince him to listen to her tale and perhaps to help her. Seeking aid from humans and harpers, Ferret could think of no surer sign of her desperation than this. But what else was she to do? Her skills were many and considerable, but there were things at work in Zazaspur that she simply could not comprehend. A chance-heard tavern song had sparked an idea, who better to solve this puzzle than a harper, a member of that legendary tribe of spies, informants, and meddlers? It was unfortunate that a contract had been placed upon this particular harper, for if Danilothan bred true to type, he would surely be able to find his way to the source of the problem. That was all Ferret needed. She knew what had to be done, but she needed to know who to do it to. At last, the first of the male assassins ducked in through the harper's window. Ferret heard his startled oath and then the first bright clash of steel on steel. She prodded the man below her with her boot. Hurry, or Samir will make the kill by himself and claim the full reward, she demanded, speaking the words most likely to coax haste from the assassin. Her reasoning was sound. The avaricious man slid the rest of the way down the rope and virtually dove into the room. With her way now clear, Ferret let go of the rope and fell the last several feet. As she passed the open window, she grabbed the sill and pulled herself up to it with all her might. She tumbled through, tucked her head down, rolled into the room, and came up on her feet, a long dagger already in her hand. Ready, or so she thought, for anything. The sight before her stole her breath and froze her feet to the lush carpet. An eldritch blue light filled the room, tossing the dancing shadows of three fighters against every wall of the chamber. The source of the light was a living moonblade, 
and it was held in the two hands of a half-elven assassin. Like a hero from some ancient elven legend, Erelyn stood firm against her two attackers, beating back every thrust and slash of their wickedly curved scimitars. Her magical sword flashed and spun, leaving dizzy ribbons of blue light to mark its path. A moonblade, Ferret thought dazedly. A true, living moonblade. She knew the half-elf carried such a sword and even presumed to take her name from it, but Ferret had assumed the weapon had been dormant for centuries and that Erolin had purchased it from some ignorant peddler or plundered it from some ancient elven tomb. Moonblades were hereditary swords of fearsome magic, and according to legend, none but moon elves of true blood and noble spirit could wield them. To see such a weapon in the hands of a half-elf and a hired killer raised implications that staggered Ferret's imagination. Just then, Erolin's blazing eyes settled on the new intruder. Instinctively, Ferret lifted her dagger into a defensive position. Just in time, with the speed of a striking snake, the half-elf whirled on the nearest man and fainted high. As he lifted his blade, she spun away in a quick, tight circle and then ducked in under her opponent's defensive parry. She lunged past him toward the female assassin, her glowing sword leading with deadly intent. The elven sword struck Ferret's parrying dagger with a force that sent bright sparks of pain dancing up her arm to explode in her head like festival fireworks. The half-elf's intent was apparent. In a battle against greater odds, it was wise to eliminate the most dangerous opponent first, and quickly. In some corner of her mind, Ferret reminded herself that a moonblade could not shed innocent blood. She was not, however, convinced of her safety. The path she had taken was a needed thing, but it may have tarnished her in the sentient sword's perception. Fortunately for her, the two men recovered from their surprise and closed in on the half-elf. They charged at her, scimitars aloft, fueling their attack with yells of bloodlust. Without turning, Erolin lifted her moonblade high overhead and met the first downward strike. At the same time she kicked forward, her booted foot caught Ferret in the gut with a force that folded the smaller female over and sent her staggering back into a table. In the next heartbeat, the half-elf pivoted, using the momentum of her turn to press the joined blades toward the second attacker. The three swords met with a ringing clash. Erolin pulled hers free of the tangle and danced back, her gaze again settled upon the female. Ferret saw her own death in the half-elf's eyes and knew that her next action would either be brilliant or it would be her last. The ache in the assassin's lower ribs gave her inspiration. She bit down hard on the inside of her cheek, hard enough to draw blood. Pressing one hand against her ribcage, Ferret let out a groan. As she did, bloody foam spilled onto her lips. She wiped it off, regarded her hand with dawning horror, and then fixed a venomous glare upon the half-elf. Slowly, she slid down, the table's edge scraping her back, until she lay crumpled on the floor, clutching her ribs and moaning softly. Seeing that the female was down for good, Erolin turned away to face the other assassins. Ferret was not surprised that the half-elf accepted her performance as genuine. In her time as an assassin, Ferret had seen enough men die in enough ways to know exactly what the process looked like. A kick like that could have broken a rib, which in turn could have pierced a lung. Death by drowning was the inevitable, albeit slow, result of such an injury. But what did surprise Ferret was the flash of compassion that came into Erolin Moonblade's eyes as she realized the manner of death she had dealt. It was just as well for Ferret that the half-elf was otherwise engaged, or she might well have granted her fallen adversary a quick and merciful end. Better die quickly, Ferret admonished herself with a touch of grim humor. Lying as still as she could, the assassin closed her eyes to mere slits and watched the battle from beneath the thick curtain of her lashes. Ferret had to admit that her half-elven enemy was brilliant in battle. She had never seen anyone who possessed a surer knowledge of the sword. Yet much of what Erolin did seemed to be pure instinct. 
She seemed to sense when and how the next strike would come, and she was quick enough to keep a step ahead of both her opponents. In fact, the speed and force of her strike seemed all out of proportion with her size. Granted, the half-elf was tall, and her slender form had an elf's surprising resilience and strength, but those things could not account for the power of her fighting. Ferret wondered what secrets lay behind the glowing aura of the half-elf's moonblade. Just then, Erolin's sword dove in past Samir's guard and buried itself in his throat. She pulled the moonblade down hard, thrusting deeper as she went, sweeping through bone and sinew with terrifying ease. Ferret suppressed a wince as the elven blade cleaved the man from gizzard to groin. Seeing an opportunity in his comrade's death, the other man grinned wolfishly and raised his scimitar high overhead for the killing strike. To add force to the blow, and perhaps in unconscious imitation of his half-elven foe, he gripped the blade with both hands and began the downward slash. But his intended victim had other plans. Erolin tore the blade free of the assassin's body and continued its downward cut. The sword gained momentum as she traced a sweeping circle back and around. As the elven sword reached the zenith of its swing, Erolin spun to face the surviving assassin and stepped hard into the attack. The two blades met with a shriek of metal. Erolin ducked aside instinctively as jagged shards flew from the man's ruined scimitar. With a hiss of rage, the assassin lunged at her with the ragged stub of blade that remained to him, apparently hoping to catch her while she was still off balance. The half-elf nimbly sidestepped the attack. She pivoted in a quick circle and brought the flat of her sword down hard on the man's outstretched arm, striking him just below the elbow. Immediately, she dropped to one knee, using the moon blade as a lever and forcing the man's elbow to bend down. The jagged end of his blade turned upward. The momentum of his charge did the rest. The assassin stumbled forward as the broken scimitar plunged through his own throat. Erolin rose, sliding the bloody moon blade from the crook of the dead man's arm. The sword's magical blue fire slowly faded away, apparently quenched by the blood it had shed. The half-elf stooped and wiped the blade clean on the fallen assassin's shirt, then slid the sword firmly into its ancient scabbard. Without a backward glance, she turned and strode to the open window. She climbed up the rope, hand over hand, and disappeared into the night sky. For several silent moments, Ferret lay where she had fallen, busily sorting through all she had seen. Very little of it made sense to her. Erolin was half-elven, yet she possessed a moon blade. She had taken an assassin's path, yet the sword continued to do her bidding. Was it possible the sword's magic had somehow been perverted to evil? Or was Erolin, like Ferret herself, something very different from what she appeared to be? And what of Denilothan? According to the intelligence Ferret had gathered, the nobleman was in the purple minotaur. Minutes before, she herself had heard his voice lifted in song. Where, then, had he gone? And what part did Erolin play in this mystery? Of one thing Ferret was certain. She needed the harper and if he was still within her reach, she would find him. It grated on the proud female that the key to her success seemed to be in the hands of the half-breed fighter. When she judged the time to be right, Ferret rose and crept silently to the window. The rope was gone, of course, and so was the half-elf. No matter. Ferret was no stranger to climbing, and her slender, nimble fingers could find a hold in nearly any surface. She was also a hunter who could track a hare through the densest thicket or follow a squirrel's path through the forest canopy. No mere half-elf could elude her, not even in the relatively unfamiliar terrain of this crowded human city. Setting her jaw in a determined angle, the female slipped from the window and followed Erolin out into the night. A dream! muttered Prince Hashath, trying to dismiss the faint, insistent thumping that roused him from slumber. He rolled over and buried deeper into his pillows, imperiously willing sleep to return and the annoying dream to vanish. 
But no, there was that sound again, and it was coming from the secret door that led into his chamber. Hashath listened and recognized the rhythm of an agreed-upon signal. Grumbling and still drowsy, he batted aside the filmy curtains surrounding his bed. He stumbled over to the hearth and pressed the latch hidden among the stones. As he expected, the half-elven harper burst into the room as the heavy door swung open. Judging from the look in her eyes and the grim set of her face, Hasheth doubted that she had come to take him up on his offer of an evening's entertainment. It's time, Erlen said. I leave Zazespur now. First thing in the morning, Hasheth agreed, responding to the urgency in her voice. No, now. The prince threw both hands into the air and cast an exasperated glare skyward, but he knew better than to argue with Erlen Moonblade. Young though he might be, he was quickly learning how to measure the men and the women around him. Hashath would no sooner try to reason with this headstrong woman than he would attempt to discuss philosophy with a camel. And he had agreed to help her. He'd even seen to most of the preparations. Honoring his word was important. Hasheth knew that the measure of a man was not necessarily the sharpness of his blade or his wit, not the sum of the wealth he possessed or the rank he could claim. The true measure of a man was the weight his word carried. Someday Hasheth planned to wield enough power to send men into frenzied compliance to his every command. For the present, and with this woman, he wished to be known as a man of honor a trusted and important part of her interesting, clandestine plans. And besides, Lord Hune had bid him to gain the trust of the Harpers. Hasheth reached for a bell pull and gave it an imperious tug. A young servant appeared promptly at the door, rubbing sleep from his eyes. The prince handed the lad a sealed note. Explanations were not needed. The servant had been schooled at great length and knew precisely what must be done. The note would go to another contact, who would set in motion a well-planned chain of events. Hasheth had been a willing apprentice to the harper, and he had learned much. The boat? she demanded. All is in readiness, the prince assured her. I will slip from the palace, get one of the horses I've boarded at the public stable, and ride for the southern gate. When it opens at dawn, we will both join a certain trade caravan and ride south to the Seldaskun River. I, as a representative of Hewn's shipping interests, you, dressed as a courtesan employed to sweeten my journey. When we reach the river, you will slip away. After the caravan's alleged business is completed, I will see your mare safely to the tinker's hidden lair, while you travel upriver to a destination that you have not seen fit to share with your trusted ally. Erolin responded to this recitation only with a curt nod of approval. To Hasheth's pointed attempt to pry information from her, she responded not at all. At dawn, then, she said, and ducked through the low doorway. Hasheth listened to the faint sound of her boots on the narrow stairs and marveled anew that she did not stumble and fall in the darkness. The door was hidden in the stone of the hearth that warmed his room on chill nights, and the tunnel itself was chiseled into the thick walls of the palace. He wondered what his father, the Pasha, would say if he knew that an assassin of Erolin's rank could enter the palace almost at will. Nothing good, Hasheth concluded with a tight smile. He closed the door and began his hasty preparations for the journey ahead. Of late, the Pasha had not had many good words to spare the restless young man, and had not been pleased with Hasheth's request to enter the service of Lord Hune. Yet in time he agreed to arrange it simply to silence his troublesome younger son. It amazed Hasheth that his father could not see the importance of such men as Hune, or the potential threat that their ambitions posed. He remembered the warning Erolin had given him, and he nodded his head in grim agreement. Pasha Balik's short but spectacular reign would soon come to an end. And that was as it should be. From his first encounter with Erolin he had learned an important lesson. Know your enemies. If Balik could not recognize his, then he deserved to fall from power. And he, Hasheth, 
would find a way to benefit from this eventuality. Perhaps, he concluded as he slipped beyond the palace gates, he would even help to bring the inevitable to pass. In the lush gardens that surrounded the palace grounds, nearly invisible among the branches of some exotic flowering tree, Ferret watched as the half-elf crept along the shadow of the palace wall. Erelyn lifted the vines that sheltered a section of wall and ran her fingers over the smooth stone. A door opened where none had been a moment before, sliding noiselessly to one side. It closed after her, and the vines fell back into place. Even to Ferret's keen eyes, there was no apparent outline, no sign that the hidden door was there. Perched in her tree, Ferret waited patiently until the half-elf had finished her meeting and slipped away into the night. And then she waited a bit longer. The mystery that was Erolyn Moonblade could not be solved in direct confrontation. Ferret would have to piece it together as best she could. She wanted to see who else emerged from the palace. To her surprise, the half-elf's contact was not a palace guard or a half-elven maidservant, but one of the lesser sons of the ruling Pasha. Ferret remembered the lad from his ill-fated attempt to learn the assassin's trade. Now that she thought of it, she remembered that Erolyn had entered the guildhouse shortly after Hasheth had left. She had not made a connection between the two. Apparently, she should have. Ferret crept along after the young prince. Following him was easy, for in this part of town lavish gardens were the norm, and the exotic flowering trees that lined the broad streets were so closely planted that their branches entwined. She was able to follow him for several blocks without her feet once touching the ground. At length he turned into a stable, emerging in moments on the back of a fine omnish stallion. Ferret grimaced. She herself did not like the idea of riding upon horses, but if the boy had far to go, following him on foot might prove to be difficult. The assassin climbed down to the street and crept into the stable. She silenced the stable hands, then quickly selected a likely-looking mare. She wrapped the animal's hooves to muffle the sound, and then, as quietly as she could, she led the horse from the stable. She climbed onto its bare back. She would ride if she had to, but no power beneath the stars could compel her to shackle an intelligent creature with saddle and bridle. Ferret seized the horse's mane and leaned forward, whispering a few words to her in the centaur language. Apparently the mare understood the gist of it, for her ears went back and she set off at a brisk pace in pursuit of Hashath's stallion. As the long night slipped away, the deep shadows of the forest began to fade to green, heralding the coming of dawn. The elven warriors who had survived the raid picked up their pace, for the death that pursued them would travel more swiftly with the coming of light. Exhausted, heartsick, bearing the marks of battle as well as their dead and wounded comrades, the elves retreated into their forest home. Their progress was slow, for they would not abandon their wounded and take to the trees, and they feared what use might be made of the slain elven folk. Word had reached them that Sparrow's body had been placed among the slaughtered humans of a northbound caravan, and that his arrows had been used against the merchants. The distant yapping of hunting hounds lifted into a triumphant, baying howl. They have found a blood trail, Koragash noted grimly. He shifted the limp body of an elven male that he carried across his shoulders as a hunter might carry a slain deer. Foxfire nodded, and his eyes fell upon the face of the girl he carried in his arms. Hawkwing, her name was. A new name Tamara had bestowed upon the girl to mark her acceptance into a new tribe. It suited her well. She had fought like a cornered falcon and brought down several of the humans before a coward's dagger took her through the back from the back. She would survive, Foxfire repeated silently, staring into her pain-bright black eyes and willing her to live. The tribe had need of courage and spirit such as this child possessed. Tamara had claimed Hawkwing into the Oakstaff clan. 
She would raise the girl, but Foxfire would train her. He knew a war leader when he saw one. Hawkwing stirred in his arms and met his intense gaze. Put me down, she said in a barely audible whisper. Flee! We are too few to fight, and the people cannot bear to lose more this night than have already fallen. She is right, Korrigash said softly. But Foxfire shook his head. Quickly he took stock of the forces remaining. The prospects were not good. Twenty and four of the elves from Tall Trees could still run or fight, but only two of the rescued elves could walk without assistance. The elves carried three dead and several who were gravely wounded. There was not one among them who had escaped injury entirely. They could not stand and fight. Not as they were. He turned to Tamara. You are the fastest among us. Take word to Tall Trees. We need as many warriors as can be spared to meet us in the Fenlands south of here. The female nodded, seeing at once the wisdom of this plan. The elves needed to rest and treat their wounded, and no nearby haven was better for this than the low-lying fens. Always dark and cool, in this valley the forest lay under a thick mantle of mist. The massive trunks of several ancient cedars, trees that no longer lived and grew, but whose roots still held firm, had been hollowed out to make emergency shelters. Healing plants grew in abundance, and if the humans followed them so far, they would find a battleground not at all to their liking. The soil was soft, in some places dangerously boggy, and the ground was densely covered with large, fern-like plants large enough to reach an elf's shoulder. We must do what we can to hold back pursuit, Foxfire added. You, Eldrin, Sontar, Windilu, take to the trees and circle back. Hunt down the dogs. Stop them, and you have stopped the humans. Harry the men and herd them toward the north. Green arrows only, he admonished them. And you, Tamsin, he said, turning to the young fighter whose leathers were dark with blood, none of which was his own. Foxfire dared not send this one after the humans. After this night's battle, Tamsin was as blood-ravenous as a troll. Go straight north, into the caves that lie beyond the Ashenwood. Awaken the young white dragon who slumbers there and lure her out after you. Lead her to the humans. See that she is fully engaged with them. Then take to the trees and return to us. A savage grin spread across the younger elf's face as he visualized the results of his leader's plan. And I will leave bundles of winter mint in the dragon's lair, that she may later cleanse the foul taste of the humans from her tongue. The elven warriors melted into the forest to do their leader's bidding. Korrigash turned to his friend. Good plan, but is this enough to stop them? For now? Perhaps, Foxfire said in a low tone. But not for long. Chapter 9 each morning at dawn, the massive gates of Zazaspur swung open to admit the flow of commerce that was the city's lifeblood. The city's coffers benefited from tariffs placed on exotic goods that passed through on their way north from Kalimshan and points east. But the markets of Zazaspur were much more than a stopping place for merchant caravans. The people of Tethir took great pride in their craftsmanship, and their goods were in great demand in lands to the north and south. Into the city poured the raw materials that ships and overland caravans brought from all over the known world. Chulton teak and Mazdakan rosewood were fashioned into the carved wooden boxes for which Tethir was famed, and delicate contraptions of gears and tiny chimes came from Lantern to transform some of these boxes into wondrous musical toys. Fine metals from the icy Northlands were brought into the city to be worked into vessels and armor and jewelry. Gems to be set into sword hilts or ladies' rings. Tetherian furniture was prized for its durability and elegant lines. For sheer practicality, Miratman fabrics were considered second to none. A cloak woven from the wool of the sheep that grazed the purple hills often lasted long enough to be handed down from father to son, 
and few were the weavers outside to Thier who could spin thread so fine that the results were nearly waterproof. Another form of commerce, also important to the city's well-being if somewhat less glamorous, was the trading for foodstuffs grown in the fertile purple hills south of the city. Daily caravans traveled between Zazaspur and Marakir, the farmer's market located at the intersection of the tradeway with the Saldaskun River, to purchase fruit and grain and mutton. It was an important task, but a routine one, and therefore one that seldom fell under close scrutiny. And so it was that Quentin Lorish, the captain of one such caravan, was none too happy to be awakened from his slumber and informed that Lord Hune's new apprentice would be riding along on the day's trip. Not that Quentin had anything against Hune, far from it. The lord and guildmaster paid well, and he treated the men and women in his employ with a degree of fairness unusual in Tethir, which made him quite popular among the people, and purchased loyalty more surely than would coin. At least, fair treatment worked that way with most men. Quentin, frankly, preferred hard silver. Quentin was not a man overly constrained by the bounds of loyalty or by a compulsion for honest dealing. He was not above skimming a thicker layer of cream from the caravan's daily profits than that to which he was strictly entitled. The thought of a young and eager apprentice looking over his shoulder and thumbing through his books made Quentin's stomach burn with the pain that was becoming his constant companion. And so, as he watched over the caravan's pre-dawn preparations and waited for the city's gates to open, Quentin sipped at a large flask of goat's milk mixed with some chalky mineral that he could not identify. It was a vile concoction, but according to the local alchemist it would in time soothe his sour stomach. If it did not, vowed Quentin grimly as he downed the last of the swill, he would gladly spend every copper of this day's profit to have the wretched alchemist slain, preferably death by drowning in goat's milk. "'Captain Quentin?' inquired an imperious voice to his left. "'I am Hasheth, here on behalf of Lord Hune.' The man let out a mighty, chalk-scented belch, and turned to regard his dreaded passenger. Hune's apprentice was a young man— probably not yet twenty years of age, maybe a by-blow of the Lord himself, judging from that dark hair, though the lad's curved nose and sun-browned skin suggested a bit of calashite blood. Well, that was common enough in Zazaspur these days, what with the Pasha and all. It was fashionable among society folk to keep a southern woman as mistress, or so Quentin had heard tell. He himself had to make do with a wife, his own, unfortunately. "'Welcome aboard, lad,' he said with a heartiness he certainly did not feel. "'We'll be on our way with the dawn. Pick any horse that catches your fancy, then I'll show you what's what.' "'That will hardly be necessary,' Hasheth said, his lip curled with disdain. He gestured to a covered carriage pulled by paired chestnuts, beautiful, fine-boned animals whose glossy red-brown coats had been groomed to the sheen of fine sable. The carriage horses were all the more striking for the fact that they were nearly identical, even to the white stars on their foreheads. To add excess to opulence, a magnificent black stallion and a long-legged gray mare were tied behind the carriage. As you can see, I have brought my own conveyance as well as additional horses, should I choose to ride. As for your business, you do it well enough to suit my lord Hune, and that is good enough for me the lad continued coolly. I am required to be here as part of my education, so let us strike a deal. If you are asked, you will report that I observed you closely. If I am asked, I will say that all I observed was in order. There was a slight edge to Hasheth's voice, a shrewd, almost smug nuance that hinted the young man already knew far too much about the caravan's affairs. Quentin darted a look at the lad, hoping he'd heard wrong. In response, Hasheth lifted a single eyebrow in unmistakable challenge. The banked flame in Quentin's gut flared up hot and high, sending a surge of acid up into his throat. Agreed, the captain muttered, wishing mightily that he could spit without offending the lordly young man. 
Hasheth nodded again to the carriage and to the veiled woman who peeked out from behind one curtain. You need not bother yourself with me. As you can see, I have brought a diversion to sweeten the journey, which brings us to another matter. The lady has a delicate skin and a desire to see the marketplace before the heat of high sun. I understand this requires an unusually brisk pace, but my own desires would be well served by indulging hers. May I tell her that you will accommodate us? Quentin merely nodded, for his throat was feeling too raw for speech. He watched as the imperious youth climbed into the carriage and pulled the curtain firmly shut. Then he shook his head and strode away to tend to the caravan. He was not at all certain what to make of this strange encounter or of the young apprentice who saw far too much. When at last the morning sun broke over the distant peaks of the star spires, the mighty gate swung slowly inward. By the time the caravan started off on its journey at an extremely brisk pace as requested, Quentin was feeling much better, quite chipper, in fact. He'd often worried about discovery, but now that it had come, he found it to be a relief. Although Quentin took his orders from Hune's people, he had no window into the Lord's affairs and no way of knowing how his own actions might be perceived, or which of them might have come before Hune's eyes. This Hasheth was bright enough to uncover Quentin's embezzlement. Surely he could also manage to keep it from prying eyes. And better still, the lad was ready to deal. Quentin felt certain that he could persuade Hasheth to provide him a bit of protection, plus maybe pass along a bit of information from time to time that would help the caravan captain gild the inside of his pockets. Yes, he concluded happily. Hune's newest apprentice was someone with whom he could do business, to the profit of both. Did I choose my man well? Hasheth inquired in a smug tone. Erelyn nodded, perfectly willing to give the young man his due. From all that she had seen and heard, Quentin Lorish was a perfect choice, one who would no doubt continue to serve Hasheth in a dependable, if dishonorable, fashion. In fact, her departure from Zazespur had gone more smoothly than Erelyn would have thought possible. Every step of the agreed-upon plan had been flawlessly executed. Hasheth was good and getting better by the day. Why, then, did she feel so ill at ease? With a sigh, Erelyn leaned back into the cushions and steeled herself for a long morning's ride. She was none too happy about spending several hours in inactivity, with nothing to absorb her but her own troubled thoughts. Too much had happened of late. Too many revelations had been thrust upon her, more than she could possibly sort through between Zazespur and the Seldaskun. Erelyn liked to deal with problems as they arose, quickly, cleanly, decisively, with diplomacy, if possible, and with swift violence, when necessary. Yet she had been forced to ignore her nature, her accustomed methods, and her own better judgment to tend to the Elven Queen's commission. So here she was, bound for the Elven Forest and burdened with someone else's problems, while her own life was in utter disarray. Her ancestor slept in some rich man's vault, and Erelyn had done nothing to redress this dishonor. Danilo had declared his love for her, and she had decked him and sent him packing without so much as taking time to consider what her own eventual response should be. Then there was the matter of the elf shadow and the bleak future that it foretold. Erelyn could not forget for a moment the destiny inherent in the moon blade she carried, and the unwitting vow she had made so many years ago when first she drew the elven sword. The half-elf had never before feared death, but she could not help but feel her mortality. She was headed toward an extremely dangerous mission, bearing a sword that would in all likelihood claim her in eternal servitude. To say that this added a note of urgency to her quest, Erelyn concluded dryly, was something of an understatement. All told, the half-elf was in no mood to parry Hasheth's inevitable advances with anything approaching diplomacy. 
Indeed, it would take every shred of self-control that she possessed to keep from tossing the young man out onto the roadside with his first manipulative compliment, his first double entendre. But either the gods took pity upon her, or Hasheth was beginning to learn in this matter as well. The morning passed without incident. Indeed, Hasheth kept Erelin so busy with his questions that she had no time to contemplate the troubling path before her. The young prince was full to overbrimming with questions about Harper ways and the foes that the Harpers faced. He was also eager to learn everything of Tetherian history and politics that Erelin had to share, and was curious about the affairs of other lands as well. Apparently the palace saw no need to include matters of state in the education of a thirteenth-born son. Erelin gave each question a terse but complete answer, and she noted that Hasheth listened well, an important skill for a harper informant. It was plain that the young man enjoyed taking part in the activities of this clandestine group, and that he reveled in intrigue and secrecy. He was also justly proud of his growing skill in devising and putting into place complex plans. But Erelin was also aware that Hasheth's main tie with the Harpers was not personal conviction or even a respect for the Harpers and their ideals, but a sense of obligation to her and to Danilo. Now that they had both left the city behind, she was not so certain that Hasheth would continue in this role. And what will you do with all this knowledge? She asked him at last. Hasheth shrugged, taking her question at face value. Knowledge is a tool. I will use it for whatever task comes to hand. A good answer, Erelin admitted, but hardly a reassuring one. In all, she was not sorry when the distant clamor of voices and carts announced that they were nearing Marakir. Slipping away from the caravan was an easy matter. In her skirts and veil, with her well-draped travel packs adding a matronly bulk to her frame, Erelin blended in with the matriarchs and chatelines who came to purchase supplies for their families or their business establishments. For a while she wandered among the busy stalls, tapping melons and pinching cherries with the best of them. Finally, she found the place she sought, Teresa's Fine Woolens, a large wooden stall that offered ready-made clothes. The establishment had a prosperous air, as well as a prime location right next to the river, but Teresa's reputation for high prices kept away all but the most affluent buyers. Inside the shop, Erelin found an assortment of serviceable but quite unremarkable garments, woolen cloaks, trues, gowns, and shawls, as well as shirts of linen or linsey woolsey. The cost of the garments, Teresa insisted, reflected the quality and the service. The casual patron might assume that by services, she meant the helpful shop clerks who offered advice and refreshments, or the curtained booths, each walled with silvered glass, that enabled the patrons to dress with privacy. What was not commonly known was that the mirrors were actually hidden doors that allowed well-informed patrons to slip out the back. Leaving her cumbersome skirts, as well as a small bag of silver coins, in the changing booth, Erelin left Teresa's and slid down the steep incline of the riverbank. A small skiff awaited her there, further evidence of the discreet services Teresa offered. The harper settled into the boat and nodded to the two burly servants who manned the oars. One of them flicked loose the rope that secured the craft to a post driven into the shoreline. Then the men leaned into the oars in well-practiced unison, and the little boat lurched out into the river. Erelin noted with approval that the oarsmen displayed an admirable lack of curiosity. They spared her hardly a glance, so intent were they on maneuvering through the heavy river traffic. It took all their considerable skill to dodge the many skiffs and flatboats and small, single-sailed boats that thronged the busy waterway. Once they were beyond the crush and turmoil of the marketplace, the men settled in and set a straight, hard-pulling course upriver. The Sulda Schoon was Tethir's largest river, stretching nearly the entire breadth of the country. From its origins in the foothills of the Snowflake Mountains, the river traveled over 500 miles until finally it spilled into the sea. 
Not all of the Solda schoon was easily navigated. There were stretches of shallow, rapid waters, deep pools inhabited by nixies and other troublesome creatures, and treacherous, rock-strewn passages that claimed a toll of nearly three boats out of ten. But here the river was deep and broad, the water relatively calm, and the current not strong enough to impede their progress. Erelyn guessed they would reach the fork in the river where a second boat awaited her by nightfall. From there, she would travel up a large tributary that branched northward past the star spires, close to the part of Tether that she sought. In the southern parts of the forest lived an old friend. Erelyn's plan rested heavily on his friendship and on his ability to convince his people to come to her assistance. From what she knew of the legendary Silver Shadows, Erelyn realized this would not be an easy task. Chapter 9 Each morning at dawn, the massive gates of Zazaspur swung open to admit the flow of commerce that was the city's lifeblood. The city's coffers benefited from tariffs placed on exotic goods that passed through on their way north from Kalimshan and points east. But the markets of Zazaspur were much more than a stopping place for merchant caravans. The people of Tethir took great pride in their craftsmanship, and their goods were in great demand in lands to the north and south. Into the city poured the raw materials that ships and overland caravans brought from all over the known world. Chulton teak and Mazdakan rosewood were fashioned into the carved wooden boxes for which Tethir was famed and delicate contraptions of gears and tiny chimes came from Lantern to transform some of these boxes into wondrous musical toys. Fine metals from the icy Northlands were brought into the city to be worked into vessels and armor and jewelry, gems to be set into sword hilts or ladies' rings. Tetherian furniture was prized for its durability and elegant lines. For sheer practicality, Miratman fabrics were considered second to none. A cloak woven from the wool of the sheep that grazed the purple hills often lasted long enough to be handed down from father to son, and few were the weavers outside Tethir who could spin thread so fine that the results were nearly waterproof. Another form of commerce, also important to the city's well-being if somewhat less glamorous, was the trading for foodstuffs grown in the fertile purple hills south of the city. Daily caravans traveled between Zazaspur and Marakir, the farmer's market located at the intersection of the tradeway with the Saldaskun River, to purchase fruit and grain and mutton. It was an important task, but a routine one, and therefore one that seldom fell under close scrutiny. And so it was that Quentin Lorish, the captain of one such caravan, was none too happy to be awakened from his slumber and informed that Lord Hune's new apprentice would be riding along on the day's trip. Not that Quentin had anything against Hune, far from it. The lord and guildmaster paid well, and he treated the men and women in his employ with a degree of fairness unusual in Tethir, which made him quite popular among the people, and purchased loyalty more surely than would coin. At least... Fair treatment worked that way with most men. Quentin, frankly, preferred hard silver. Quentin was not a man overly constrained by the bounds of loyalty or by a compulsion for honest dealing. He was not above skimming a thicker layer of cream from the caravan's daily profits than that to which he was strictly entitled. The thought of a young and eager apprentice looking over his shoulder and thumbing through his books made Quentin's stomach burn with the pain that was becoming his constant companion. And so, as he watched over the caravan's pre-dawn preparations and waited for the city's gates to open, Quentin sipped at a large flask of goat's milk mixed with some chalky mineral that he could not identify. It was a vile concoction but according to the local alchemist it would in time soothe his sour stomach. If it did not, vowed Quentin grimly, as he downed the last of the swill, he would gladly spend every copper of this day's profit to have the wretched alchemist slain, preferably death by drowning in goat's milk. "'Captain Quentin?' inquired an imperious voice to his left. "'I am Hasheth, 
here on behalf of Lord Hune. The man let out a mighty, chalk-scented belch and turned to regard his dreaded passenger. Hune's apprentice was a young man, probably not yet twenty years of age, maybe a by-blow of the Lord himself, judging from that dark hair, though the lad's curved nose and sun-browned skin suggested a bit of calashite blood. Well, that was common enough in Zazaspur these days, what with the pasha and all. It was fashionable among society folk to keep a southern woman as mistress, or so Quentin had heard tell. He himself had to make do with a wife, his own, unfortunately. Welcome aboard, lad, he said with a heartiness he certainly did not feel. We'll be on our way with the dawn. Pick any horse that catches your fancy, then I'll show you what's what. That will hardly be necessary, Hasheth said, his lip curled with disdain. He gestured to a covered carriage pulled by paired chestnuts, beautiful, fine-boned animals whose glossy red-brown coats had been groomed to the sheen of fine sable. The carriage horses were all the more striking for the fact that they were nearly identical, even to the white stars on their foreheads. To add excess to opulence, a magnificent black stallion and a long-legged gray mare were tied behind the carriage. As you can see, I have brought my own conveyance as well as additional horses, should I choose to ride. As for your business, you do it well enough to suit my lord Hune, and that is good enough for me, the lad continued coolly. I am required to be here as part of my education, so let us strike a deal. If you are asked, you will report that I observed you closely. If I am asked, I will say that all I observed was in order. There was a slight edge to Hasheth's voice, a shrewd, almost smug nuance that hinted the young man already knew far too much about the caravan's affairs. Quentin darted a look at the lad, hoping he'd heard wrong. In response, Hasheth lifted a single eyebrow in unmistakable challenge. The banked flame in Quentin's gut flared up hot and high, sending a surge of acid up into his throat. Agreed, the captain muttered, wishing mightily that he could spit without offending the lordly young man. Hasheth nodded again to the carriage and to the veiled woman who peeked out from behind one curtain. You need not bother yourself with me. As you can see, I have brought a diversion to sweeten the journey, which brings us to another matter. The lady has a delicate skin and a desire to see the marketplace before the heat of high sun. I understand this requires an unusually brisk pace, but my own desires would be well served by indulging hers. May I tell her that you will accommodate us? Quentin merely nodded, for his throat was feeling too raw for speech. He watched as the imperious youth climbed into the carriage and pulled the curtain firmly shut. Then he shook his head and strode away to tend to the caravan. He was not at all certain what to make of this strange encounter or of the young apprentice who saw far too much. When at last the morning sun broke over the distant peaks of the star spires, the mighty gate swung slowly inward. By the time the caravan started off on its journey, at an extremely brisk pace, as requested, Quentin was feeling much better. Quite chipper, in fact. He'd often worried about discovery, but now that it had come, he found it to be a relief. Although Quentin took his orders from Hune's people, he had no window into the Lord's affairs and no way of knowing how his own actions might be perceived, or which of them might have come before Hune's eyes. This Hasheth was bright enough to uncover Quentin's embezzlement. Surely he could also manage to keep it from prying eyes. And better still, the lad was ready to deal. Quentin felt certain that he could persuade Hasheth to provide him a bit of protection, plus maybe pass along a bit of information from time to time that would help the caravan captain gild the inside of his pockets. Yes, he concluded happily. Hune's newest apprentice was someone with whom he could do business, to the profit of both. Did I choose my man well? Hasheth inquired in a smug tone. Erelin nodded, perfectly willing to give the young man his due. From all that she had seen and heard, Quentin Lorish was a perfect choice, 
one who would no doubt continue to serve Hasheth in a dependable, if dishonorable, fashion. In fact, her departure from Zazespur had gone more smoothly than Erelin would have thought possible. Every step of the agreed-upon plan had been flawlessly executed. Hasheth was good and getting better by the day. Why, then, did she feel so ill at ease? With a sigh, Erelin leaned back into the cushions and steeled herself for a long morning's ride. She was none too happy about spending several hours in inactivity, with nothing to absorb her but her own troubled thoughts. Too much had happened of late. Too many revelations had been thrust upon her, more than she could possibly sort through between Zazespur and the Seldaskun. Erelin liked to deal with problems as they arose, quickly, cleanly, decisively, with diplomacy, if possible, and with swift violence, when necessary. Yet she had been forced to ignore her nature, her accustomed methods, and her own better judgment to tend to the Elven Queen's commission. So here she was, bound for the Elven Forest and burdened with someone else's problems, while her own life was in utter disarray. Her ancestor slept in some rich man's vault, and Erelin had done nothing to redress this dishonor. Danilo had declared his love for her, and she had decked him and sent him packing without so much as taking time to consider what her own eventual response should be. Then there was the matter of the elf shadow and the bleak future that it foretold. Erelin could not forget for a moment the destiny inherent in the moonblade she carried, and the unwitting vow she had made so many years ago when first she drew the elven sword. The half-elf had never before feared death, but she could not help but feel her mortality. She was headed toward an extremely dangerous mission, bearing a sword that would in all likelihood claim her in eternal servitude. To say that this added a note of urgency to her quest, Erelin concluded dryly, was something of an understatement. All told, the half-elf was in no mood to parry Hasheth's inevitable advances with anything approaching diplomacy. Indeed, it would take every shred of self-control that she possessed to keep from tossing the young man out onto the roadside with his first manipulative compliment, his first double entendre. But either the gods took pity upon her, or Hasheth was beginning to learn in this matter as well. The morning passed without incident. Indeed, Hasheth kept Erelin so busy with his questions that she had no time to contemplate the troubling path before her. The young prince was full to overbrimming with questions about Harper ways and the foes that the Harpers faced. He was also eager to learn everything of Tetherian history and politics that Erelin had to share, and was curious about the affairs of other lands as well. Apparently the palace saw no need to include matters of state in the education of a thirteenth-born son. Erelin gave each question a terse but complete answer, and she noted that Hasheth listened well, an important skill for a harper informant. It was plain that the young man enjoyed taking part in the activities of this clandestine group, and that he reveled in intrigue and secrecy. He was also justly proud of his growing skill in devising and putting into place complex plans. But Erelin was also aware that Hasheth's main tie with the Harpers was not personal conviction or even a respect for the Harpers and their ideals, but a sense of obligation to her and to Danilo. Now that they had both left the city behind, she was not so certain that Hasheth would continue in this role. And what will you do with all this knowledge? She asked him at last. Hasheth shrugged, taking her question at face value. Knowledge is a tool. I will use it for whatever task comes to hand. A good answer, Erelin admitted, but hardly a reassuring one. In all, she was not sorry when the distant clamor of voices and carts announced that they were nearing Marakir. Slipping away from the caravan was an easy matter. In her skirts and veil, with her well-draped travel packs adding a matronly bulk to her frame, Erelin blended in with the matriarchs and chatelines who came to purchase supplies for their families or their business establishments. 
For a while, she wandered among the busy stalls, tapping melons and pinching cherries with the best of them. Finally, she found the place she sought, Teresa's Fine Woolens, a large wooden stall that offered ready-made clothes. The establishment had a prosperous air, as well as a prime location right next to the river, but Teresa's reputation for high prices kept away all but the most affluent buyers. Inside the shop, Erolyn found an assortment of serviceable but quite unremarkable garments, woolen cloaks, trues, gowns, and shawls, as well as shirts of linen or linsey woolsey. The cost of the garments, Teresa insisted, reflected the quality and the service. The casual patron might assume that by services she meant the helpful shop clerks who offered advice and refreshments, or the curtained booths, each walled with silvered glass, that enabled the patrons to dress with privacy. What was not commonly known was that the mirrors were actually hidden doors that allowed well-informed patrons to slip out the back. Leaving her cumbersome skirts, as well as a small bag of silver coins, in the changing booth, Erolyn left Teresa's and slid down the steep incline of the riverbank. A small skiff awaited her there, further evidence of the discreet services Teresa offered. The harper settled into the boat and nodded to the two burly servants who manned the oars. One of them flicked loose the rope that secured the craft to a post driven into the shoreline. Then the men leaned into the oars in well-practiced unison, and the little boat lurched out into the river. Erolyn noted with approval that the oarsmen displayed an admirable lack of curiosity. They spared her hardly a glance, so intent were they on maneuvering through the heavy river traffic. It took all their considerable skill to dodge the many skiffs and flatboats and small, single-sailed boats that thronged the busy waterway. Once they were beyond the crush and turmoil of the marketplace, the men settled in and set a straight, hard-pulling course upriver. The Saldaskun was Tethir's largest river, stretching nearly the entire breadth of the country. From its origins in the foothills of the Snowflake Mountains, the river traveled over 500 miles until finally it spilled into the sea. Not all of the Saldaskun was easily navigated. There were stretches of shallow, rapid waters, deep pools inhabited by nixies and other troublesome creatures, and treacherous, rock-strewn passages that claimed a toll of nearly three boats out of ten. But here the river was deep and broad, the water relatively calm, and the current not strong enough to impede their progress. Erolyn guessed they would reach the fork in the river where a second boat awaited her by nightfall. From there, she would travel up a large tributary that branched northward past the star spires, close to the part of Tether that she sought. In the southern parts of the forest lived an old friend. Erolyn's plan rested heavily on his friendship and on his ability to convince his people to come to her assistance. From what she knew of the legendary Silver Shadows, Erolyn realized this would not be an easy task. Ilina Lana Bat Kathili stirred and grimaced in her sleep as the first arrow struck her. It was a fearsome expression, appearing as it did on the face of a young white dragon, yet the dreams that enveloped her were not entirely unpleasant. The slumbering dragon dreamed of a hail shower and the pleasures of flying high into the churning summer clouds. Hailstorms were a rare treat in this land, which was far too hot for a white dragon's comfort and in her dream Eileen was enjoying the swirling, icy winds and the tingle of formulating hail against her scales. Suddenly, a particularly sharp hailstone struck her neck. Eileen's head reared up, and through her still sleepy haze two simultaneous and contradictory conclusions occurred to her. The storm was nothing but a pleasant slumber fantasy, and the sting of the hailstones seemed all too real. In an effort to rouse herself, the better to contemplate this puzzle, the young dragon rolled over onto her belly and unwound her tail from her pile of treasure. It was a small pile, to be sure, but how much could a dragon hoard in a mere century of life? 
and how many opportunities did she have, she who was reduced to a few short bursts of activity? The forest of Tether was cool, but hardly cold enough to provide comfort to a dragon of her kind. Eileen spent much of her time in her cave, in a stuporous lethargy. She dared not venture out too often. Though she was nearly thirty feet long and almost full-grown, there were still creatures in the forest who could give her a good fight. These enemies could find her far too easily, with her enormous size and glistening white scales. Eileen didn't exactly blend into the landscape. Unless forced by hunger into hunting, she stayed in the cave, for she felt dangerously conspicuous except on those few days when a dusting of snow touched the forest, or when storm clouds turned the sky to a pale and pearly gray. All things considered, Eileen longed for the frozen Northlands of which her parents had spoken, and to which they had returned when she was barely more than a hatchling. Eileen had been too small to keep pace with the larger dragons, but she had managed to fly from her birthplace on the icy peaks of the Snowflake Mountains as far as Tether. Someday she would fly to the far north along with the forest's other white dragons who shared her plight. A flight of dragons, and she its leader. How glorious! All she needed was an extended cold snap and favorable winds. Another sharp, stinging blow brought Eileen back to the matter at hand. The dragon yawned widely, then settled back on her haunches to consider the situation. The air was moist and fairly warm, even down here in the cavern. Yes, it was early summer, the most reasonable time for a hailstorm, yet she was in her cave, which meant that actual hail was highly unlikely. The dragon came to this conclusion not so much with words, but with the instinctual awareness that even the slowest-witted creature must have of its surroundings in order to survive. Of all Faerun's evil dragons, whites were the smallest and the least intelligent, and even by the modest measure of her kind, Eileen was hardly the sharpest sword in the armory. Swinging her crested white head this way and that, the dragon looked about for the source of the disturbance. Another stinging slap to the neck, this one dangerously close to the base of one of her leathery wings, came from the direction of the eastern passage. Eileen squinted into the tunnel's darkness. A shadowy form lurked there. She could make out a two-legged shape and the loaded bow in its hands. But whether the bowman was human or elven, or something more or less similar, she could not say for the tantalizing aroma of winter mint masked his scent. The annoying creature let loose yet another arrow. It struck the dragon squarely on the snout and bounced off without penetrating the plate armor of her face. Even so, it stung. For a moment, the dazed and cross-eyed dragon stared at the pair of humanoid archers that had invaded her lair. She gave her head a violent shake, and the two melded back into one. Still, that was one too many. Eileen let out a roar of pain and anger and exploded to her feet. The archer turned on his heel and ran down the tunnel with the dragon in hot pursuit. Well, maybe warm pursuit. Eileen's last nap had lasted several weeks, and since she had a habit of sleeping on her side, plate-armored cheek pillowed on scaly paw, one foreleg was numb and uncooperative. Therefore, what she had intended to be a fearsome charge was in fact reduced to an uneven, loping, three-legged hop. Eileen skidded to a stop and plunked herself down on her haunches. She lifted both forelegs and regarded them. After a moment's thought, a solution presented itself, one she thought quite ingenious, the dragon sucked in a long breath of air, held her good leg up close to her fanged jaws, and blew upon it a long icy blast. This, Eileen's breath weapon, could put out a raging fire or freeze a full-grown centaur to solid ice in mid-stride. It could even slightly benumb her own flesh, despite her natural armor and her uncanny resistance to cold. Eileen dropped back onto all fours and tested her front legs. Yes, they were both equally numb now. With her equilibrium restored, the dragon resumed her charge. 
slowly, to be sure, but with a more even and dignified gait. Her two-legged tormentor was well out of sight now, but Eileen easily followed the scent of mint. Although her wit was about as sharp as a spoon, she possessed a keen sense of smell, not to mention a particular fondness for winter mint. As the dragon trotted through the cavern's tunnels and out into the forest, two things happened. First, both of her front legs gradually returned to normal and her pace accelerated into a dizzying, plant-crushing charge. Second, it began to occur to her that she was very, very hungry, and that perhaps this interruption was not such a bad thing after all. Night was falling upon the forest of Tether, and Venlar eyed the deepening shadows with an intense and growing dread. In the days that followed the battle at the Pipeweed Farm, the mercenaries had pursued the elven raiders deep into the forest. Far deeper than ever they had ventured before, and much too deep for Venlar's peace of mind. The ancient woodland was uncanny. The trees had a watchful, listening mien. The birds carried tales. The very shadows seemed alive. There was magic here primal, elemental magic, of a sort that put even the hired mages on edge, even the high-ticket Hellruin wizard in whom Bunlap put such store. Other, more tangible dangers abounded. Since daybreak, unseen elves had been clipping arrows at the humans' heads and heels, nipping at them like sheepdogs gathering a flock for spring shearing. Beyond doubt, the mercenaries were being herded, Toward what, Venlar could not say. But he had little choice other than to move the band as swiftly northward as they could go. He'd tried to keep on the trail of the southbound elves and lost five good men for his troubles. And so they headed northward, as their unseen tormentors intended. They would pick up the trail later, after... whatever. Nor were the wild elves the mercenaries' only unseen foe, or their unknown destination their only worry. There was trouble enough to be found along the way. Not even the best woodsmen among them, and these included foresters, hired swords who'd knocked about in a dozen lands, and a couple of rangers gone bad, could identify all the strange cries, roars, and bird calls that resounded through the forest. But all of the men had seen and heard enough to know there were creatures here that were best avoided. They'd stumbled upon a particularly unsubtle piece of evidence shortly before High Sun. It was an image that stuck in Venlar's mind, a pile of dried scat in which was embedded the entire skull of an ogre. Whatever had killed that ogre, which had been an eight-footer by the look of the skull, a creature probably as strong as any three men, was big enough to bite off the monster's head and swallow it whole. Ogres were bad enough, in Venlar's opinion, and he didn't even want to contemplate a creature big enough and hungry enough to eat such grim fare. Monsters had always lived in the forest, but if tavern tales and lost adventuring parties were any fair measure of truth, the sheer variety and number of such creatures was spiraling into nightmarish proportions. To Venlar's way of thinking, this was partly the result of the troubles the elves were currently facing. Their attention had been diverted from forest husbandry to the more pressing matter of survival. This was, of course, precisely what Bunlap and the mercenary captain's mysterious employer had intended. Bunlap just had to order us to follow them elves, muttered Venlar. Don't matter to him, what with his being snug behind fortress walls with nary a tree in sight and no damn wild elves planting arrows in his backside. Speaking of which, put in Mandrake, a mercenary who also doubled as the company's surgeon, how's yours? It was not an unreasonable question, considering that the surgeon had plucked two arrows from the back of Venlar's lap since sunrise. The unseen elves who harried them had slain the hounds, but they apparently had a more lingering, humiliating fate in mind for the mercenaries. It's in a Bashaba blasted sling, that's how it is, Venlar said vehemently. 
along with yours and his and his and his and every damned one of us in this thrice-bedamned forest. Big sling, agreed Mandrake, thinking it best to humor Bunlap's second-in-command. The archer heard the condescending note in Mandrake's voice, but did not respond to it. He grimaced as a new wave of pain assaulted him. Walking was exceedingly painful, what with his new and humiliating wounds. The elven arrows had dealt him shallow and glancing blows, but somehow Venlar couldn't find it in his heart to be grateful for small mercies. Nor could he continue walking much longer. The damp chill that heralded the coming night was making his legs stiffen, and wasn't doing his aching butt one bit of good. Send Thatcher and Justin to scout for a campsite again, Venlar said. And let those wild elves pick us off while we sleep? The surgeon protested. Better to keep moving. Venlar snorted. If the man was such a fool as to think those deadly archers would be challenged by a moving target, there was no sense in wasting breath telling him otherwise. A campsite? Now? He prodded. The mercenary saluted and quickened his pace so he could catch up to the men Venlar had named. He might have disobeyed, Venlar noted resignedly, but for the fact that Bunlap had made it plain they were all to follow Venlar's orders. People tended to do what Bunlap said, and not merely for fear of reprisal, although such was usually harsh and swift in coming, but because there was something about the man to which people responded. After years in Bunlap's company, Venlar thought he had this elusive quality figured out. The mercenary captain knew precisely what he wanted, and he went about getting it with grim, focused determination. Men who lacked a direction of their own, and Tethir was full of these, were attracted to Bunlap like metal filings to a magnet. So when Bunlap told them to pursue the elves into the forest, they went. And they were still going. And they would likely die going, Venlar concluded bitterly. Their task was important, Bunlap had insisted, though he himself had taken off for the fortress to gather and train men for the next assault. The captain had left right after the failed ambush, for he realized they were unlikely to catch up to the elven raiders, much less engage them in pitched battle. Venlar's task was to follow the elves, kill a few if he could, and collect as many bows and bolts of black lightning as he could get. His men were also supposed to retrieve the bodies of the elves slain in battle, as well as any who might die of their wounds and be discarded along the way, for such would be useful in turning still more people against the forest elves. The elves, however, seemed determined that Venlar would get none of these things. They apparently carried their dead and wounded, and they used green arrows that, although finely crafted, were of little use in Bunlap's plans. If the mercenaries did not have hounds to sniff out the nearly invisible trail of blood, the elves would have eluded them altogether. It was a stroke of genius for the fleeing elves to send a party of archers to circle back and slay the hounds. Even Venlar had to admit that. But what else the elves had in mind he could not begin to say. A distant roar sent a spasm of cold terror shimmering down the gentish archer's spine. The two scouts hesitated, looking back at Venlar as if to protest their assignment. In response, he placed a hand on his elven bow and narrowed his eyes in his best menacing glare. I'm for lighting torches, Justin said defiantly. Can't see where we're going otherwise. Venlar shrugged. Tales were told of the fearsome reprisals the forest folk took against any who dared to bring fire into the forest. But he doubted their elven shadows would kill the scouts. Leastwise, not until they'd herded them to their unknown destination. And Justin had a point. It was dark. For in the deep forest not even the faint light of moon and stars could penetrate the thick canopy. So he watched as the scout took a torch from his pack and struck flint to steel. A few sparks scattered into the night like startled fireflies, and then the flame rose high. Venlar blinked at the sudden bright flare of light. His eyes focused and then widened. There were not two, 
but three figures standing in the circle of torchlight. A wild elf, a young male with black braids and fierce black eyes, hauled back a water skin and prepared to douse the flame, or so Venlar assumed. He watched, as transfixed as the two dumbfounded scouts, as the elf hurled the contents of the skin. Not at the torch-wielding Justin, but at Tatcher. And then he was gone, before any of the mercenaries could unsheathe a blade or knock an arrow. Justin sniffed, and his face screwed up into an expression of extreme disgust as he regarded the other scout. You smell like something my mother drinks out of painted teacups, he scoffed. The analogy was apt. Tatcher had been doused with a strong infusion of mint. Venlar, who could see no reason for this action, turned to one of their rangers, a tall, skinny fellow from the Dale Lands. Once a noble ranger, whatever the Nine Hells that meant, he'd fought the Tuigan Horde and seen his illusions about humankind burn to ash in the inferno that was war. Since then, he'd taken to looking out for himself and had developed a real talent for it. You know more about the forest than most of us, Venlar said. Why'd the elf do that? He could have killed Tatcher and Justin both, easy. The ranger shook his head impatiently and held up a hand, indicating a need for silence. The others fell quiet and listened, but their ears were not as sharp as those of the Dalesmen. To Venlar's ears, there was only the constant hum and chirp of insects, the occasional shriek of a hunting raptor, and the whispering of the night winds through the thick forest canopy. A whispering, Venlar noted, that seemed to be growing louder. Suddenly, the ranger's eyes went wide. Winds are mint, he muttered, and then took off at a frantic run. The others watched, bemused, as the ranger crashed off heedlessly toward the south. Before they could follow suit, a roar rolled through the forest a fearsome sound that was both shriek and rumble, a cry of rage such as few of them had ever heard before. Yet there was not a man among them who did not know instinctively what it meant. Dragon Venlar had heard men speak of dragon fear, the paralyzing terror that comes from looking into the eyes of a great worm. He now knew that the very sound of a dragon's cry could root a man's boots to the soil and turn his legs to stone. The dragon fear lasted but a moment, but that was long enough. With the speed of a wizard's transformation, the dragon's passage through the forest changed from a rustling murmur into a deafening crash. Like a tidal wave, the dragon came on. Venlar would never have guessed that something so large could move with such speed. Then he caught a glimpse of it through the trees, still a couple hundred feet away but closing fast. It was a white, and it glittered like some enormous reptilian ghost against the darkness of the forest. The creature stopped, fell back on its haunches, and inhaled deeply. The trees parted the leaves cringing away and falling in brittle shards as an icy winter wind tore through the forest. Widening as it came, a cone of devastation blasted everything in its path and reached icy, grasping hands toward the mercenaries. With the clarity of absolute terror, with a heart-stopping fear that made everything around him seem to slow down to a speed of a drifting snowflake, Venlar watched it come. The dragon's breath reached the scouts, so quickly that it froze Justin's face in its derisive sneer, so suddenly that it caught Tatcher in the act of turning toward the onrushing sound. It leached all color from their skin, coating their hair and clothes in a thick layer of frost. To all appearances, the men were as completely frozen as if they'd been turned to ice statues by a vengeful sorceress. Then the cold hit Venlar, bitter searing, but not quite enough to immobilize him. Quite the contrary, like a slap to the face, it tore him from his momentary terror. He realized the dragon's breath weapon had reached its outer limits with the unfortunate scouts. Even so, he did not intend to stay around in case the monster could repeat its trick. 
Run! He shrieked, and he kicked into the fastest gait his benumbed limbs could manage. Bunlap's second-hand authority was not needed this time. The men followed Venlar without pause or question. As they fled wildly into the forest, their steps were spurred by the sound of cracking ice, a horrid crunching, and the faint and deadly scent of winter mint. Chapter 10 From the palisades of his fortress, Bunlap had a splendid view of Tethir and its varied landscapes. To his east lay the Starspire Mountains, their jagged and lofty peaks snow-tipped even now in early summer. On the western side of his land were the rolling foothills, and just north of him the sudden, dense tree line that marked the southern edge of the forest of Tether. A brisk wind ruffled his black beard and sent his cloak swirling up behind him. Bunlap caught the flying folds and wrapped them around himself, folding his arms to keep the garment firmly in place. Mornings were chill, even this time of year, for the western winds came straight off the star spires, as did the icy waters that spilled into the river below. The northern branch, most called it, but Bunlap liked to think of it as his river. Located as he was, on a cliff overlooking the plain where a dozen or more small waterways converged into a single flow, he could exact a tariff from every small-time farmer or trapper who floated down the tributaries to paddle his goods downriver to the Saldaskun, and thence to Sazaspur. It amused Bunlap that his demands were never challenged. The people of Tethir were too accustomed to paying tariffs and tributes and out-and-out -out bribes at every turn, for petty noblemen bred like rabbits in this land. Not a single traveler questioned Bunlap's right to tax their cargo. He held this remote territory with a fortress and men-at-arms. In the mind of the Tethirians, that made him nobility. Baron Bunlap, he said aloud, and a wry smile twisted his lips at the irony of it. Not a man alive was more lowly born than he, but what did that matter in Tethir? In the few short years since he'd left his post at Darkhold, the former gentish soldier had amassed more land, wealth, and power than was possessed by most Cormiran lords. Bane's blood, how he loved this country. Two sailed approaching! called a man from the southern lookout. Bunlap's mood darkened instantly. He'd received word of this ship's approach the night before, for he kept runners and horsemen stationed along the river to bring him news of water traffic. It was an organization nearly as swift and efficient as the town criers of any city a man could name, and as a result, Bunlap knew the business of nearly everyone who traveled Tethir's main waterway. Which is why this particular ship disturbed him. Shallow-keeled as a Northman's raiding ship, single-masted but flying a jib as well as a mainsail, the ship was built for speed and stealth. She was small enough to escape the notice of everyone but the most observant and suspicious of men, small enough so that two or three might sail her, yet large enough to hold a dozen men or stow a considerable amount of contraband. In short, it was the sort of ship that carried trouble, and a prime example of what his informants had been trained and paid to notice. Yet his man at Port Starhaven, one of the few towns that lay along the northern branch, had been the first to note its approach. Bonlap had checked the fortress's log the night before. Recent entries indicated that there were no reported sightings of such a ship on the Saldaskun, not on either side of the place where the northern branch met the main river. It was as if the ship had fallen from the clouds. Or, a more likely possibility, and even more disturbing, it had been carted overland to a point on the northern branch and kept hidden in dry dock until it was needed. But why? And by whom? Bunlap well knew the difficulty and expense of overland shipping. Whoever had gone to such trouble must have deep pockets and a compelling motivation. Well enough, he would empty those pockets and demand to know the reasons. Raise the chain behind her. 
Bring it up fast and pull it as tight as it'll go, he bellowed, raising an eyeglass and peering down at the swiftly sailing craft. On my mark. Now! Several men hurried to a massive crank and began to turn with frantic haste. A huge chain, nearly as thick as a dwarf's waist, began to wind around a gathering spool. The other end of the chain was tethered to the far shore, bolted and welded to a platform that was itself pile-driven into the rocky bank. Once the chain was raised, no ship, not even this shallow-keeled phantom, could escape downriver. As Bunlap anticipated, the sailboat tacked sharply, heading straight toward the eastern shore. This was the response most ships made, and it was the most logical. Put some distance between the ship and the apparently hostile fortress, a reasonable dodge. But what most travelers did not realize until too late was that the raising of the chain alerted men who were stationed on the eastern shore and along each of the tributaries. These men poured from their hidden barracks, those on the east shore seizing arms, and those along the north putting small, swift craft into the water and rushing toward the pinned-down ship. They would surround it, capture it, and escort the ship and crew to Bunlap's fortress. It was a well-planned maneuver, put into practice often enough to have become almost routine. But to Bunlap's surprise... The sailboat continued straight for the eastern shore and the forces that awaited her there. Several sets of long oars flung out over the side, and unseen oarsmen pulled hard as they rowed with breakneck haste for the beach. The mercenaries assembled at water's edge scattered as the shallow boat thrust up out of the water. A dozen or more fighters leaped from the boat onto dry land and hurled themselves at Bunlap's men. One of them, a minor mage of some sort, sent a tiny ball of light hurtling toward the sails. The canvas had been treated with some kind of oil, for immediately flames leaped outward in all directions to engulf the entire ship. Dark billows of smoke forced the battle back from the shore. Bunlap squinted into his eyeglass, peering through the gathering cloud of smoke and trying to find some clue that would help him make sense of this ship and these tactics. What he saw thrust him even deeper into puzzlement. Most of the crew of the strange sailing craft were clad in tunics and leggings of a distinctive dark purple, which marked them as hired swords of the palace, mercenaries who reported to the lesser members of the Balik family. This was an oddity, for Pasha Balik and his pleasure-loving kin were not known to venture beyond the walls of Zazaspur. Otter still was the sole exception among these purple-clad fighters, a female, and an elf. She was not one of the forest people, of that Bunlap was certain. The elves of Tether were copper-hued and tended to be small in build and stature. This one was raven-haired and tall as most men. Bunlap caught a glimpse of her face. It was as pale as a pearl, a shade that was peculiar to moon elves. These were common enough in Tethir, but most were fairly recent arrivals who had settled in the trade cities and farmlands. Bunlap hadn't a clue as to what might bring palace guards and a moon elf wench to this part of the country. Whatever her purpose, the elf woman was a swordmaster of rare ability. The mercenary captain watched in helpless rage as she cut through his hired men with dizzying speed and terrifying ease. Not a man among them could stand before her sword. Bunlap was not certain that he himself could match her. Then the smoke grew too thick for him to see more, and there was nothing to do but wait. The clang of battle and the cries of the wounded drifted up to him across the expanse of water. Bunlap noticed that the chorus of steel on steel was rapidly thinning out. The battle was winding down faster than he would have thought possible. At this rate, it would be over before any of his other boats could reach the eastern shore. At least he had the satisfaction of knowing that the elf woman and the purple mercenaries would soon be in his power. With their ship destroyed, they could hardly escape. They had nowhere to go, except to Bunlap's fortress. Even as this thought formed, 
Bunlap noted a flurry of movement several hundred yards south of the battle. Two small boats, bottoms up, emerged from the thick smoke and scuttled toward the river like bugs, large bugs that boasted three pairs of purple-clad legs each. Several more Balik guards hurried along behind these boats, some carrying pilfered oars, others brandishing their curved swords and watching their backs for pursuit. There was none. Bunlap's men were lost in the smoke, battling a deadly elf woman who, unlike them, could see in darkness better than any cat. For all he knew, by now she had them fighting each other. A surge of rage swept through the mercenary captain as the escape strategy became clear to him. Using the smoke as a cover, the guards were stealing Bunlap's boats, walking portage around the chain and making their escape downriver. There was nothing he could do to stop them, not even if he had the chain lowered so his other boats were able to give pursuit. He had no way of getting new orders to the men, nor would they take such action on their own, for the strong westerly wind was blowing the dark, oily smoke across the river in a thick and effective screen. It was unlikely that any of the men who fought on the eastern shore or who were still on the river could even see the escaping boats. As he waited for the battle to end, Bunlap's rage and frustration deepened. He could not vent his spleen upon the men, for he would need every one of them for the coming battles, and he was fairly certain he would get no satisfaction from the elf wench. Bunlap was ready to bet big money that when the smoke cleared, there would be no trace of her. He was also fairly certain of her destination. It would not be the mountains, which were catacombed with dwarven tribes, but the elven forest. This was not a heartening thought. A moon-elven warrior, smart enough to elude him, powerful enough to claim assistance from Zazaspur's ruling family? As if he hadn't problems enough in that thrice-blasted forest. Bunlap spun away and stalked down the steps that led from the palisades to the courtyard. For several moments he stood, watching as his lieutenants took the new recruits through their morning weapons training. They were good, this batch, and as he watched, Bunlap felt his rage cool, but not dissipate. Never that. Bunlap's anger was like a forge-heated sword. It only got harder and sharper as the heat slipped away. He'd counted on the reclusive nature of the forest elves for his plan's success, and so far it had served him well. If this moon elf had a notion to join forces with the wild folk, she'd likely find they had ideas of their own. And even if she did, what of it? One more sword would not turn the balance in favor of the elves of Tether, and when the time was right, he, Bunlap, would take great pleasure in ending the career of this elf woman. She would have to wait her turn, of course, but she'd be just as dead for the delay. There was enough elf hatred in Bunlap's heart to sink Evermeet into the sea. The captain's hand instinctively lifted to his cheek and to the still fiery brand the wild elf had left there. With each day that passed, his latest assignment was becoming more and more a personal crusade. Ferret pressed her stolen horse as hard as she dared. It was no easy task, keeping pace with a swift sailing boat and yet staying out of sight. To make matters still more difficult, this terrain was unfamiliar to her. The mountains were dwarven territory. But the female assassin had earned her reputation as a tracker. She made her way to the river's mouth in time to witness the battle between the half-elf's hired men and the locals. She might even have joined in had the river not lain between her and the fight. Ferret watched with keen interest as Erelin engaged the mercenaries, sent her own men southward, and then slipped away in the confusion. Despite her personal opinion of the half-elf, Ferret could not help but admire the smoothly executed plan. She needed to know more about this half-breed's talents and her motivations. When the fight was over, the female urged her tired mount into the hills, for she had to give wide berth to the fortress. 
Although she had not known of the stronghold's existence and knew nothing of its lord, she'd had ample experience with petty noblemen and knew what to expect from them, even if she hadn't seen the attempted ambush of Erelyn's ship. Throughout that day and most of the following night and the day after that, Ferret pursued her half-elven quarry. By late afternoon, she caught her first glimpse of Erelyn, just as she was slipping into the edge of Tether. The assassin shook her head in disbelief. To cover such a distance, the half-elf must have run the entire way, with very little pause for rest. Elves could do this when pressed, but Ferret never would have credited that a half-elf could manage such a feat. She herself had traveled even farther, but she had done so on four legs. Ferret swung down from the horse and grasped the animal's tangled mane in both hands. She drew down the horse's head and spoke for several minutes in the centaur tongue, an apology as well as instructions for the journey ahead. The mare seemed to grasp the gist of it, for she turned southward and set off at a jog in the direction of the fortress. There, Ferret reasoned, the horse would be fed and cared for. However ill the local lord treated passing travelers, he would be unlikely to disdain such a valuable gift. And the horse could not survive otherwise. It had become an unnatural creature, stripped of its instincts and made dependent upon humans. The female set off for the forest with an easy, running stride, confident she could pick up the half-elf's trail and have the wench in her sights by nightfall. And then she would learn what had brought a half-elven assassin into the shadows of Tether. The waxing moon rose high over the forest's canopy, but only a few stubborn shafts of moonlight worked their way through the thick layers of leaves. Ferret found that Erelyn's trail was harder to follow than she had anticipated. Somewhere along the line, the assassin who walked the streets of Zazaspur with such grim assurance had also learned a considerable amount of woodscraft. At last, Ferret caught sight of the half-elf, down on one knee examining what appeared to be wolf sign. She placed her palm down on the soil as if measuring the print, then nodded in satisfaction. With a quick, fluid movement, she was back on her feet. She set a brisk, silent pace toward the north, stopping from time to time to examine the soil or to pick a tuft of fur from a bramble. To all appearances, she was tracking a wolf. Why, Ferret could not say, but she could easily guess Erelyn's destination. There was a small glade not too far away, a place with lush grasses and a spring pool that did not dry up until late summer. Deer and other animals came there to drink. If the half-elf was indeed tracking a wolf, this is where she would likely find one. Ferret hesitated, and then nimbly climbed an ash tree. From this perch she could follow the half-elf, unseen, and yet remain beyond the reach of any wolf Erelyn might encounter. Not that the forest wolves posed a serious threat. They were shy, intelligent creatures who kept to themselves and killed only what they needed for survival. Only in the borderlands, where human poaching had stripped the forest of the wolves' natural prey, had they become a nuisance. From time to time, hungry wolves ventured out into the fields and farmlands. Most of these contented themselves with the mice and voles that were plentiful in cultivated lands. Wolves could live solely on such prey. But a few developed a taste for mutton. If cornered by an indignant shepherd, a poaching wolf would defend itself. It was possible that just such a wolf had wounded or even killed someone who had relatives wealthy enough to purchase the half-elf's services. There were other possibilities, however, that dictated a certain amount of caution on Ferret's part. Extremely rare, although more common in these troubled times, was a rogue wolf, one that either through sickness or despair had left its nature behind to become a ravening beast. Most often the atrocities attributed to them were not committed by wolves at all, but by lycanthropes, humans who'd been cursed with a wolf's form and an unnatural lust for blood. Although Tether's ancient magic acted as a barrier to many such abominations, it was possible, 
possible that the half-elf had been hired to track and slay such a monster. Best to keep a distance from that battle. From her leafy perch, Ferret followed Erelin toward the glade. At the half-elf's approach, a pair of deer lifted dripping muzzles from the pool and bounded off into the trees. There was no sign of any wolf, however, nor did the half-elf seem concerned by this lack. She shouldered off her pack and began to remove several items from it, including a small, shimmering mound of what appeared to be liquid silver. The half-elf removed her green cape and stripped off her clothing, the dark, nondescript garments of a Zazaspurian assassin, all the while wearing an expression of extreme distaste. She stuffed them into the hollow of a tree and then waded into the pool, splashing and scrubbing herself repeatedly as if to wash off some invisible taint. Erolin's pale skin appeared almost luminous in the tree-filtered moonlight. Even to Ferret's critical eyes, she was as pale and slender as any moon elf, an apparent sister to the white-limbed birch trees that ringed the forest glade. At length, the half-elf waded back and began to dress herself in the garments she'd taken from her pack, leggings, under-tunic, shirt, all of which were dyed in practical shades of deep forest green. Then she picked up the fluid silver. It fell like a waterfall into the shape of a fine hauberk. A long tunic of elven chainmail, finer than any ferret had ever seen. This the half-elf slipped over her head. It molded immediately to her form and moved with her like water. Erolin belted on her ancient sword so that the moonstone-hilted blade was prominently displayed. She raked both hands through her still wet curls, tucking her hair behind her pointed ears, and then tying an elaborate green and silver band around her forehead to hold it in place. In moments, the half-breed assassin was gone. In her place stood a noble warrior, a proud daughter of the moon people. Ferret shook her head in silent disbelief. Had she not seen the transformation herself, she would not have believed it possible. Oh, she knew that Erolin had a knack for disguises, but this went far beyond an assassin's tricks. Before Ferret could assimilate this, the half-elf took a small wooden object from her pack and lifted it to her lips. An eerie, wavering cry floated out into the forest and froze the watchful Ferret to her perch. She had heard that sound before, but never from a mortal throat. There was a moment's silence, and then an answering call came from the trees beyond. Erolin blew again, a long, high call followed by several short, irregular bursts. Some sort of signal, no doubt. And then she waited, calmly. The vines on the far side of the glade parted, and an enormous silver wolf padded into the clearing. It was twice as large, perhaps even three times as large as any wolf ferret had ever seen. In truth, it could be said to resemble a forest wolf only insofar as a unicorn could be likened to a horse, or an elf to a human. The creature's blue eyes were large and intelligent, almond-shaped like those of an elf, and its ears were long and pointed above its sharply triangular face. There was a fey grace to its step and lingering about it was an eldritch aura that seemed to capture and embody the essence of the forest's magic. Lythari. Ferret formed the word with silent, awed lips. All her life she had heard tales of the Lythari, an ancient race of shape-changing elves, the most elusive and most magical of all the forest people. Few knew of their existence beyond those who dwelt in the forest, those who spoke of the silver shadows did so with reverence and dread. The Lythari were usually as reclusive as the wolves they resembled, but from time to time they moved with incredible ferocity against some enemy of the forest. Even the wild elves, who, next to dryads and treants, were the most attuned to the ways of the woodlands, did not understand the ways of the Lythari and occasionally fell under their swift wrath. Few forest dwellers had caught a glimpse of a Lythari, and never in elven form. 
as if to mock Ferret's unspoken thoughts, the Lithari's wolf-like form shimmered and disappeared. In its place stood a young elven male, beautiful and fey even by the measures of elven kind. Ferret bit her lip, hard, to keep from crying out in wonder. The Lithari was taller than the half-elf and just as pale, and his hair retained the shimmering silver color of his wolf-like form. He called Erolin by name, speaking the common elvish tongue, and embraced her warmly. But try though she might, Ferret could make out nothing of the low, earnest conversation that followed. She watched in wonder as the Lithari slipped back into his wolf form and stood patiently, allowing the half-elf to climb onto his back. Thus mounted, Erolin Moonblade slipped beyond the forest glade and beyond Ferret's reach. No one, not even a tracker as skilled as she, could follow a Lithari who did not wish to be found. To Ferret, this could mean only one thing. The Lithari intended to take Erolin to his den and wished to remove all possibility that someone could trace her to this hidden place. As Ferret slipped down from the tree, she pondered the mystery that was Erolin Moonblade a half-woman who bore the sword of an elven warrior and had earned the friendship of a Lithari. Yet Ferret knew of several times that Erolin had killed for no other apparent purpose than the coins the deed would place in her pockets. The other assassins applauded her cold-blooded skill and accepted her as one of their own. But having seen both sides of Erolin, Ferret simply could not reconcile the two halves. The Lithari male apparently knew the better part of Erolin Moonblade, the noble elven warrior, the identity that Ferret had just now glimpsed. Unfortunately, and herein lay a danger beyond reckoning, the Lithari also knew all the secrets of the forest. Did this young male know that he was about to betray them to a half-elven assassin? Chapter 11 there was nothing, Hashath was coming to learn, that could lift the heart and inflame the pride like a good plot successfully executed. Not even the grinding, mind-numbing chore of copying piles of receipts into Hune's ledgers could dim the young man's inner glow of excitement. He had done well. Even Erolin Moonblade, Harper, and Shadow Sash had admitted as much. And in truth, Hasheth did not mind his apprenticeship so very much. In a way, these bits of parchment and paper were like pieces of a puzzle, and there was little that he enjoyed more than a good puzzle. The Harpers, what a life they had, traveling the world, tracing convoluted plots to their source. The only thing that could possibly be more interesting would be devising such a plot, one so tangled that not even the best among the Harpers might unravel it. Despite his pride, the young prince possessed enough self-knowledge to know that he himself was not capable of such a thing. But in time, why not? And what better training could he have than learning at the foot of the complicated and ambitious Hewn? As guildmaster, merchant, landowner, and member of the Council of Lords, Hewn possessed considerable power. Yet already Hasheth's sharp eye had found hints of other clandestine affiliations and shadowy outlines of plots that were as ambitious as they were intriguing. A busy man was Lord Hewn. Not finished yet, demanded a nasal, querulous voice. The other clerks have already entered their allotments and gone out to take their midday meal. Hasheth set his teeth and lifted his gaze to Aknib. Lord Hune's scribe. I am not a clerk, but an apprentice, he reminded the man, and not for the first time. It is much the same, the scribe said in a tone meant to dismiss the younger man. He turned away and strutted off in search of someone else to intimidate. Hasheth watched him go, marveling that a man as astute and ambitious as Hune would suffer such a fool. Aknib carried out his lord's instructions well enough, but if a single original thought should ever enter his head, it would surely die of loneliness. 
Yet Akhnib was a born sycophant, and such men often enjoyed a degree of success. The scribe curried favor with his master in the most shamelessly obvious ways, even to imitating Lord Hune's appearance. He sported a thick mustache and smoothed back his black hair with oils, as did Hune. He patronized the same tailor and went so far as to mimic the Lord's manner of speaking, his gait, and his meticulous attention to social niceties. What Akhnib lacked, however, was Hune's apparent love of intrigue and his understanding of the nuances of power. Unlike Hune, the scribe made no attempt whatsoever to ensure the loyalties of those in lesser positions, instead seeking only to bask in the reflected light of greater men. A fool, Hasheth surmised. He was but half the scribe's age, and already he sensed that power flowed in all directions, upward as well as down. For even the greatest lord was in some small part dependent upon the efficiency and the goodwill of his lowliest servants. Those who wished to lead must know how to control and manage that flow. As soon as Akhnib was well beyond sight, Hasheth slipped a large gold coin from beneath a stack of papers. It was identical to the one Lord Hune had shown him, and Hasheth had gone to no little trouble to procure it so that he might study its markings. Some of them he knew. Hidden among the designs was Hune's guild mark, a secret symbol known only to ranking members of the various guilds. Hasheth had purchased this information during his brief sojourn in the Assassin's Guild, not realizing at the time how important it might become. The other harper, the northerner, Danilo Than, had been keenly interested in these symbols and had committed them all to memory. Hasheth had followed suit, and now he blessed the northerner for his foresight. Young Lord Than was not such a bad sort, and for a moment Hasheth was almost glad the bard had escaped Hune's hired assassins. For without such knowledge as Lord Than had insisted Hasheth acquire, the prince would not have been able to make the connection between his new master and the other members of the mysterious group known as the Knights of the Shield. And if he was to take his place among these men, he must know their names. Hasheth ran one fingertip over the circular pattern of runes around the edge of the coin and the shield in its center. He knew that mark well, for his own mother had worn this symbol upon a pendant until the day she died. It marked her, she said, as one under the protection of the knights. She had brought it with her from Kalimshan and had worn it always until the night she died birthing yet another son to the pasha. Hasheth had been weaned on stories of this secret society, which was apparently as active in the southern lands as the Harpers were in the Dale lands far to the north. Their power was rumored to come from a combination of great wealth and the ability to gather and hoard valuable information. What the ultimate aims and goals of the knights were, no one could say, but it was known that they had no love for northerners and bore a special dislike for Waterdeep and her lords. Hasheth had long suspected that his father had some involvement with these shadowy folk. Lord Hune's words to him had removed all doubt. Of one thing Hasheth was certain. Affiliation with the knights would almost certainly be a step toward the sort of power he intended to wield. Where did you get that? Hasheth jolted. He had not heard Akhnib's approach, so intent was he upon his study of the coin. The scribe pounced on him like a hunting cat and tore the coin from his hand. This bears Lord Hune's mark. Where did you get this? The man demanded in an accusing voice. At the Purple Minotaur, Hasheth said, honestly enough. The mere mention of Zazaspur's most luxurious inn set the scribe back on his heels and stole some of the indignation from his face. In fact, Akhnib looked so nonplussed that Hasheth could not resist the urge to continue. As you no doubt know, Lord Hune engaged the services of assassins to rid the city of a suspected Harper agent. Two of these assassins were slain at the inn where their mark resided. One of them carried this coin. Since the hired man failed at his assigned task, I took the liberty of removing the coin from his body so that I might return it to Lord Hune. 
If you wish to check out the particulars, Hasheth continued in a casual voice, the Chatelaine of the Minotaur will happily vouchsafe my tale. You might also wander by the Assassin's Guildhouse if you like. The scribe's eyes narrowed, for Hasheth's seemingly innocent words held a triple insult. First, Aknib did not know of this matter, and the fact that Hasheth did placed him subtly higher in the hierarchy surrounding Lord Hewn. Secondly, since Aknib was neither wealthy nor well-born, he would not find a welcome, much less the offer of information, from the lofty chatelaine of the exclusive Purple Minotaur. And finally, an invitation to stop by the Assassin's Guildhouse was tantamount to wishing a person dead. Yet, since Hashath himself had briefly tasted the Assassin's path and had lived to speak of this adventure, 